Life Study of Revelation by Witness Lee Message 1A Forward by the Lord's Mercy In this life study we come to the last book of the Bible, the Book of Revelation. Due to the subtle enemy of God, the Book of Revelation has been closed, and few Christians understand it. Hardly anyone has seen something of life, of God's economy, and of the testimony of Jesus in this book. Thus, we have been burdened by the Lord to have a life study of this book. Revelation is a book of prophecy, 1 colon 3. 22 colon 7, for the revelation it contains is in the nature of prophecy. Most of the visions refer to things to come. Even the seven epistles to the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3, in the sense of signs, are prophecies regarding the church on earth until the Lord's coming back. Although this book is a book of prophecy, it is not prophecy merely in words, but in visions revealed to the seer. In the eyes of God, all the things prophesied in this book have already transpired and all have been shown to the seer in vision after vision. In the book of Revelation, most of the verbs and predicates are not in the future tense, but in the past tense, indicating that the events recorded in this book have already transpired. Strictly speaking, Revelation is not merely a prophecy. It is a revelation of things which have already taken place. While they may not seem in our eyes to have transpired, in God's eyes they have transpired. In God's eyes, everything recorded in this book occurred nearly 2,000 years ago. We all must believe this. Most Christians consider Revelation to be a book of predictions and they are curious to understand these predictions. Many of them read this book only for the sake of their curiosity. But we must say to the Lord, O oh Lord, save us from this. We don't want to know this book in the way of curiosity. I say strongly, once again, that Revelation is not merely a book of prophecy, but a record of things which have already taken place. In Revelation, two main things have transpired. The first is that the testimony of Jesus has been accomplished for eternity. Have you not seen the New Jerusalem? The Apostle John saw it nearly 2,000 years ago. Do you believe that you are in the New Jerusalem? If we appear to be crazy for saying this, we are crazy according to the Bible. The New Jerusalem, the ultimate consummation of God's work through the centuries, has been completely built up, and we are in it. According to the last two chapters of Revelation, the building of the New Jerusalem has been accomplished. This first item is on the positive side. On the negative side, a second main thing has transpired Satan, the enemy of God, has been dealt with. In the eyes of God and even in the eyes of our brother John, Satan has been cast into the lake of fire, 2010. Satan, the serpent, is in the lake of fire, and we are in the New Jerusalem. Have you seen this? If we have seen that Satan is in the lake of fire, we shall not beg God to deal with him. Rather, we shall praise him that the enemy has been dealt with. Whenever Satan troubles us, we must tell him, Satan, you are in the wrong place. You should not be here. You belong in the lake of fire. Go back there and do not come here again. Have you ever done this? We all must do it. The Bible is always consistent, even in the matter of Satan, God's enemy. In Genesis 3, Satan came to humanity in a very subtle way, coming in the form of a serpent. In Revelation, Satan is deliberately called the Old Serpent, 12,9, 20,2. In the book of Genesis, the serpent was not so old, but in the book of Revelation, he has become old, at least 6,000 years old. With a definite intention, the book of Revelation purposely calls him the Old Serpent. At the time of the book of Revelation, However, Satan is not only the old serpent. He has also become a dragon, 12,9, 20,2. According to Revelation, this dragon is firstly cast out of heaven and down to the earth, 12,7-9. Then, after three and one half years, he is bound and cast into the abyss, 20,1-3. In Revelation 20 we see that, still being somewhat useful in the hands of God, the Lord will release Satan from the abyss at the end of the thousand years, 20,7. After his release, Satan will try his best to damage humanity, 
to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to war, 20 colon 8. But, shortly afterward, according to 2010, the devil will be cast into the lake of fire, which is his destiny and destination. The book of Revelation has been closed because it exposes Satan, disclosing his destiny and destination. But now, at the end of time, we believe that the Lord will open up this book and open up our hearts, spirits, and eyes that we may clearly see that God's enemy is now in the lake of fire. Hallelujah, Satan, the old serpent, is in the lake of fire and we are in the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem is the testimony of Jesus. Today's church is also the testimony of Jesus. Today, we in the churches are the testimony of Jesus. We all must see this to the uttermost, forgetting ourselves, our weaknesses, our besetting sins, and even the fact that we are on earth. When someone asks you where you are, you must reply, I'm in the New Jerusalem. In the New Jerusalem there are no bugs, frogs, scorpions, or serpents. Furthermore, in that city there is no sin, death, or world. There is nothing there except Christ and God's redeemed and transformed people. If we see this, we shall praise the Lord and shout, Hallelujah. Revelation 1 colon 1 says, The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave to him to show to his slaves what must swiftly take place. And he made it known by signs, sending it by his angel to his slave, John. The revelation of this book is mainly composed of signs, that is, symbols with spiritual significance, such as the seven lampstands signifying the churches and the seven stars signifying the messengers of the churches, 120. Even the New Jerusalem is a sign, signifying the ultimate consummation of God's economy, ch 21-22. This book, then, is a book of symbols through which the revelation is made known to us. John's Gospel is a book of signs signifying how Christ came to be our life to produce the church, his bride. John's Revelation is also a book of signs showing how Christ is now caring for the church and how he is coming to judge and possess the earth and to bring the church, his bride, into God's full economy. I. A book of conclusion Revelation is a book of conclusion. If the book of Revelation were deleted from the Bible, there would be a great shortage, for there would be a beginning but no ending. Although there is the beginning in the book of Genesis, Without the book of Revelation there is no conclusion or consummation. After having a good start and after passing through so many works, there is the need for God to have a consummation. Without Revelation, there is no conclusion of God's economy. God is great. He is a God of purpose. For the fulfillment of His purpose, His economy must be accomplished. Many Bible students have neglected the matter of God's economy. If we did not have revelation, we could not see the consummation of God's economy. In fact, we would even find it difficult to realize what God's economy is, because we would not see the result, the issue of his economy. But in this book the revelation of God's economy is so clear because it contains the conclusion of God's economy. Without revelation, we would also have no conclusion to the redemption of Christ. Christ came in the flesh and died on the cross to accomplish redemption. But what does redemption accomplish? To say that Christ's redemption only saves sinners and brings them to heaven is a very poor conclusion. This kind of conclusion is not so meaningful. But in Revelation we see that Christ redeemed us, purchasing us with his blood, to make us a kingdom and priests. Hence, this book discloses the conclusion of Christ's redemption. Revelation 1 colon 6 says that Christ has made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. The believers redeemed by the blood of Christ have not only been born of God into his kingdom, John 3 colon 5, but have also been made a kingdom for God's economy, which is the church, Matt. 16 colon 18 dash 19. John, the writer of this book, was in this kingdom, 1 colon 9 and all the redeemed and reborn believers are a part of this kingdom, ROM 14.17. One of the main aspects of this book is that God is recovering his right over the earth to make the whole earth his kingdom, 11.15. When Christ came, he brought in the kingdom of God with him, Luke 17.21, Matt 12.28.
This kingdom has been enlarged into the church, Matt. 16, 18-19, which will bring in the consummation of the kingdom of God to the whole earth. On the one hand, the kingdom of God today is in the church, but on the other hand the kingdom of God is coming through the overcoming believers, 12-10. Then Christ and the overcoming believers will reign over all the nations in the millennial kingdom, 2, 26-27, 12, 5. 20, 4, 6. The redemption through Christ's blood has not only made us a kingdom to God but also priests to him, 1 Pet 2, 5. The kingdom is for God's dominion, while the priests, being those who express God's image, are for God's expression. This is the kingly, royal priesthood, 1 Pet 2, 9, for the fulfillment of God's original purpose in creating man, Gen. 1 colon 26 28. This kingly priesthood is being exercised in today's church life, 510. It will be intensely practiced in the millennial kingdom, 20 colon 6, and it will be ultimately consummated in the New Jerusalem, 22 colon 3, 5. The book of Revelation also presents a wonderful and marvelous consummation of the church. In this book we see God's economy, Christ's redemption, and the church's testimony. Without revelation, we could read the epistles again and again without realizing that the church is Christ's testimony. In which of the epistles do we see the churches shining as lampstands in the dark night? Only in the book of Revelation do we see this. In Revelation, the churches firstly are the shining lampstands. Eventually, in eternity, the church will be the new Jerusalem, a golden mountain. This is the wonderful consummation of the church. The present situation is a lie, and we should not believe it. Do not just say, how evil is the Catholic Church and how pitiful are the Protestant churches. We must look at the other side, the eternal side, where we see the new Jerusalem. Even today, during the dark night, we have the shining lampstands. Along with God's economy, Christ's redemption, and the Church's testimony, Revelation also discloses the enemy's destination. If we did not have the book of Revelation, we would not know what Satan's destiny is, and no one would be able to understand why God has been and still is tolerating the subtle, evil, dirty Satan. However, if we get into this book and see the conclusion of Satan's record, we shall be happy and laugh at the serpent. Therefore, in Revelation we have the conclusion of four major things God's economy, Christ's redemption, the church's testimony, and Satan's destiny. A. The conclusion of John's writings The book of Revelation is the conclusion of John's writings. As we pointed out in the life study of John, the writings of the Apostle John are of three categories, his gospel, his epistles, and his revelation. John's gospel is for the imparting of life. In John 10.10 10, Jesus said, I came that they may have life and may have it abundantly, and in John 12.24 he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. In these verses we see the imparting of life, which is the central thought of the Gospel of John. In John's epistles is the fellowship for the growth of life. Although life has been imparted into us, it needs to grow. Life grows by fellowship. Therefore, in John's epistles we see the fellowship for the growth of life. In the last category of John's writings, his revelation, we have the reaping of life. Firstly, life is imparted, then it grows, and eventually it is reaped. Without revelation, we would have the imparting of life and the growth of life, but not the reaping of life. b. The conclusion of the New Testament revelation is also the conclusion of the New Testament, which is composed of the Gospels, the Acts, the Epistles, and Revelation. In the Gospels we see the sowing of the seed of life, for in the Gospels Jesus came to sow himself into humanity as the seed of life, sowing himself into a small number of people, such as Peter and John. In the Acts is the propagation of life. In the Epistles we see the growth of life. The central concept of all the Epistles written by Paul, Peter, John, and the others is the growth of life. We all need to grow in life. In Revelation we see, once again, the harvest of life. 
In chapter 14 of Revelation we have a ripened field and a harvest. Revelation 14:15 says, Another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Send forth your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. In Revelation 14, the whole field is harvested. By this we see that Revelation is the conclusion of the New Testament. C. The conclusion of the entire Bible as the last book of the Bible, Revelation is the conclusion, completion, and consummation of the entire divine revelation, the whole Bible. The Bible needs such a conclusion. The seeds of most of the truths of the divine revelation were sown in Genesis, the first book of the Bible. The growth of all these seeds is progressively developed in the following books, especially in the books of the New Testament, and the harvest is reaped in the book of Revelation. For example, in Genesis is the seed of the serpent, and in the book of Revelation there is the harvest of the serpent. Hence, most of the things covered in this book are not absolutely new, but refer back to the foregoing books of the Bible. In Genesis is the seed of the divine revelation, in the following books is the progressive development of the divine revelation, and in Revelation is the harvest of the divine revelation. Therefore, we all must get into this book and know it. If we do not know this book, we cannot be clear about God's revelation. In our travels, we often are not clear about the way, the road, until we have reached our destination. After we have reached our destination and look back upon the way we have taken, we become very clear. In Revelation we arrive at the destination of the whole Bible. Having arrived at this destination, we can understand this divine book. 2. The contents now we come to the contents of Revelation. Do not think that the contents of this book are frogs, scorpions, locusts, horns, serpents, and horses. We should not even say that the contents are merely the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls. No, this book is not mainly concerned with these things. Revelation is firstly a book of Christ, secondly a book of the Church, and thirdly a book of God's economy. A. The revelation of Christ unique and ultimate the whole Bible reveals Christ. As the conclusion, completion, and consummation of the Bible, the book of Revelation especially is the revelation of Jesus Christ, 1 1. Although this book also reveals many other things, the focus of its revelation is Christ. Several aspects of Christ, such as the vision of him as the high priest in the midst of the churches, caring for them in love yet with a judging attitude, 1 colon 13-16, the vision of him as the lion lamb in the midst of God's throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the twenty-four elders of the universe, opening the seven seals of God's universal administration, 5 colon 1-6 colon 1, and the vision of him as another mighty angel coming down from heaven to take possession of the earth. 10 colon 1-8. 18 colon 1, have never been unveiled as they are in the book of Revelation. In this book, the revelation of Christ is unique and ultimate. In the Gospels, Acts, and Epistles we do not see that Christ has seven eyes, but this is revealed in the book of Revelation, 5 colon 6. Christ, our Savior, has seven eyes. How terrifying! This revelation of Christ is unique. In Luke 4.22 we are told that words of grace proceeded out of Christ's mouth but in Revelation 1.16 a sharp two-edged sword proceeds out of his mouth. Moreover, in his Gospel, John says, Behold, the Lamb of God, 1.29, but in Revelation one of the elders says, Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, 5.5. Hence, the revelation of Christ in this book is unique. In no other book is Christ unveiled as he is in Revelation. The first item of the contents of Revelation is this unique Christ. b. The testimony of Jesus particular and consummate on one hand, this book gives us the revelation of Christ, and on the other hand, it shows us the testimony of Jesus, which is particular and consummate, 1 2, 9, 12 17, 19 10, 20 4. The testimony of Jesus is the Church. Revelation presents the revealed Christ and the testifying Church. In this book we have a particular and consummate record of the Church. 
In no other book are the churches revealed as they are in the book of Revelation. The lamp stands in chapter 1, the great multitude of the redeemed in chapter 7, the bright woman with her man-child in chapter 12, the harvest with its first fruits in chapter 14, the overcomers on the sea of glass in chapter 15, the bride ready for marriage and the fighting army of Christ in chapter 19, and the new Jerusalem in chapters 21 and 22 are all the testimony of Jesus. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit the substance, the disposition, and the characteristic of the prophecy, 1910. Christ is the witness, 1 5, the testimony, the expression of God, and the church is the testimony, the expression of Christ. As such, the church is the reproduction of the testimony, the expression of God in Christ. The particular revelation of the church in this book is very crucial, and we all must see it. C. The economy of God universal and eternal The contents of Revelation also include the economy of God. God's economy is his universal and eternal administration. In the book of Revelation we see God's universal and eternal administration which is for the carrying out of his economy. Space-wise his administration is universal and time-wise it is eternal. 1. The seven seals in God's administration The first group of items is the seven seals. A seal indicates that something is closed, concealed, and not open to the public. The first four seals cover the history of the world from Christ's ascension to the end of this age, 6,1-8. This history is briefly yet all-inclusively covered in these four seals. With the opening of these seals we see four horses, every one of which has a rider. The rider of the first horse is the gospel preaching, the rider of the second is war, the rider of the third is famine, and the rider of the fourth is death. Hence, in these first four seals we have the gospel, war, famine, and death. If you know the history of the world, you will realize that this has exactly been the situation during the past twenty centuries. Since Christ's ascension, the gospel has been preached. Throughout the centuries, along with gospel preaching there has been war. Since the Roman Empire sent its armies to destroy the city of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, war has been intensified century after century. In the beginning of this century there was World War I and following that there was a greatly intensified war World War II. War always causes famine, and famine brings in death. These four horses are the content of the first four seals. The fifth seal covers the cry of the martyred saints, 6 9-11. This will occur close to the end of this age and near the beginning of the Great Tribulation. Due to the preaching of the gospel throughout the centuries, many saints have been martyred. Close to the end of this age these martyred saints will cry to God for revenge. The sixth seal, taking place very near to the time of the Great Tribulation, covers the shaking of earth and heaven, 6 17 At the opening of the sixth seal, there will be a great earthquake, 6 which will be a warning to earth's dwellers. Some evil ones say, who is God? We are God. Although they may say that they are God, when the real God comes to shake their dwelling place, then they will know who God is. I have met some people who have argued with me, saying, Mr. Lee, you preach about God. Don't you know that we are God? I answered, let us see who is God. Although God has some amount of toleration, his toleration is limited. One day you will exhaust his toleration, and his little finger will shake the earth. Then you will know who is God. Before the great tribulation begins, God will send forth a warning to all the earth's dwellers reminding them that there is a God. At the time of the sixth seal, God will not only shake the earth but also the heavens. Revelation 6 12 and 13 say, And there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. At that time, the earth will no longer be a suitable place for evil men to live boastfully. The most difficult seal to understand is the seventh. The seventh seal, which will last for eternity, consists of the seven trumpets. Do not confuse the seals with the trumpets. The seals are secret, but the trumpets are public. When you seal something, 
you make it secret and private, but when you sound a trumpet, you make something public. 2. The seven trumpets the contents of the seventh seal The seven trumpets are the contents of the seventh seal. The first four trumpets are the judgments on the earth, the sea, the rivers, and the sun, moon, and stars, 8,7-12. As a result of the judgments in the first four trumpets, the earth will no longer be a suitable place for people to live in. The fifth trumpet, the first woe is judgment on men, will be the beginning of the Great Tribulation, 8.13-9.11. As we shall see, the Great Tribulation will be terrible. The sixth trumpet, which is the second woe is a further judgment on men, is a part of the Great Tribulation, 9.12-21. The seventh trumpet is quite complicated. It consists of the eternal kingdom of Christ, the third woe comprising the seven bulls, the judgment of the dead, the rewarding of the saints and of the God-fearing people, and the destruction of the earth's destroyers, 11.14-18. The third woe, which is the second item of the seventh trumpet, will be the closing of the great tribulation. After this, there will be the rewarding of the prophets, the saints, and those who fear God's name. Throughout the generations, these three categories of people have been produced. The prophets mostly come from the Old Testament, the saints mostly come from the New Testament, and those who fear the name of God will be produced during the Great Tribulation. The seventh trumpet includes the reward the Lord will give to these three classes of people. The seventh trumpet also comprises the judgment of the dead and the destruction of the earth's destroyers. The destroyers of the earth are Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and all their followers. Hence, the seventh trumpet includes everything from the end of the tribulation to eternity. 3. The seven bowls The seven bowls, a part of the negative contents of the seventh trumpet as the last plagues of God's wrath on men, will be the ending of the great tribulation, 15 1, 6-8. 16 1-21. The seven bowls, like the seven seals and the seven trumpets, are composed of a group of the first four and then the fifth, sixth, and seventh. This grouping is meaningful. Certainly the writer of the book of Revelation must be God. Who else would have had the wisdom required to write it? If this book was written according to John's imagination, then John must be God. The book of Revelation is surely composed in a marvelous way. 3. The sections the book of Revelation has five sections, the introduction, 1,1-8, the things seen, 1,9-20, the things present, 2,1-3,22, the things to come, 4,1-22,5, and the conclusion, 22,6-21. In the introduction we have the revelation of Christ and the testimony of Jesus. Although revelation includes God's economy, God's economy is not the crucial focus of this book. The two crucial items which are the focus of Revelation are Christ and the Church, that is, the revelation of Christ and the testimony of Jesus. Following this introduction, we have the things seen the seven lampstands and the Son of Man with the seven stars. Then, in chapters 2 and 3, we have the things present the seven local churches. The next section, covering the things to come, has two parts. The first part, 4,1-11,19, consists of a general view of the things to come from Christ's ascension to eternity future. In the second part, 12,1-22,5, we find the details of the important things covered in the first part. These two parts resemble Genesis chapters 1 and 2. In Genesis 1 we have a general record of God's creation. In Genesis 2 we have the details of God's creation of man. In the same principle, in 4,1-11-19 we have a general view of all the things to come, and in 12,1-22,5 we have the details of the important things to come. Do not consider the last 11 chapters as a continuation of the first 11 chapters, for the general view of the things to come concludes at the end of chapter 11. Following all the details of the things to come unveiled in the second part of this section, we have 22,6-21 as the conclusion to the book of Revelation. Life study of Revelation message 2 The revelation of Christ unique and ultimate in this message we come to the revelation of Christ. 
In their reading of the book of Revelation not many Christians have paid their full attention to the revelation of Christ contained in it. This term, the revelation of Jesus Christ, is found in 1 colon 1, and Bible students have held different opinions of its interpretation. Some say that this term means that the book of Revelation is a book given by Christ as a revelation. This interpretation, which makes the revelation of Christ very objective, is not accurate. If we read the whole book of Revelation, we shall see that this term indicates that revelation is the unveiling of Christ himself. It is a picture, a depiction, of Christ, not merely a revelation given by Christ. We must see that Christ is the center, the focus, and the predominant figure of the whole book of Revelation. Thus, we must take the term the revelation of Jesus Christ in a subjective way. It is not merely a revelation given by Christ, but a revelation which unveils Christ to us. Christ is revealed in the prophecies, types, and clear words of the Old Testament. In a sense, we do not need the New Testament, for if we read the Old Testament, Paying close attention to the prophecies, types, and clear words regarding Christ, we shall have a revelation of Christ. Through these revelations, we can visualize what kind of Christ is Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, however perfect are the revelations of Christ in the Old Testament, they are not complete. Hence, we must come to the New Testament which fully is a revelation of Christ. If we merely read the Gospels, the Acts, and the Epistles, we shall see many aspects of Christ, but we shall not see the aspects covered in the book of Revelation. In this message we must see the unique and particular aspects of Christ's revelation contained in this book. I. Christ in his ascension in the book of Revelation, Christ is revealed as the Ascended One, 5 colon 3-6, 8-14. In the four Gospels we see Christ incarnated, living on earth, crucified, and resurrected. However, we do not see very much concerning Christ in his ascension. Even in the epistles we see little of Christ's ascension. Although the Gospels, the Acts, and the epistles say something regarding Christ's ascension, in none of these books do we find a clear picture of the scene or state in the heavens after Christ's ascension. If we would see this picture, we must come to the book of Revelation where we have a portrait of Christ in the heavens after his ascension. In this book we have a full and clear picture of the very Christ who has ascended into the heavens. Furthermore, in this picture we see the scene, the sight, the state in the heavens after Christ's ascension. Only when we see this revelation will we worship him in an adequate way. A. The Lion Lamb in his ascension, Christ is the Lion Lamb, 5,5-6. In the Gospel of John, John the Baptist declared, Behold, the Lamb of God. John 1 29. But in the scene in the heavens after Christ's ascension, Christ is revealed mainly as the lion, not as the lamb. While John was weeping because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it, Rev. 5 4, one of the elders said to him, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome to open the scroll and its seven seals, 5 5. Before the crucifixion, there might have been reason for John to weep. But it was foolish for him to weep after the ascension. Are you weeping today? If you are still weeping, it means that you have not seen the vision of the ascended Christ in Revelation 5. You need to behold the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Genesis 49,8 and 9 prophesy concerning Christ as the Lion of Judah, and only in Revelation are we told that Christ is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has overcome and is worthy to open the seals of God's economy. After John heard this declaration from one of the elders, he saw in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, a lamb standing as having been slain, 5 6. He saw the Lion as the Lamb. Is Christ the Lion or the Lamb? He is both. Hence, we may call him the Lion Lamb. Why is Christ both the Lion and the Lamb? Because we have two main problems sin and Satan. Most Christians only take care of the sin problem and forget the Satan problem. Do not think that your husband is so difficult. Do not blame him, but blame Satan who is behind him. Likewise, 
every wife is good. The bad things which come out of our wives do not actually issue from them but from Satan who is behind them. The lamb is versus sin and solves the problem of sin, and the lion deals with Satan. As the lamb, Christ has accomplished redemption, having washed us from our sins. As the lion, he has dealt with Satan. He is adequate to meet our needs and to solve our problems. Now sin is over, Satan has been terminated, and we have been redeemed and rescued from the usurping hand of the enemy. B. The worthy one our Savior is the Lamb as well as the Lion. We have a Lion Lamb Savior. This one is worthy to open the scroll. Apart from him, no one in the universe is worthy to open the secret, the mystery, of God's economy. But the Lion Lamb is worthy because he has accomplished redemption and has won the victory over Satan. Whenever we Christians have said that Christ was worthy, our thought was that he was worthy of our praises and thanks and worship. When we said, Lord Jesus, you are worthy, not many of us realized that he was worthy to open the seals of the secret of God's economy. We only had the concept that Christ was worthy to receive worship, praise and thanks from us, his little creatures. But this is an inadequate concept of the Lord's worthiness. Yet most hymns on the worthiness of Christ express this inadequate concept of his worthiness. Not many hymns praise Christ for being worthy to open the secret of God's economy. This aspect of the Lord's worthiness is universal and immeasurable. Of course, Christ is worthy of our praises. He is even worthy of our lives. Nevertheless, we must realize that, according to Revelation 5, Christ's worthiness is a matter of his being worthy to open the secret of God's economy. The universe is a mystery which the scientists cannot unravel. They simply do not know the meaning or the purpose of the universe, because it is a secret kept from them. But Christ is worthy to open this secret for he is worthy to open the seals of God's economy. Revelation 5:5 says that the lion is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. A scroll is a roll of parchment paper or other material. Because a scroll is rolled up, it is difficult to determine just how long it is. The scroll in Revelation 5 is eternally long. Only Christ is worthy to open this eternally long scroll. Do not think that you have seen everything contained in this scroll. No, we shall need eternity to see all that is included in it. When we are in the New Jerusalem, we shall still be reading the contents of the scroll. For eternity we shall say, now I see something more. God will give us an eternal surprise. The surprise of the opening of the scroll will last for eternity. When you are in eternity, you may say, the Lord's surprise is eternal. Although we are now in eternity, we still cannot see the end. Christ is worthy to open this scroll of God's mystery. See. Worshipped by the angels and all the other creatures because Christ is so worthy. Here in this heavenly scene he is worshipped by the angels and all the other creatures. The angels are represented by the twenty-four elders, and all the other creatures are represented by the four living creatures. The angels have elders, the twenty-four angelic elders who take the lead to worship Christ. Here in this picture we see the twenty-four elders praising and all the angels praising, the four living creatures praising and all the other creatures praising. Together they render universal worship to God and the Lamb. The Christ in whom we believe is such a universal Christ. 2. Christ in his administration Now we come to Christ in his administration. There is an administration in the universe. The universe does not operate in a nonsensical way. It operates according to God's administration. Although we cannot see this administrator, he is nonetheless carrying out his divine administration. All earthquakes, such as the earthquake which recently hit North China, come from his administration. Christ is not only the Savior, the Lion, and the Lamb. He is also the administrator of the whole universe. A. Among the churches firstly, Christ is administrating God's purpose among the churches, exercising a priestly care for the churches, 1.11-18. In Chapter 1, Christ is revealed as the Son of Man clothed in the robe of the High Priest. Today, in God's administration, Christ exercises his priestly care among the churches. Among the churches, he is clad in a priestly robe. Furthermore, 
he is girded about at the breasts with a golden girdle, 113. It is interesting to note that he is not girded about the loins but about the breasts. This indicates that all his work has been accomplished and that now he is exercising a loving care for his beloved churches. Today, Christ no longer works, but he cares for us. He even rebukes and chastises us in love. He is the loving priest caring for his churches today. B. In the heavens revelation clearly shows that, on the one hand, Christ is among the churches and that, on the other hand, he is in the heavens carrying out God's economy. The strongest proof of this is in 5 colon 7, which, speaking of Christ's receiving the scroll, says, And he came and took it out of the right hand of him who sits upon the throne. The scroll of God's economy has been put into Christ's hands. He now holds God's economy and carries it out. We do not see this revelation in any other New Testament book. While Christ is in the heavens carrying out God's economy, which is mainly concerned with God's judgment of the earth, he takes care of God's people, 7 1-3, 8-3-5. -3 this is fully revealed in chapters 7 and 8. God has two peoples the children of Israel and the redeemed saints. No matter how much this earth is judged by Christ in God's administration, he will take care of the chosen Israel and of the redeemed church. Hallelujah! We all are under Christ's care in his administration. I strongly believe that today Christ is caring for the nation of Israel. It does not matter what the other nations say or do, for the nation of Israel is under the care of Christ's universal administration. The other countries may try certain things, but all will be in vain because of the watchful concern of the universal administrator. We all must worship Christ as the administrator as the one in the heavens administering all things for the fulfillment of God's economy. 3. Christ in his coming back A. Secret as a thief no book reveals Christ's coming back as clearly as the book of Revelation does. This book reveals that Christ's coming back has two aspects a secret aspect and a public aspect. This is possible because Christ is wonderful. Firstly, Christ will come back secretly as a thief, 3 colon 3b. 1615. No thief tells you in advance the time of his arrival. In his secret coming as a thief, Christ will come to steal the precious things. No thief steals things that are without value. Thieves only come to steal what is valuable. Christ tells us to be watchful, saying, If therefore you will not watch, I will come as a thief, and you shall by no means know at what hour I will come upon you. 3 3b. The time of his secret coming is unknown. We all must ask ourselves, am I precious? Am I worthy of being stolen by Christ in his secret coming? B. Open on the cloud at the close of the great tribulation, Christ will come openly on the cloud, 1 7, 14 14. Among Christians, there are two concepts of Christ's second coming. According to one concept, Christ will come before the tribulation, and according to the other concept, his coming will be after the tribulation. Because many Christians have not seen the two aspects of Christ's coming the secret aspect and the open aspect they have been fighting amongst themselves. Both the coming before the tribulation and the coming after the tribulation have some basis in the scriptures. But, having tunnel vision, most Christians have not seen the whole view of Christ's coming back. Firstly, Christ will come secretly and then he will come publicly. His secret coming will be for the overcoming saints, and his public coming will be for all the earth. Thus, 1 colon 7 says, Behold, he comes with the clouds, and every eye shall see him. When Christ comes on the cloud, the earth will see him. We must be clear that Christ's coming back will firstly be concealed and eventually it will be manifested openly and publicly. 4. Christ in his judgment in a very positive sense, the book of Revelation is a book of judgment. Christ, God's administrator, will judge everything. Firstly, he judges the church, and afterwards, he will judge the world. A. On all the world Christ will judge all the world by the sixth seal, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls, 6 colon 12-17, 8 colon 1-2, 12. 11 colon 14 15. 
15 colon 1, 7 to 8, 16 colon 1 dash 21. During the more than 19 centuries since Christ's ascension, the world has been punished by natural calamities. But from the opening of the sixth seal, the world will be punished by supernatural calamities. Revelation 6 12 and 13 say, And I saw when he opened the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sun becoming black as sackcloth, the moon becoming as blood, and the stars falling to the earth are supernatural calamities. The seven trumpets will also be supernatural calamities. The first four trumpets will bring forth judgment on the earth, the sea, the rivers, and the sun, moon, and stars. The great tribulation will begin with the fifth trumpet, continue with the sixth trumpet, and be concluded with the seven bowls of the seventh trumpet. All these are the judgments executed by Christ on the world. B. On the Great Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18 we see the judgment on the Great Babylon, which is apostate Christendom. Besides his judgment upon the whole world, the Lord will execute a special judgment upon Christendom, Babylon the Great. C. On Antichrist, the false prophet, Satan, and their followers Christ's judgment will also be upon Antichrist, the false prophet, Satan, and their followers, 19:11-20:3, 7 to 10. The Antichrist is the man of sin, 2 Thess. 2:3, and the little horn, Dan. 7:8, and the false prophet is the one who works with the Antichrist. The Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan are devilishly triune and form a counterfeit trinity. Because the Antichrist will be so enticing and attractive, he will have a great following. But all his followers will be destroyed along with the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan. Christ will judge the Antichrist and the false prophet by means of supernatural calamities, the earth will open and they will fall directly into the lake of fire. They will not die, be buried, and resurrected, and then face the judgment at the great white throne. In their case, there will not be the need for these procedures. They will fall into the lake of fire supernaturally. D. On the dead lastly, as God's administrator, Christ will judge the dead, 20.11-15. Do not think that if you die everything will be all right. You may desire to die, but the Lord wants to make you alive. If you are not willing for him to enliven you today for salvation, at the end of the old creation he will resurrect you for judgment. At that time, he will not resurrect you in a positive sense but in a negative sense. John 5:28 and 29 say, An hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs shall hear his voice, and shall come forth. Those who have done the evil to the resurrection of judgment. The unbelieving dead will not remain buried for eternity. They will be resurrected, judged, and then cast into the lake of fire. V. Christ in his possession of the earth at the completion of his judgment of the world, Christ will come back to take full possession of the earth, 10:1-7, 18:1. The whole earth will belong to him. Not one part of it will belong to anyone else. Today many nations are fighting to increase their territory, but they are fighting in vain, for whatever they gain will eventually belong to Christ. In his coming back to take possession of the earth, Christ will be like another angel. A number of times in the book of Revelation the title, Another Angel, is used with respect to Christ, 7,2, 8,3, 10,1, This title is used to denote Christ because, as God's administrator, he behaves like an angel. In the Old Testament, Christ was called the Angel of the Lord, Gen. 22,11-12, Exo. 3,2-6, who was sent by God to carry out God's commission. When he comes to take over the earth, he will come as one who has been commissioned by God for this purpose. He will be another angel with great authority and will come in his glory, 18,1. In his coming, Christ will place his right foot on the sea and the left on the land, 10,2. This indicates that he will tread upon the sea and the land, which means that he will take possession of them, 
Deuteronomy 11:24, Josh 1:3. In the Bible, whatever your feet tread upon becomes your possession. Since Christ will tread upon the sea and the land, both the sea and the land will belong to him. After Christ possesses the earth, he will finish the mystery of God, Revelation 10:7. At that time, the economy of God will be fully manifested. It will no longer be a mystery, but an open secret. 6. Christ in his reigning in the kingdom after Christ takes possession of the earth, he will reign over the earth as the king in the kingdom, ruling over the nations with his overcoming believers, 20 colon 4, 6. 2 colon 26 27. None of us are happy with the rulers of this earth. As one who has traveled throughout the world and who has come to know the world situation, I realize that as far as ruling is concerned, the entire earth is poor. Where are the proper rulers? We are awaiting the day when Christ will come as the king to reign over the earth. Christ will reign in his kingdom, and we shall be his CO kings. 7. Christ in his centrality and universality in eternity ultimately, in the book of Revelation we see Christ in his centrality and universality in eternity. In eternity, Christ will be everything. He will be the centrality and universality in the New Jerusalem, 21,9-10-23, as the tree of life growing in the river of water of life, 22,1-2. In Revelation 21,23 we have a clear picture of the centrality and universality of Christ. Here we see that God is the light and that Christ, the Lamb, is the lamp. Light is always contained in a lamp. Thus, the light and the lamp should never be separated. They must remain one. God is the light, Christ is the lamp, and the New Jerusalem is the container of this lamp. God shines in and through Christ, and Christ shines in and through the New Jerusalem. By this we see that Christ will be the centrality and universality of the coming eternity. God in Christ and Christ in the redeemed ones will shine throughout eternity. This will be the scene in eternity when Christ will be the center, the circumference, and everything in the New Jerusalem. This is our Christ. Life Study of Revelation Message 3 The Testimony of Jesus Particular and Consummate The Book of Revelation Firstly Reveals Christ, and Secondly The Testimony of Jesus. In other words, this book is concerned with Christ and the Church. In Revelation, Christ and the Church are revealed in a unique and particular way. In the last message we pointed out that many aspects of Christ which are not found in other books in the Bible are unveiled in Revelation. The same is true with the Church. The book of Revelation unfolds the Church in a very particular way. In this message we shall present a summary of the aspects of the Church found in Revelation, while in later messages we shall cover the details. I. The lamp stands firstly, in Revelation the churches are unveiled as being the lamp stands, 1,11-20. In no other New Testament book is this term used with respect to the church. In other books we are told that the church is the gathering of God's chosen ones, that it is the body of Christ, and that it is the house of God. But apart from Revelation, we are not told that the church is the lampstand. As the lamp stands, the churches shine in the darkness. The word lampstand enables us to understand much about the church and its function. The church is not the lamp. It is the lampstand, the stand which holds the lamp. Without the lamp, the lampstand is vain and means nothing. But the lampstand holds the shining lamp. As we saw in the preceding message, God is the light and the Lamb is the lamp, 21:23. Thus, Christ is the lamp, and the church is the lampstand holding the lamp. God is in Christ and Christ as the lamp is held by the stand to shine out God's glory. This is the testimony of the church. A. Golden divine, in nature as the local churches, the lamp stands are golden in nature. In typology, gold signifies divinity, the divine nature of God. All the local churches are divine in nature. They are constituted with the divine nature of God. To say this is absolutely scriptural, for the book of Revelation says that the local churches are golden lamp stands, 120. These stands are not built of clay, wood, or any inferior substance. They are constructed out of pure gold. 
This means that all the local churches must be divine. Without divinity, there can be no church. Although the church is composed of humanity with divinity, humanity should not be the basic nature of the local churches. The basic nature of the local churches must be divinity, God's divine nature. By these two simple words golden lamp stands we realize a great deal about the church, that the church is something shining with Christ and that it is constituted with the divine nature. B. Shining in darkness the lamp stands shine in the darkness. If there were no darkness, there would be no need for the shining of the light of the lamp. The shining of the lamp is quite particular. In order for the lamp to shine, it must have oil burning within it. If the oil burns within the lamp, the light will shine out through all the darkness. This is the function of the church. The function of the church is not simply to preach or to teach doctrine. In the dark night of this age, the church must shine out the very glory of God. This is the testimony of the church. C. Identical with one another all the lampstands are identical with one another. Many Christians, having taken in a mistaken concept, desire to be different from other Christians. When I came to this country 14 years ago, I met some dear Christians who were troubled because the local churches were all the same. They told me that they would try their best to be different. This is not right. Everyone has a head, two shoulders, two arms, two hands, and ten fingers, and every human head has seven holes, two ears, two eyes, two nostrils, and a mouth. It is ridiculous to say, I don't want to have the same appearance as others. In order to be different, I would like to have five holes in my head. How ridiculous this is. Those who claim that every local church should be unique base their concept upon the differences among the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. Some have said, look, all the seven churches are different. In the early years, when I was very young, I was influenced by this concept and I taught the same thing. But one day the light dawned upon me and I saw that all the differences in the local churches in Revelation 2 and 3 are negative, not positive. Ephesus lost her first love negative. Pergamos is worldly negative. Thyatira is demonic negative. And Laodicea became lukewarm negative. On the positive side, however, all the local churches are identical, because they all are seven golden lampstands. If you could place all the seven lampstands on a table before you, unless you numbered or labeled them, you would be unable to tell them apart. All the seven lampstands are the same. Nevertheless, since 1962, some voices in this country have declared loudly that they will never be like the church in Los Angeles. Where are those voices today? They have faded away, and all the peculiar concepts they advocated have failed. I am not saying that all must follow the church in Los Angeles. But if Los Angeles has seven holes, then it would be ridiculous for others to insist upon having five holes. On the positive side, all the local churches must be identical. On the negative side, however, they are different. If the church in Los Angeles would worship idols, then we must refuse to follow them. In matters such as this, we must be different. But it is wrong to say that, on the positive side, the local churches should not be the same. We should not try to make ourselves peculiar or different this is pride. One day the Lord showed me that the four sides of the New Jerusalem are exactly the same. Each side of the wall is built with the same material jasper. It is not that one side is built with jasper and the other sides with brass. No, all four sides are the same. Likewise, universally, all the churches must be the same. They need not be the same in organization but they must be identical in appearance. For example, the churches in New Zealand should be the same as the churches in Japan. Because we all are one church, all the churches on earth should be universally the same. Locally, we are the churches. Universally, we are the church. This is the testimony of Jesus. 2. The great multitude in 7,9-17 we see the testimony of Jesus as the great multitude. According to the record of chapter 7, this great multitude is the whole body of God's redeemed ones, having been redeemed out of every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, 7 9. 
all of them have passed through tribulation. This indicates that at no time nor at any place is there a church which has not passed through tribulation. The world always persecutes the churches, John 16:33. Wherever the church is, there will always be a certain amount of persecution. That the whole body of the redeemed ones will pass through tribulation is indicated by 7:14, which says, These are those who come out of the great tribulation. This great multitude has come out of tribulation in a victorious way, for they all hold palm branches which signify their victory over tribulation, 7 9. Eventually, in eternity, they will be overshadowed by God with his tabernacle. As 7.15 says, he who sits upon the throne shall spread his tabernacle over them. This is the destiny of God's redeemed ones. How wonderful! Furthermore, they will also be shepherded by the Lamb at the springs of waters of life for eternity, 7.17. Revelation 7,9-17 does not portray a particular group of believers. Rather, it presents a general record of the whole body of God's redeemed ones and their state in eternity. In eternity, their state will be that of enjoying God's overshadowing and Christ's shepherding. This is our destiny. This portion of the word reveals that while Christ is executing God's judgment upon mankind, he will take care of God's redeemed ones. All God's redeemed ones eventually will be raptured to the throne of God and will stand there enjoying God's overshadowing and the Lamb's shepherding. 3. The Woman with the Man-Child A. The woman in 12,1-17 we see another symbol of the church, the woman with the man-child. The church is not only the lampstand and the great redeemed multitude. It is also the greater part of the woman with the man-child. No human mind would ever conceive of the church in this way. The woman in this chapter represents the whole body of God's people, and the man-child represents the stronger part of God's people. As there is the man-child within the woman, so among God's people there is a stronger part. This woman, who is bright with the sun, the moon, and twelve stars, twelve colon one, and who is persecuted by Satan, the great red dragon, represents God's people throughout all the generations. In every generation, a portion of God's people has always been persecuted by Satan. Nevertheless, during the three and a half years of the Great Tribulation she will be protected by God from the attack of the serpent. b. The man-child as we have seen, the man-child is the stronger part of the people of God. Among the people of God, even among us in the Lord's recovery today, there is the stronger part. This stronger part will be raptured to the throne of God before the Great Tribulation. In other words, the woman will be left on earth to pass through the tribulation, but the stronger part, the man-child, will be raptured to the throne of God before the tribulation. Why will the man-child be raptured prior to the tribulation? Because God needs the man-child to fight Satan in the heavens and to cast him down. Although God has many angels who will fight against Satan, the final victory over the enemy will not be gained by the angels but by the man-child. God needs the man-child. God will shame Satan by using the very man Satan corrupted to defeat him. God may say, Satan, you have corrupted the man I created. But I have got a man-child out of this corrupted man to defeat you. And he will not mainly defeat you on earth but in heaven. The man-child will fight through and up, fighting up to the throne to cast Satan down from the heavens to the earth. This is a part of the testimony of Jesus. Although Jesus has defeated Satan on the cross, there is still the need for the church to execute his victory over the enemy. Because so many members of the body have failed in this matter, only the stronger part of the body, the man-child, will execute Christ's victory over Satan. The man-child will be raptured to the heavens to accomplish this job. The rapture is not merely for our blessing. We should not just say, how good it is for me to be raptured to the heavens. We must realize that God has a need for us to be raptured we must be raptured to heaven that we might fight against the enemy. If when you hear this you say, I don't want to go there and be involved in a war, this means that you are not qualified to be raptured before the tribulation. If you do not go to heaven to meet Satan and cast him down, then he will come down to the earth to meet you and overcome you. We must be the man-child. I earnestly desire to be a part of the man-child. 
I am not satisfied simply to be a part of the woman. I want to be included in that stronger part. This also is an aspect of the testimony of Jesus. 4. The first fruits and the harvest Now we come to the first fruits and the harvest, 14,1-5, 14-16. The church is not only the lampstand shining and the man-child fighting, but also a field growing a crop which must ripen and become mature. Any crop which is still green is too tender to be harvested. But once the crop has ripened in the field, it will be harvested immediately. A. The first fruits that part of the crop which ripens first is called the first fruits. The first fruits will be raptured to Zion in the heavens before the great tribulation. As 14,4 points out, the first fruits are those who follow the Lamb wherever he may go. Being the first fruits, they are raptured to the house of God in Zion as the fresh enjoyment to God. This is for God's satisfaction. According to the type in the Old Testament, the first fruits of the ripened harvest were not taken to the barn but into the temple of God, XO 23:19. This indicates that all the early overcomers will be taken up to the house of God in heaven for God's enjoyment. The rapture is not mainly for our enjoyment but for God's enjoyment. The rapture is for defeating the enemy and for satisfying God. We must not only be today's lampstands but also today's man-child to fight against God's enemy and today's first fruits to satisfy God's desire. b. The harvest following the first fruits, in chapter 14, we have the harvest. Verse 15 says, Another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Send forth your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. The harvest will be reaped near the end of the Great Tribulation. It will be raptured to the air where Christ will be on the cloud. Why will the harvest be left to pass through the Great Tribulation? Because green, unripened fields need strong sunshine in order to ripen. In a sense, the Great Tribulation will be the strong sunshine which will ripen all the saints who will not be ready before the Tribulation. To put it simply, if today you do not give up the world and live for Christ, Christ will leave you on earth to pass through the great tribulation. At that time, you will surely give up the world and realize that the best way to live is to live for Christ. All the children of God must do this. Otherwise, they could never ripen. If you do not believe my word, I ask you to wait. Perhaps you feel that the world is too lovely to give up. If so, the Lord may say, since you love the world so much. I will leave you with the world and let you find out whether it is really lovely. Then the Lord will shake the world, and eventually you will say, Lord, I repent. That repentance, however, may be rather late. Do not wait until the great tribulation comes to repent. Repent now. Sooner or later, every real Christian must repent. I have the full assurance that eventually every saved one will realize that the world is not lovely but poisonous. The more you love the world, the more you are poisoned by it. The world is at enmity with God, and we all must despise it. Sooner or later, the Lord will cause you to realize how much he hates this world. The day will come when all of us will be ripe. But do not say, I don't care about being ripe. As long as I'm saved, everything will be all right. You may be able to argue against me with your strong, stubborn will but the day will come when you will realize that you need to ripen. I advise you not to wait for the harvest. By his grace, come forward to be a part of the first fruits. V. The overcomers over the beast in 15,2-4 We see the overcomers over the beast. God is sovereign. Even during the time of the great tribulation, there will be some overcomers, those whom we may call the late overcomers. These overcomers will pass through the great tribulation in which the Antichrist, the beast, will compel people to worship him as God and to worship his image in the temple of God. We expect to see the rebuilding of the temple in Israel, for this will be a sign that the Lord's coming back is very near. The Bible prophesies that Antichrist will erect his image in the temple of God and will force people to worship it, Matt 24,15. During that time, many Christians will overcome the beast and be killed. I advise you to be an early overcomer and to love the Lord today.
Do not wait to overcome by being killed during the Great Tribulation. According to Chapter 15, the later overcomers will be raptured to stand on the glassy sea, a sea of glass mingled with fire, 15,2, and will praise God with the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb, 15,3. Those on the glassy sea are those who have the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, 15,2. These are they who overcome the beast, his image, and the worship of the idol of the Antichrist. Revelation 20,4 and 6 indicate that some of the CO kings of Christ will be these late overcomers. I say again that I prefer to be an early overcomer, not a late one. If you are sloppy, you will be left to pass through the great tribulation. We all must look to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to be an early overcomer. We shall cover the details when we come to Revelation 15 in this life study. 6. The Bride in 19 7-9 We see the Church as the Bride. Ephesians 5 reveals that the Church is the Bride of Christ, but it does not reveal the Bride in such an intimate way. But in Revelation 19 we see how intimate is the church as the bride. In this portion of the word we see that the bride will wear bright raiment, being clothed with bright and pure righteousness, and will be invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb, verses 7 to 9. This is a very intimate matter. To God's enemy, we must be the man-child. For God's satisfaction, we must be the first fruits. And for Christ, we must be the bride. When we are eager to be the bride, Christ will receive his satisfaction. Not only will Christ be satisfied, but we ourselves will be glad. Revelation 19:7 says, Let us rejoice and exult. In principle, a bride is the most pleasant and happy person. Today, as the church, Christ's counterpart, we are suffering and undergoing many dealings. But the day is coming when there will be no more persecutions, sufferings, or dealings. I have never seen a bride who was dealt with on her wedding day. Oh, we must be the bride. When we have become the bride, all the difficult dealings will be over. 7. The army the church is also the army, 19 14-19, 17-14. The part of the church which will be the man-child to fight against the enemy in the heavens will also be the army to fight with Christ against Satan on earth. After all the raptures have been completed and after the believers have been judged at the judgment seat of Christ, all the overcomers will come back to the earth with Christ as his army to fight against the Antichrist and his army. Both Christ and Antichrist will have an army. Although one army is heavenly and the other is earthly, both will fight on the earth. In other words, Antichrist will fight against Christ and his army, and Christ will fight back with his army. The false Christ will be so bold as to fight against the real Christ, but the real Christ will war against the false one. In 1714 we see that Christ's heavenly army will be composed of all the overcomers, those who have been called and chosen. Eventually, at the end of this war, Christ will defeat the Antichrist. 8. The New Jerusalem ultimately, the testimony of Jesus will be the New Jerusalem, 21,1-22,5. Beginning with the lampstand and passing through the great multitude, the man-child, the firstfruits, the late overcomers, the bride, and the army, all the saved ones will eventually be the New Jerusalem, which will be a living composition of all of God's redeemed ones, the ultimate consummation of God's building of his people. In and for eternity, the New Jerusalem will express God in the Lamb with the flow of the Spirit. When we come to chapters 21 and 22, we shall see a clear picture of this ultimate consummation. Life study of Revelation message for the triune God in Revelation The whole Bible is the revelation of God. In the book of Revelation we have the ultimate and complete revelation of who God is. God is triune. We all are familiar with the term the triune God. This is a great matter in God's revelation. Throughout the centuries, however, most Christians have not fully realized the meaning of the term the triune God. In the book of Revelation, the book which reveals things in an ultimate way, we see something deeper, higher, richer, and sweeter concerning the triune God. We have seen that in Revelation, the revelation of Christ and the testimony of Jesus are ultimate. 
In this message, we need to see that here the revelation of the triune God is also ultimate. Revelation 1 4 and 5 say, Grace to you and peace from him who is, and who was, and who is coming, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. He who is and who was, and who is coming is God the Eternal Father. The seven spirits who are before God's throne are the operating spirit of God, God the Spirit. Jesus Christ, who is to God the faithful witness, to the church the firstborn of the dead, and to the world the ruler of the kings of the earth, is God the Son. This is the triune God. As God the Eternal Father, He was in the past, He is in the present, and He is coming in the future. As God the Spirit, He is the sevenfold, intensified Spirit for God's operation. As God the Son, He is the witness, the testimony, the expression of God. The firstborn of the dead for the Church, the new creation. And the ruler of the kings of the earth for the world. From such a triune God, grace and peace are imparted into the churches. I. The Almighty God The Book of Revelation tells us that God is the Almighty God, 1 colon 8. 19 colon 6, 15. In the Hebrew language, the title God means the Mighty One, the One who is powerful. But in Revelation we see that God is not only mighty, but almighty. He is powerful in every way, in every aspect, in everything, and with everyone. God's title means that He is the Almighty One. A. The Lord this Almighty One is the Lord. Being the Lord means that He is the owner of the universe. We may say that He is the landlord of the whole universe. He is the ruler, the authority, in this universe. What we or others say means nothing. But what God says means everything because He is the Lord. When He says, yes, it means yes, and when He says, no, it means no. God is not only the Lord, the owner, and the authority. He is also the master. The whole universe, including the angels and all human beings, is under Him. We have a master who possesses us. Before I was saved, I did not know to whom I belonged. But now I can shout, God is my master, the one who possesses me. Hallelujah, he is my Lord. B. The Alpha and the Omega Revelation 1 8 says that the Lord God is the Alpha and the Omega. The Eternal and Almighty God is the Alpha, the beginning for the origination, and the Omega, the ending for the completion of his eternal purpose. In the book of Genesis he was the Alpha, and now in the book of Revelation he is the Omega. Whatever he has originated he will complete. Governmentally, he continues his universal operation which he originated from eternity and will bring to completion, 21,6. C. Who is, who was, and who is coming God is also the one who is, who was, and who is coming. This is the meaning of the name Jehovah. In Hebrew, Jehovah means, I am that I am. His being the I am signifies that he is the one who exists from eternity to eternity. His title, I am, not only indicates that he exists but that, in a positive sense, he is everything. He is life, light, and every other positive thing. Do you need life? God is life. Do you want light? God is light. Do you desire holiness? God is holiness. God exists from eternity to eternity and He is everything. This is our God. As we have seen, our God is triune. His being triune means that He is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. It is impossible for us to understand the triune God thoroughly, for the Divine Trinity far surpasses our mentality. Do not exercise your mentality so much. Rather, Exercise your spirit to realize and experience the triune God as the Father, Son, and Spirit. 2. The Father Firstly, the very Almighty God is the Father. The Father is nothing less than God Himself. His being the Father means that He is the Source. The Father is also the Lord, and, as 1 4 makes clear, He is the One who is, who was, and who is coming. 3. The Spirit in Revelation 
the sequence of the triune God is different from that found in Matthew. In Matthew 28,19 the sequence of the triune God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But in 1,4 and 5 the sequence is changed. The seven spirits of God are listed in the second place instead of the third. This reveals the importance of the intensified function of the sevenfold spirit of God. This point is confirmed by the repeated emphasis on the spirit speaking in 2,7, 11, 17, 29. 3,6, 13, 22, 14, 13, 22, 17. At the opening of the epistles, only the Father and the Son are mentioned, from whom grace and peace are given to the receivers. Here, however, the Spirit is also included, from whom grace and peace are imparted to the churches. This also signifies the crucial need of the Spirit for God's move to counteract the degradation of the church. A. The seven spirits of God let us now see why in Revelation the Spirit occupies the second place in the sequence of the Divine Trinity. It is because in this book the age has been changed from the Son to the Spirit. In the book of Revelation, the age is the age of the Spirit, and in this age the Spirit has been intensified. Because the Spirit in 1 colon 4 is the intensified Spirit of God, He is called the seven spirits. The seven spirits are undoubtedly the Spirit of God because they are ranked among the triune God in verses 4 and 5. We cannot understand the Bible according to our natural, limited mentality. According to our concept, the word seven spirits denote seven individual spirits. But this is not the meaning. The number seven here does not refer to seven different spirits but to one sevenfold spirit. Seven is the number of completion in God's dispensational move while 12 is the number of completion in God's eternal administration. For example, God created the earth in six days plus one Sabbath day. Furthermore, there are seven dispensations in the Bible. For God's move today, the church has the number seven. In the book of Revelation the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls are all for God's dispensational move. Thus, the sevenfold spirit is the intensified spirit in God's move today. He is the seven spirits of God for God's move. As seven is the number for completion in God's operation, so the seven spirits are for God's move on the earth. In substance and existence, God's spirit is one. In the intensified function and work of God's operation, God's spirit is sevenfold. It is like the lampstand in Zechariah 4,2. In existence it is one lampstand, but in function it is seven lamps. At the time the book of Revelation was written, the church had become degraded and the age had become dark. Therefore, the sevenfold intensified spirit of God was needed for God's move and work on the earth. We all are familiar with three-way bulbs, light bulbs that can be switched to three successive degrees of illumination. When we do not need very much light, we switch the bulb to the first degree, but when we need more illumination, we switch it to the second or third degree. In like manner, the seven lamps on the lampstand were the sevenfold, intensified light. In the four Gospels, the Spirit of God was onefold because at that time there was not the need for so much light. However, after the church had been degraded and the age had become exceedingly dark, there was the need for the Holy Spirit to be intensified sevenfold. In this way the one Spirit of God has become the sevenfold Spirit. In existence, the Holy Spirit, like the lampstand in Zechariah, is one, but in function the Holy Spirit is seven. b. The seven eyes of the Lamb The seven spirits of God are the seven eyes of the Lamb, 5 colon 6, Zech 3 colon 9, 4 10. Our eyes are for our moving. If we are blind, it is very difficult to move. In God's move today, Christ as the Lamb of God has seven eyes. The seven eyes of the Lamb are also for watching, observing, and transfusing. When I look at someone, something of me is transfused into him. We often talk about loving one another, but how can you realize that someone loves you? Love is transfused through the eyes. If you look at me in a loving way, your eyes will transfuse your love into me. When Christ looks at us with his seven eyes, we may be terrified at first. Eventually, however, these seven eyes will transfuse Christ's element into us. 
The Holy Spirit today is the seven eyes of Christ. Many Christians argue that the Holy Spirit of God is separate from Christ, but the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is the eyes of Christ. Do you think of your eyes as being separate from you? It is ridiculous to say this. When I look at your eyes, I look at you, and when you look at me with your eyes, you look at me. The eyes of a person express that person. To say that the Holy Spirit is separate from Christ does not correspond with the pure revelation of the Holy Word. How can we say that a person's eyes are separate from the person himself? There is no room to argue about this. We have seen that the Bible says that the Spirit of God today is the eyes of Christ. This simply means that the Spirit is Christ. My eyes are me. When I look at you, my eyes look at you. If I had no eyes, I could never look at you. Hence, the Spirit, the eyes of Christ, is not separate from Christ. He is the eyes of Christ looking at us. Our experience proves this. Day by day, we sense that someone is looking at us. This someone is the Spirit, who is Christ himself. If the Spirit were not Christ, we would sense that too, the Spirit and Christ, were looking at us. To say that the Spirit is separate from Christ is to pluck out the eyes of Christ and to separate them from him. It is not scriptural to say that the Spirit is separate from Christ and that Christ is not the Spirit. Just as we and our eyes are one, so Christ and the Spirit are one. Our Christ is not a blind Christ. He is the Christ with the seven eyes. Often, he transfuses his element into us. At other times, he observes us like a flashlight, saying, What are you doing? Are you fighting with your husband? Stop! Have you not had this kind of experience? Day by day we experience this watching, observing, and transfusing Christ. This watching, observing, and transfusing take place through his eyes. His eyes are the spirit, and the spirit is simply himself. If you do not believe it, you will miss the blessing. See. The seven lamps of fire before the throne of God The seven eyes are also the seven lamps of fire before the throne of God. 4 colon 5, Zech 4 colon 2. This is difficult to understand. Christ carries out God's administration by the shining of the seven lamps of fire. This is true in the churches today. When Christ looks at and through us, he shines upon us and executes God's administration. Many times as the elders in the churches are discussing matters with one another, they have the sense that the seven lamps of fire are shining upon them. This is Christ's carrying out of God's administration through the shining of the seven lamps of fire. D. Sent forth into all the earth The seven spirits of God have been sent forth into all the earth. 5 colon 6. Wherever we go, the seven eyes will follow us. In fact, they will go before us and be waiting for us at our destination. Many dear saints who are unhappy with the church in a certain locality have moved to another locality thinking that it would be much better for them in another place. But when they arrived at their new locality, they found that the Spirit was waiting for them. Some of us have gone places where we should not have gone, and when we arrived there, we were greeted by the Spirit, who said, Go back. Don't stay here. Today the Spirit has been sent forth into all the earth. He now pervades every corner of the earth. This is the wonderful Spirit of the Triune God. 4. The Son after studying the book of Revelation again and again, I have discovered that it contains 26 items of what the Son is. Since there are 26 letters in the alphabet, we may say that Christ is every letter from A to Z. He is useful for composing any word. Do you want to compose the word light? He is L, I, G, H, and T. Would you like to compose the word love? He is L, O, V, and E. With Christ we can compose any positive thing. After we have the words, we have sentences, paragraphs, and chapters, and once we have the chapters, we have the whole Bible. The entire Bible is composed with Christ. Let us now briefly consider each of the 26 aspects of Christ found in Revelation. A. Jesus Christ the Son is Jesus Christ. Jesus is Jehovah the Savior and Christ is the one anointed of God to carry out God's economy. b. 
The faithful witness the Son is the faithful witness, 1 colon 5, 3 14. He is God's witness. Although he is God, he is also the witness of God. Without him, we cannot know, see, or gain God. God is testified by him. See. The firstborn of the dead the Son is the firstborn of the dead, 1 colon 5. In the universe, God has two creations, the creation by his first work and the creation by his second work. We all know God's first creation, but not many of us are familiar with his second creation. God's second work is resurrection. Firstly, God created all existing things. Secondly, he resurrected some of these existing things and brought them into another sphere, another realm, which is the realm of resurrection. Are we in God's first creation or in his second creation? While our body remains in God's first creation, our spirit is in his second creation. Our spirit has been regenerated. This means that it has been recreated. Hence, it belongs to God's second creation. In both of God's creations, Christ is the first. Colossians 1.15 says that Christ is the firstborn of all creation, and in Revelation 1.5 we are told that he is the firstborn of the dead. He was the first to be resurrected from the dead, and we shall follow him. Here the phrase the firstborn of the dead indicates the creation of God in resurrection. This signifies a new beginning. In God's first creation there was a beginning, and in God's second creation in resurrection there was another beginning. When we were regenerated, we experienced a new beginning in God's second creation. D. The ruler of the kings of the earth the Son is the ruler of the kings of the earth, 1 colon 5. Although the communists are against Christ, they use his calendar without realizing that they are doing so. According to history, the one whose calendar you use is the one to whom you are in subjection. If any used the calendar of a certain king, he would have to be under the rule of that king. In like manner, the communists are under Jesus Christ because they use his calendar. They call it the international calendar, but actually it is the calendar of Christ. In this way they unconsciously admit that he is their ruler. In the universe, there is one unique ruler. All mankind today uses the calendar of Christ and is under his rule. All the people on earth are his people, and he is the ruler of all nations. Jesus might say to the communists, You are opposing me, but I will cause you to be my people. I will cause you to use my calendar, and you will have no choice about being under my rule. I am the unique ruler of the earth. E. The Son of God The Son is the Son of God, 218. As the Son of God, He is God Himself. He is the true God with divinity. F. The Son of Man The Son is also the Son of Man, 113. As the Son of Man, He is a genuine man with humanity. He is both the very God and the proper man. G, H, and I. The first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega the Son is the first and the last, 117, 2 colon 8. 2213, the beginning and the end, 2213, and the Alpha and the Omega, 2213. When I was young, I was bothered by these terms, thinking that they were repetitious and that the beginning, the first, and the Alpha were the same and that the end, the last, and the Omega were the same. But this is not a matter of repetition, but of different aspects. Being the first does not necessarily mean that you are the beginning. Being the first simply means that you are the first and that prior to you there was nothing. However, to be the beginning does not only mean that you are the first, but also that you have begun something. What then is the difference between the Alpha and the beginning? A certain thing may be the beginning, but it may have neither the content nor the continuation. To be the Alpha and the Omega means that you are the complete content and continuation. For Christ to be the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, indicates that he is also every other letter in the alphabet. The first and the last simply indicate the first and the last without indicating either the beginning or the ending. In order to be the beginning and the ending, you must take a certain action. Christ is not only the first but also the beginning, the beginning of God's economy and God's operation. God's operation began and will end with Christ. 
This Christ is also the content and continuation of God's operation, because he is not only the beginning and the ending but also the Alpha and the Omega. In other words, the Son, Jesus Christ, is everything. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the ending of God's operation, and the content and continuation of whatever God is doing. Because the Greek letters from Alpha to Omega comprise all the letters of the Greek alphabet, we may say that Christ is every letter for us to compose words, sentences, paragraphs, chapters, and books. Hallelujah! He is everything. J. The Living One the Son, the All-Inclusive One, is the Living One, 118. He died, became alive, and lives forever. K. The Holy One this Living One is the Holy One, 3 7, the One who has God's holy nature that sanctifies. L. The True One Christ is also the True One, 3 7, the One who is genuine and real in every way. M. The faithful one in 1911 we see that Christ is the faithful one, the one who is worthy of our trust. N. The Amen the Son is also the Amen, 314. The title Amen has various meanings, reality, yes, let it be. His being the Amen means more than we can say. Thirteen years ago, I was invited to a meeting in Tyler, Texas. In that meeting I was somewhat cautious, not daring to say, Amen, loudly. At the end of some of the prayers, I quietly said, Amen. After a while, someone came to me, saying, Brother Lee, you probably don't know the custom in this country. In this type of service, you must be silent. Deep within my heart, I said, the most silent place is the cemetery. You people are trying to make your church service a cemetery. What is wrong with our saying, Amen. It is equal to calling on the name of the Lord. When we say, Amen, we mean, O Lord Jesus. Let us all learn to say, Amen. Oh. The origination of the creation of God In 314 we are told that the Son is the origination of the creation of God. This is an important concept. The translators have been troubled by this verse. Some have said that Christ is the originator, not the origination. However, the meaning here is not originator but origination. Christ is the origination of God's action to create the universe. P and Q. The root and the offspring of David the son is the root and the offspring of David, 5 colon 5, 22 16. This means that he is both the root and the branch of David. Once again, we see that he is everything. As the root, he is the first, the beginning, and the alpha and as the branch, he is the last, the end, and the omega. R and S. The Lion of the tribe of Judah and the Lamb as we have pointed out in a previous message, Christ, the Son, is the Lion of the tribe of Judah, 5 colon 5, and the Lamb, 5 colon 6, 21 23, 22 colon 1. He is the Lion Lamb. To the enemy, he is the Lion. To us, the redeemed ones, he is the dear, precious lamb. T and you. King of kings and lord of lords the son is the king of kings and the lord of lords, 1916. The king of kings refers to his authority, and the lord of lords refers to his headship. He is the authority and the head of the whole universe. V. The word of God the son is the word of God, 1913, the expression of God. Because Christ is the Word, He and the Bible are one. Do not read your Bible without reading Him, and do not contact the Bible without contacting Him. As we come to the Bible, we must realize that He Himself is the Word of God. W. The Morning Star In 2216 we see that the Sun is the Morning Star. In Malachi 4,2, He is revealed as the Sun, but here He is revealed as the Morning Star. His being the sun is mainly related to the people on earth, but his being the morning star is related to his watchful, waiting believers. To those who watch and wait for his coming back, the Lord will appear as the morning star. Although I desire to see him as the sun, I am now waiting to see him as the morning star. We all love him in his aspect of being the morning star, and he will appear to us in this way. X. 
The lamp in 2123 Christ is revealed as the lamp who contains God as the light. The light is the very essence of the lamp, and the lamp radiates the light. God is the essence of Christ, and Christ radiates God. Why? The husband in 21:2 we see that the new Jerusalem is the wife of Christ. This implies that Christ is the husband who takes God's redeemed people as his wife. Z. The another angel finally, Christ is another angel, 7, 2, 8,3, 10,1. 18,1, .1, sent by God to carry out God's commission. In the Old Testament, Christ appeared as the angel of the Lord several times. Exo 3 colon 2 dash 6, Judges 6 colon 11 dash 24, Zech 1 colon 11 dash 12, 2 colon 8 dash 11, 3 colon 1 dash 7, coming to take care of God's people for the fulfillment of God's plan. Now in this book he is again the angel sent by God to carry out God's purpose. If we put all 26 items together, we have a clear vision of what the Son is. The Father and the Spirit are one with the Son. Without the Son's being so many items, the Father could not be adequately expressed and the Spirit would not have so much to express. Life Study of Revelation Message 5 The Coming Again of Christ Most Christians hold the concept that the Book of Revelation is a book of Christ's Second Coming. It is absolutely correct to hold this concept because Revelation does cover the Second Coming of Christ. However, throughout the years, Christians have not been clear about the Lord's Second Coming. Due to this lack of clarity, there has been much disputing and wrangling about it. The revelation regarding Christ's second coming is not simple. Rather, it is quite complicated and has several aspects. Therefore, it has been difficult for most Christians to understand thoroughly the Lord's coming again. During the past century and a half, many books have been written, especially by the brethren, about the second coming of Christ. Some of the leading teachers among the brethren held different opinions about the Lord's coming back, and the first division between them was the result of these different opinions. The so-called brethren testimony was raised up in 1828 or 29 under the leadership of John Nelson Darby. Darby taught that Christ would come back before the Great Tribulation, while Benjamin Newton, another leading teacher, said that Christ would come back after the Tribulation. Because these two great teachers held different opinions, there were many debates about this matter. Eventually, this brought about the first division among the so-called brethren between those under the leadership of Darby and those under the leadership of Newton. I was associated with the Benjamin Newton group for seven and a half years during which time I learned all their teachings. They certainly had a strong ground for saying that the second coming of Christ would be after the Great Tribulation. If you read the best writings of all the great teachers during the past 150 years, you will find that some taught that Christ's coming would be before the tribulation and others taught that it would follow the tribulation. During the past century, the Lord raised up some careful students of the Word, such as G.H. Pember, Robert Govett, and D.M. Panton. These men discovered that Christ's second coming is not a simple matter. They saw that, on the one hand, Christ will come back after the tribulation, but that, on the other hand, he will also come back before the tribulation. These careful students of the Bible have supplied strong proof to substantiate the correctness of this view. Christ's coming back has at least two aspects one before the tribulation and the other after the tribulation. Furthermore, these students of the Word also learned that the rapture of the saints will be of more than two categories. This means that some saints will be raptured before the tribulation and others after the tribulation. Do not react to such statements too hastily. I reacted that way when I was young, but eventually I was subdued and convinced. The Bible is not as simple as some think it is. In this message, we shall consider the subject of Christ's coming again. We thank God for all the teachers of the Word who have gone before us. We are grateful to them, and whatever we see, we see as those who are standing upon their shoulders. If we would understand the second coming of Christ, we must study the Bible and also read the books written by these great teachers. Then we shall be able to have a comprehensive view of the matter. If we do this, we shall be fully convinced that Christ's coming has two aspects, the secret, private aspect and the open, 
public aspect. I. The secret aspect A. Coming as a thief in both Matthew and Revelation we see the secret aspect of Christ's coming again. Revelation 3:3 3, and 1615 both tell us that Christ will come as a thief and that we should be watchful. No thief comes openly or announces his coming. As we pointed out in a previous message, when the Lord comes as a thief, he will come to steal the precious things. In Matthew 24:40 40 and 41, the Lord spoke of his secret coming, saying, Then shall two men be in the field. One is taken, and one is left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. One is taken, and one is left. The Lord Jesus was very wise, using two brothers in the field and two sisters grinding at the mill as illustrations. Apparently the two brothers are the same and the two sisters are the same. But suddenly one of the brothers and one of the sisters are taken. After giving this illustration, the Lord said, Watch therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord comes. But know this, that if the householder knew in what watch the thief was coming, he would have watched and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also, be ready, for the Son of Man comes in an hour that you think not. Verses 42-44 As we are working, having no consciousness that Christ is coming, some of us will be raptured. Since he is coming as a thief, we must be watchful. B. The time unknown the time of the Lord's secret coming is unknown. 3 colon 3, Matt. 24 36, 42, 25 colon 13. When Christ comes again, he will come as a sent one. Because of this, in Revelation he is called the angel, one who is sent by God. In his second coming, as in his first, Christ will come as one who has been sent by God. This is the reason that only the Father knows the time of Christ's secret coming, Matt 24 36. Mark 13 32. The Father is the sender and the Son is the sent one. Only the sender, not even the sent one, knows the time. Some people, seeming to know more than the Lord Jesus, have predicted the time of the Lord's coming. During the past century and a half, there have been many predictions, none of which has been fulfilled. Some predicted that the Lord Jesus would come on a certain date and charged people to prepare themselves by taking a bath and by putting on clean, white clothing. Others have climbed to a mountaintop to await the Lord's coming back. After World War I, many teachers published books about prophecy, especially concerning the Lord's coming back. Some of these writers also predicted the time of the Lord's coming. All these predictions about the time of the Lord's coming have been proved false. Be careful not to predict anything. According to the Bible, the time of the Lord's secret coming is unknown. See. The place in the cloud to the air the place of the Lord's secret coming will be in the cloud to the air, 10 colon 1, 1 Thess 4 17. The cloud is related to the Lord's coming back. Christ went to heaven on a cloud, and he will come back to earth in the same way. Acts 1 colon 9, 11, Matt 26 colon 64, Revelation 14 14. In Matthew 26 colon 64, the Lord Jesus said to the high priest, Henceforth you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Even with the Lord's coming in the cloud there are two aspects. Firstly, the Lord will come in the cloud. This means that he will be concealed by the cloud. Secondly, he will come upon the cloud. When he comes in the cloud, he will not come to the earth but to the air. Revelation 10:1 reveals that the Lord will come down out of heaven clothed with a cloud, indicating that he will be wrapped up with the cloud. Do not think that he will suddenly descend from the heavens to the earth. Christ is now on the throne in the third heaven. When the proper time comes, the Father will send him from the throne in the heavens to the cloud in the air. As we shall see in later messages, before he leaves the throne in the heavens, some overcomers will have been raptured to the throne. Revelation 12 shows that the man-child will be raptured, not to the air but to the throne of God. This indicates that some overcomers will have been raptured even before the time of the secret coming of the Lord Jesus. In Revelation 14 we see the first fruits on Mount Zion in the heavens. 
Mount Zion in the heavens is where God is in the third heaven. It is not in the air. That the first fruits will be on Mount Zion in the heavens proves that some of the early overcomers will be raptured to the third heaven before Christ's secret coming. After these early overcomers have been raptured, Christ will descend from the throne to the air in the cloud secretly. While he is in the air, the Lord Jesus will do many things. Mainly, he will take up all the believers who have not yet been raptured. After Christ comes to the air in the cloud, many saints will still not have been raptured. Thus, while he is in the air, he will rapture the Christians who have had to pass through the Great Tribulation. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 says that they who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Then, in the air, Christ will set up his judgment seat. This judgment will not be for sinners but for all the saved ones, and it will not be concerned with salvation or perdition but with reward or punishment. After this judgment has been executed, some of the saints will be chosen to receive a positive reward. According to the Bible, God has had two selections concerning us. Firstly, he selected us before the foundation of the world in eternity past, F1 colon 4. Secondly, after the Lord comes to the air and has raptured all the saints to the air, he will make a second selection. While the first selection in eternity past was for salvation, the second selection in the air at the judgment seat of Christ will be for reward. We all have been selected for salvation, but whether or not we receive a reward will depend upon the second selection at Christ's judgment seat. Those saved ones who do not pass this judgment will be put somewhere to suffer discipline. Christ will then bring the positive ones with him to the earth as his army. At that time, he will no longer be in the cloud but upon the cloud. Thus, there will be at least two steps to the Lord's coming. In the first step, Christ will leave the throne in the heavens, come down to the air wrapped in the cloud, and remain there for a time. Then, from the air, he will take the second step of coming to the earth upon the cloud. This will be the second aspect of his coming back. D. As a reward to the watching believers Christ's secret coming will be a reward to the watching believers, 228, Matt. 24 colon 42, 44. Revelation 2.28 says that Christ will appear as the morning star, and Malachi 4 colon 2 reveals that he will appear as the sun. There is a great difference between the appearing of the morning star and the appearing of the sun. If you would see the morning star, you must rise up very early in the morning. If you sleep late, you will miss it. However, no matter how late you sleep, you will not miss the sunshine. Do you expect to meet Christ as the morning star or as the sun? The appearing of the morning star is secret, but the appearing of the sun is open. The Lord promised us that if we are watchful and wait for his coming, he will appear to us as the morning star. This is a promise of a reward. But if we are sloppy, we shall surely miss the morning star. Do not think that Christ's coming back is a simple matter of his leaving the throne and coming immediately and directly to earth. He will be in the air for some time. The early overcomers will be raptured before the sixth seal which will be a preface, a warning, of the coming great tribulation that will last for three and a half years. No one can tell when Christ will leave his throne in the heavens and come down to the air. However, it should be somewhat before the great tribulation. There will be an interval between Christ's descending to the air and his descending to the earth. During this interval, he will complete the rapture of the saints and exercise his judgment upon all the saints to select the overcomers who are to be his army to fight against the army of the Antichrist. 2. The Open Aspect A. Seen by all the tribes of the land as we have seen, in the secret aspect of his coming again, Christ will come as a thief. But in the open aspect, he will come with power and great glory to be seen by all the tribes of the land. 1 7, Matt. 24 colon 27, 30. Revelation 1 colon 7 says, Behold, he comes with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, those also who pierced him, and all the tribes of the land shall wail over him. Yes, Amen. The Lord will appear as lightning which flashes across the sky from east to west. What a difference between this and his secret coming as a thief. Revelation 1 7 mentions all the tribes of the land. 
the Greek word rendered land in this verse may also be translated earth. This has bothered the translators of this verse, for they have been uncertain whether to translate it as land or earth. Some versions say earth and others say land. After much study, I have concluded that in this verse the Greek word should be rendered land. In other verses it may be translated earth, but here it should be the land, referring to the holy land. All the tribes of the holy land shall see him. The basis for saying this is Zechariah 12:10-14, which says that they shall look upon him whom they have pierced and that the land shall mourn for him. The tribes mentioned in 1:7 are the tribes of those who have pierced him. Revelation 1:7 surely is a reference to Zechariah 12. According to the context of Zechariah 12, the tribes are not all the nations of the earth but the 12 tribes in the holy land. Based upon this, we may say that the tribes in 1 colon 7 are the 12 tribes in the Holy Land. When the Lord appears as lightning, coming with power and glory to be seen by all in the Holy Land, the 12 tribes will behold him and will weep. b. The time at the end of the Great Tribulation while the day and hour of Christ's coming in its secret aspect are unknown, Matt. 2436, the time of his coming in the second aspect is clearly revealed. It is at the last trumpet, the seventh trumpet, at the end of the Great Tribulation, 18 colon 1, Matt. 24 colon 15, 21, 27, 1 Thess 4 16, 1 Cor 15 52, 2 Thess. 2 colon 1 dash 4, 8. Matthew 24 colon 15 says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. The abomination of desolation is an idol, the image of the Antichrist. According to Daniel 9.27, the Antichrist will make a covenant with the nation of Israel for seven years. In the middle of these seven years, he will break this covenant and begin to persecute the Jews. The Antichrist will be absolutely against God and will set himself up as God, putting an image of himself in the temple and compelling people to worship it. In the eyes of God, this will be the abomination that will cause great destruction. This will take place in the midst of the last of the 70 weeks mentioned in Daniel 9. In Daniel 9, a week denotes seven years. In Matthew 24,15 the Lord Jesus indicates that the Jewish believers will see this. As Matthew 24,21 reveals, this will mark the beginning of the Great Tribulation, for then there shall be Great Tribulation such as has not occurred from the beginning of the world until now, nor ever shall be. Hence, the Great Tribulation will begin at the time the Antichrist erects his image in the temple and forces people to worship it. By these verses we can see that the Lord's open coming will not precede the Great Tribulation. It must occur sometime after the beginning of the Great Tribulation. According to the verses in Revelation, it will be very close to the end of the Great Tribulation. According to the New Testament, the Lord Jesus will leave his throne in the heavens and descend to the air before the Great Tribulation. From there, close to the end of the Great Tribulation, he will come down openly to the earth. When Christ comes openly from the air to the earth, it will be at a time when the Antichrist will be attempting to exterminate the whole nation of Israel. For this purpose, the Antichrist will gather his army to a place called Armageddon, 1616. This will be according to God's purpose, for God's plan is to assemble all the earthly armies together at Armageddon and there destroy them and rid the earth of them. The intention of the Antichrist will be to use his army to exterminate the nation of Israel. Israel will be surrounded by his army and have no way of escape. At that juncture, when escape is impossible, the Lord will appear as a flash of lightning and set his feet upon the Mount of Olives, Zech 14 colon 4. Before this time, the nation of Israel will not believe in the Lord Jesus, but the threat of the army of the Antichrist will force them to repent. When the Lord Jesus puts his feet upon the Mount of Olives, it will split in half. This will provide a way of escape for the persecuted Jews who will then repent, weep, and confess what they have done in crucifying the Lord. If we put all the verses together, we can see that the Lord's open coming will probably be near the end of the Great Tribulation. As long as the temple in Jerusalem has not been rebuilt, it is impossible for the Lord Jesus to come back openly. 
Although we have some idea about the time of his open coming, we do not know the time of his secret coming. The Bible says that no one knows this. However, the New Testament reveals clearly that Christ's open coming will not precede the Great Tribulation, that is, it will not precede the time when the Antichrist will force people to worship his image. But we are not waiting for the Lord's open coming. We are waiting for his secret coming. The Lord is very wise in this matter, knowing that it will cause us to be watchful. See. The place on the cloud to the earth the place of the open aspect of the Lord's coming back is clearly revealed on the cloud to the earth, 1 colon 7, 14 14, Matt 24 colon 30, Zec 14 colon 4, Acts 1 colon 11 dash 12. According to Acts 1 11 and 12, the Lord shall come in the same way as he went up into heaven. Since he ascended from the Mount of Olives, this means that he will come back to the Mount of Olives. Zechariah 14:4 4 says, His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. As this verse makes clear, the Mount of Olives is outside the wall of Jerusalem, not far from the city. The Lord will descend to the very spot from which he ascended. However, we are not waiting to see him on the Mount of Olives. We want to meet him at the throne in the third heaven and then come back with him to the Mount of Olives. He has ascended to the heavens, and we are waiting to be raptured to the heavens. We are not waiting to die and go to heaven. This is religious. We are waiting for our whole being to be raptured to the third heaven, to the throne of God, that we may come back with Christ, firstly to the air and then to the earth. This is the way we shall visit Jerusalem. We shall go there by way of the throne in the third heaven. However, if you are defeated, you will miss this visit to Jerusalem. D. With the overcoming saints to fight against the Antichrist and his army at Armageddon when the Lord Jesus comes openly, he will come with the overcoming saints to fight against the Antichrist and his army at Armageddon, 19 11-21, 17-13-14. 16 colon 12 dash 16, Zech 14 colon 3, 5, 2 Thess 2 colon 8. This will be to tread the winepress of the wrath of God, 1915. 14 colon 18 dash 20. At Armageddon, all the worldly armies will be gathered together, with some coming from the Far East, others from the North, and still others from Europe. This gathering together of all the earthly forces will be according to God's wisdom. Eventually, the riches of the world will be concentrated in the Middle East, and all the nations will be greedy to seize them. While the armies of the earth will be gathering at Armageddon, the Lord will be sitting in the air observing them, saying, Are you ready? When we come to chapter 14, we shall see that the gathering of the armies will be the gathering of the grapes into the great winepress. In the eyes of God, the earthly armies are likened to grapes, and Armageddon will be the great winepress. As the kings, generals, and leaders gather all the armies at Armageddon, they will be like grapes gathered into the great winepress. Then the Lord will descend to tread this winepress of God, and a great river of blood will flow out of it. What a huge number of evil people will be killed there at that time. This will occur at the time of the Lord's open coming to the earth. The purpose of the Lord's open coming will be to exterminate all the worldly forces. After this, war will cease from the earth. 3. A warning and a loving response in 22 12 and 20 the Lord Jesus gives us a warning, saying, Behold, I come quickly. Our loving response should be, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, 22 20, 2 Tim 4 8. Our concern in these messages is not with mere teaching and doctrine concerning the so-called Second Advent. We are studying the heart's desire of the Lord which is to gain a group of overcomers who are watching and waiting for his coming back. Life study of Revelation Message 6 Joint partaker in the tribulation, kingdom and endurance in Jesus In this message we need to consider 1 colon 9, which says, I John, your brother and joint partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and endurance in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. The book of Revelation is composed in a marvelous way. 
It is quite significant that this verse comes shortly after the mention of the Lord's coming in 1 colon 7. This indicates that if we would be those who are watchfully waiting for the Lord's coming back, we must be those who are joint partakers, not in outward blessing, but in the tribulation, kingdom, and endurance in Jesus. I. Joint partaker in the tribulation in Jesus The phrase in Jesus governs the words tribulation, kingdom, and endurance, and we must pay close attention to it. This phrase very rarely occurs in the New Testament. The phrase in Christ or in Christ Jesus, on the contrary, is used many times. In the New Testament, the truth is mainly in Christ, but here the phrase in Jesus is employed. This tells us that if we would be those who are waiting for the Lord's coming back, we must be those who are joint partakers in the tribulation, kingdom, and endurance in Jesus. When we talk about salvation, grace, enjoyment, and all the other good things, we say that we are in Christ, for this phrase refers to everything on the positive side of God's salvation. But to say that we are partakers of the tribulation, kingdom, and endurance in Jesus means that we are suffering. When Jesus lived on earth as a man, he suffered constantly. According to the facts of his life, his name, Jesus, denotes a suffering person, a man of sorrows, ISA 53,3. Hence, when we say that we are in Christ, this means that we are saved, are enjoying God's grace, have peace with God, and are under God's blessing. But when we say that we are joint partakers of the tribulation, kingdom, and endurance in Jesus, this means that we are suffering and are being persecuted as we follow Jesus the Nazarene. In the book of Revelation, the in Christ is not used. In Ephesians, on the contrary, the term in Christ or in him is used repeatedly, being found in every chapter of that epistle. The book of Revelation is for those who are suffering tribulation in Jesus. This means that those who are waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus must be people who suffer tribulation in Jesus. In other words, those who wait for the Lord's coming back are the suffering ones. In the eyes of God, we are the followers of Christ, but in the eyes of people, especially religion, we are the followers of Jesus. A. Jesus having suffered persecution while he was on earth while Jesus was on earth, he was persecuted by the Jewish religion, John 5:16, 1520. He was not persecuted by a heathen, pagan religion but by the typical religion formed according to God's oracles. Religion is greatly utilized by God's enemy. Religion is versus Christ, and Christ is versus religion. John 5.16 reveals that the Jews persecuted Jesus because he broke their Sabbath. Religious people cannot tolerate the breaking of their regulations. Any violation of their religious regulations will stir up persecution against the violators. The Jewish religion was established on three pillars, one of which was the Sabbath. The other two are circumcision and dietary regulations. When Jesus broke the Sabbath, he tore down one of the three pillars of the Jewish religion. Hence, they persecuted him and even sought to kill him. Eventually, religion succeeded and actually killed the Lord Jesus, sentencing him to death according to their scriptures. However, under the sovereignty of God, the Jews at that time did not have the right to kill anyone. Thus, they delivered Jesus over to the Roman government and the Roman government, using its method of executing criminals, crucified the Lord Jesus on the cross. Just as religion persecuted Jesus, it will also persecute the followers of Jesus. We know from the book of Acts that the Jews in the synagogues in every city stirred up opposition against the apostles, and Paul suffered this type of persecution very much. John, the writer of the book of Revelation, also underwent this kind of persecution. When John received the revelation of this book, he was on the island of Patmos, having been exiled there for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. In writing the book, he was encouraging the saints to wait for the Lord's coming back, telling them that he was their brother and joint partaker, not in grace, life, peace, and light, but in the suffering, the affliction, in Jesus. As we have seen, when Jesus was on earth, he suffered at the hands of religion. The Roman Empire paid very little attention to him. It was the Jewish religion that asked the Roman government to execute judgment upon him. Thus, 
the persecution against him did not originate with the secular world but with the religious world. In the book of Acts we see that it was the same with the apostles. The opposition did not come mainly from the Gentiles but from the Jewish religion. The Jews followed Paul wherever he went, perhaps even picketing him. In like manner, a great many martyrs suffered persecution by the so-called Roman Catholic Church. As Fox points out in his History of Martyrs, the Roman Catholic Church killed more saints than the Roman Empire did. Who imprisoned Madame Guyon? The Roman Catholic Church. Who imprisoned John Bunyan? The Church of England. Religion always persecutes the genuine followers of Jesus. Now it is our turn to undergo this persecution. During the years I was with Brother Ney in China, I saw how much he was persecuted by religion. The rumors, opposition, and condemnation came, not from the Gentiles, but from Christianity, even from some missionaries. The devil is subtle. The secular world does not oppose us as much as the so-called religious people do. Many Christians think of religion as a good thing, but actually it is something used by the devil. If you read the book of Galatians, you will see how intensely Paul persecuted the church when he was in the Jewish religion. Galatians 1 reveals that religion is against Christ and that Christ is versus religion. If we cooperate with religion, there will be a type of compromising peace. But how can we go along with religion? It is so subtle and false. It is a counterfeit of God's economy. Anyone who sees that religion is a counterfeit of God's economy will condemn it. B. Jesus now suffering persecution with his followers because we do not cooperate with religion, it persecutes us. The persecution that we are suffering today is the persecution in Jesus. He is now suffering persecution with his followers, Acts 9,4-5. As we are suffering today, he is suffering in and with us. When Saul of Tarsus was traveling to Damascus with the intention of arresting all those who called on the name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus knocked him down to the earth, saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? V4. When Saul said, Who are you, Lord? Jesus answered, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, V5. Saul never thought that he was persecuting Jesus. He thought Jesus was in the grave and that he was persecuting Stephen and other followers of Jesus. But according to the Lord Jesus, Saul was persecuting him, because, at that time, he was in Stephen, Peter, John, and all his other members and was one with them. The same is true today. When the religious people persecute us, they are actually persecuting Jesus because Jesus is in us and is one with us. We may be comforted to realize that the suffering we are experiencing is the persecution in Jesus. We are joint partakers of tribulation in Jesus. C. His followers also persecuted in this age, bearing his reproach The followers of Jesus are also persecuted in this age, bearing his reproach. 2.10 John 16.2, 33 Acts 14.22, Hebrew 13.13 13. Hebrews 13.13 13 says, Let us therefore go forth unto him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. When the Lord Jesus was on earth, he suffered reproach from religion. Now, as his followers, we must bear his reproach, suffering reproach from religion. This is to be a joint partaker of tribulation in Jesus. Some sufferings, however, may not be caused by our following Jesus, but by our foolishness. This suffering cannot properly be called the suffering in Jesus. None of us should cause trouble by acting foolishly. But we must be honest and faithful to the Lord's testimony. If our honesty and faithfulness bring us suffering and persecution, that is the persecution in Jesus, and that is Jesus suffering with us. It is impossible to avoid the persecution of religion. We cannot escape it because the enemy is utilizing religion more than ever before. Nothing is more frustrating to God's economy than religion. Nothing blinds, covers, and veils people from seeing God's economy more than religion does. Millions have been blinded by it. Throughout the whole world, religion is blinding and veiling people's eyes from seeing God's economy. Because of this, a warfare is raging. In this warfare, 
we must sound our trumpet, saying, Get out of religion, tear away the religious veils from your eyes, and forsake your religious concepts. Whenever we do this, opposition is aroused. Some good friends have come to me advising me to compromise a little. But we will never compromise. Those who wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus must partake of his suffering. Do not simply say, Lord Jesus, I love you. Come quickly. If you say this, the Lord will reply, I want you to suffer for and with me. Do not try to avoid persecution. If we employ our cleverness to avoid persecution, then we are not good waiters of the coming of the Lord. If you mean business to wait for his coming back, the religious persecution will be stirred up against you. But we should not arouse persecution by acting foolishly. In this matter, we must be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Matt 10 16. 2. Joint partaker in the kingdom in Jesus If we are joint partakers in the tribulation in Jesus, then we are joint partakers in the kingdom. To partake of the persecution in Jesus is to partake of the kingdom. If you do not know what persecution is, then you do not know what the kingdom is. A. The kingdom being with Jesus when he was on earth Many Christians have a mistaken concept of the kingdom. Some say that the kingdom has already come, but that it has been rejected and suspended. Those who hold this concept say that the kingdom came, that it was rejected and suspended, and that it will come down in the future. According to this teaching, when the Lord Jesus comes back, he will bring this suspended kingdom with him. This is merely vain doctrine. The kingdom was with Jesus when he was on earth. The Lord Jesus said to the Pharisees, The kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, Look, here. Or, there. For behold, the kingdom of God is among you. Luke 17, 20 21. In this portion of the word, we see that the kingdom was wherever Jesus was. In Matthew 12 28, the Lord said, If I by the Spirit of God cast out demons, then the kingdom of God is come upon you. This means that the kingdom was with the Lord while he was on earth. b. His believers being born into the kingdom The believers of Jesus have been born into the kingdom. John 3 5 proves this. In this verse, Jesus said to Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. We were regenerated into the kingdom. How could we have entered into the kingdom by regeneration if the kingdom had been suspended? Into what, then, were we born again? As John 3 states clearly, we have been reborn into the kingdom. C. The church life today being the kingdom in Matthew 16 18 and 19 the Lord said to Peter, On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of the heavens. This shows that, in a proper sense, the church is the kingdom. Romans 14 17 also indicates that we in the church are in the kingdom. The proper church life is the kingdom life. What is the kingdom? It is the heavenly rule in the divine nature. We all have been regenerated with the divine life. In this life there is the divine nature, and with this divine nature there is a ruling, a reigning, a governing. This governing is both divine and heavenly. We, the regenerated ones, are under this reign today. We are under this government and control. We need to exercise this rule over ourselves. If you still need someone else to rule over you, it means that you are fallen. We must be under the heavenly rule in everything we do. In a previous message we spoke about being the fighting army of Christ. But if you are not under the ruling of the divine life, you will never be selected to be in his army. Being chosen to be in this army depends upon obeying the heavenly rule in the divine nature. The divine life brings us into the divine kingdom. The kingdom into which we are reborn in John 3 5 is the very kingdom mentioned by John in Revelation 1 9. How could we ever be joint partakers in the kingdom if we had not been reborn into it? After we have been reborn into the kingdom, we should remain in it. If you still argue with your wife or husband, it means that you are an escapee from the kingdom. If you remain in the kingdom and live in it, you will never fight with your husband, your wife, or anyone else. 
Although the enemy may tempt you to fight, the ruling of the heavenly kingdom will restrain you. D. His believers suffering persecution for the kingdom to be in the kingdom in Jesus today is not a glory. When the kingdom in Jesus becomes the kingdom in Christ, that will be the time for glory. Today, the kingdom in Jesus is a kingdom of suffering. In Matthew 5,10-12 the Lord said that his believers suffer persecution for the sake of the kingdom. If we are suffering for righteousness sake, then we are in the kingdom. There are certain things which we cannot do because they are unrighteous. All of humanity today is unrighteous. If we agree with this unrighteousness, people will welcome us. But if we stand for righteousness, people will oppose and persecute us. Suffering persecution for the kingdom proves that we are in the kingdom of God today. Do not think that it is a glory to be in the kingdom today. No, to be in the kingdom now is to bear shame and to suffer persecution. The more we are in the kingdom, the more we shall suffer and be persecuted. But praise the Lord this suffering is a strong sign that we are in the kingdom. Being in the kingdom today is a matter of being in the suffering in Jesus. Although we are joint partakers in the kingdom in Jesus, we are not yet the CO kings in Christ. When he comes back, we shall be his CO kings in the kingdom in Christ. At that time, we shall no longer suffer. Do not say to others, you must honor me. I am a partner in the heavenly kingdom, and one day I'll be a CO king with Christ in the kingdom. The more you say this, the more you will be persecuted. Today is not a reigning day but a suffering day. Now we are not in the reigning kingdom but in the suffering kingdom. This is the reason that Paul said that we must enter into the kingdom of God through much tribulation, Acts 14.22. The way to enter into the ruling kingdom is through suffering. The tribulation Paul referred to in Acts 14.22 was mainly the persecution at the hands of the Jewish religion. All believers in Christ undergo this kind of persecution. Paul seemed to be saying, you Christians, the believers of Jesus, must suffer persecution from the Jewish religion. In principle, it is the same today. If there were no religion in the world today, we would not suffer as much persecution. As we have already pointed out, most of the troubles, persecutions, rumors, and oppositions can be traced to one source religion. While we are suffering today, we are in the kingdom where we are being exercised, trained, prepared, and qualified to be Christ's army and to reign in his kingdom as his CO kings. 3. Joint partaker in the endurance in Jesus in 1 9, John also said that he was a joint partaker in the endurance in Jesus. For both the tribulation and the kingdom we need endurance. Many saints, even among us in the Lord's recovery, lack endurance. Some have suffered persecution from their relatives, friends, and neighbors, but eventually they exhausted their supply of endurance. While they were able to withstand the persecution for a certain time, they lacked the endurance to bear it for a longer time. When the Lord Jesus was on earth, he endured persecution, Hebrew. 12 colon 2-3, and he is still enduring men's opposition and reproach today. Consider how much, even today, people oppose and mock the Lord Jesus. On the one hand, he is sitting in the heavens. On the other hand, he is still being mocked, opposed, and persecuted. Many of us might expect the Lord Jesus to say to his mockers, Repent or I will send a great earthquake to destroy you. The Lord Jesus has been mocked for nearly 20 centuries, but he has not fought back. Rather, he has continuously suffered all these attacks. Some may say, Jesus, I hate you, but there is no response from him. This is the endurance of Jesus. Not many of us have heard of the endurance of Jesus. We have heard of the power of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the holiness of Jesus, the righteousness of Jesus, but not of the endurance of Jesus. Nevertheless, as we live in Christ, we not only partake of his life and holiness, but also of his endurance. When we abide in Christ, we partake of his endurance and have the endurance to bear suffering and opposition. The Lord's word is even called the word of endurance, 310. Today the whole world is opposing and rejecting him, but he does not fight back. He simply endures it all. Now as we have fellowship with him and abide in him, 
we partake of his endurance. As his followers, we must follow him on the same pathway with endurance. Hebrew 12 colon 1. In this way we also can endure persecution, rumors, rejection, and opposition. This is a strong proof that we are those who are waiting for the Lord's coming back. As we wait for his coming back by being a joint partaker in his tribulation, kingdom, and endurance, we are being disciplined, trained, prepared, and qualified to be his fighting army. Are you waiting for the Lord Jesus to come back? If you are, then you also must be a joint partaker in his tribulation, kingdom, and endurance. Life Study of Revelation Message 7 The local churches The book of Revelation is very well composed. Apparently, the various points included in chapter 1 are unrelated to each other. But if we approach them from the viewpoint of our experience, we shall see that they follow one another in a very good sequence. In the last two messages, we covered the matters of the coming again of the Lord Jesus and of our waiting for him by being joint partakers in his tribulation, kingdom, and endurance. In this message we now come to the local churches. It may seem that this message on the local churches is unrelated to the two foregoing messages. But, according to our experience, we know that these three messages are all interrelated. The coming again of the Lord Jesus requires that some partake of the tribulation, the kingdom, and the endurance in Jesus. The best way to do so is to be in the local churches. Outside of the church, it is difficult for anyone to participate in these three things. I. The progress of the divine revelation in the scripture We shall approach the local churches by the way of considering the progress of the divine revelation in the scripture. The divine revelation in the Bible begins with God and consummates with the local churches. The first two chapters of Genesis, along with the entire Old Testament, are a revelation of God himself, and the four Gospels are a revelation of Christ. This fact reveals the progress in the divine revelation from God to Christ. Following the four Gospels, we have the Acts and the Epistles, which mainly are a revelation of Christ as the Spirit. Hence, the revelation of the Spirit is the continuation of the divine revelation in the Bible. Following this, the Church is revealed. Thus, there are four main sections of the divine revelation in the Bible, the section of God, the section of Christ, the section of the Spirit, and the section of the Church. The Jews have only the first section of this revelation, for the 39 books of the Old Testament cover only the revelation concerning God. Most Christians have more than this, having the Old Testament plus the four Gospels. Although they have the whole Bible, in practicality they have little more than the Old Testament and the Gospels. They may know God as he is revealed in the Old Testament and they may know the stories in the Gospels about Christ, but they know nothing of either the Spirit of Life or the Church. In the concept of many Christians, the Church is a physical building. On Sunday morning, many parents say to their children, let's go to church. According to their concept, the Church is a bungalow, or a cathedral, with a high tower. They know hardly anything of the Church as revealed in the Holy Word. Thank God that during the past two centuries other Christians have progressed in their knowledge of the Bible, having not only the Old Testament and the Gospels but also the Epistles. These Christians know God, Christ, and the Spirit. Of course, they do not know much about the Spirit of life. They know the Spirit mainly as the Spirit of power for baptism. They know very little of the indwelling Spirit. Although these Christians may know a little concerning the Church, they only see the universal church, not the local churches. However, the first three chapters of Revelation are not concerned with the universal church. They are emphatically concerned with the local churches. Today, we in the Lord's recovery have the whole Bible, the Old Testament, the Gospels, the Acts, the Epistles, and the Revelation. I was with the Brethren Assembly for seven and a half years. During that time, we devoted considerable attention to the books of Daniel and Revelation. However, most of what I heard concerning Revelation was about the beasts and the ten horns. I had no impression that in the book of Revelation there were the local churches. I did not even hear much about the New Jerusalem. I was only told that it was a city in heaven with heavenly mansions, that its street was paved with gold, and that its doors were made of pearls. Praise the Lord that today our book of Revelation is not like this. In our book of Revelation, 
there are the local churches with the Son of Man in the midst, and there is the New Jerusalem with Christ as its centrality and universality. A. Concerning God let us now consider the progress of the divine revelation in the scriptures in more detail. Firstly, God reveals himself to us, General 1 colon 1. In Genesis 1 26 God is revealed as Elohim, a Hebrew word meaning the Mighty One. The English word God is the translation of the Hebrew word Elohim. Following this, in Genesis 2 colon 7 God is revealed as Jehovah, which means, I am that I am. God is the great I am, the ever-existing one. As the ever-existing one, he is the reality of every positive thing. This name, Jehovah, denotes God in his relationship with man. Concerning his creation, God is revealed as Elohim. Concerning his relationship with man, he is revealed as Jehovah. Jehovah is the Old Testament form of the name Jesus, and Jesus is the New Testament form of Jehovah. In other words, in the Old Testament Jesus was called Jehovah, and in the New Testament Jehovah is called Jesus. The entire Old Testament, which comprises 39 books, is mainly a revelation of the two divine titles, Elohim and Jehovah. B. Concerning Christ the second step in the progress of the divine revelation is the revelation concerning Christ, Matt 1 colon 1. At a certain time, God was incarnated as a man called Jesus Christ. Thus, following the Old Testament, we have the four Gospels which reveal a wonderful person named Jesus Christ. The name Jesus mainly means the Savior, Matt. 121, and the title Christ mainly means the Anointed One, Matt 1616. Jesus is not only our Savior but also God's Anointed One or, using today's term, God's Appointed One. God has appointed him to carry out his eternal economy. He is not only Jesus to save us, but also Christ to carry out God's eternal plan. In order for Christ to carry out God's eternal plan, he needs the church. And to produce the church there is the need of two things redemption and the imparting of life. After redeeming the fallen, created man, Christ had to impart life into the redeemed ones. For this, there is the need of the spirit of life the life-giving spirit. Therefore, following the four Gospels, we have redemption and the imparting of life in the Acts and the Epistles. In these books, the blood of Christ is frequently mentioned. Along with the blood, we have the Spirit. Blood is for redemption, and the Spirit is for the imparting of life. After being redeemed and regenerated, we become the living members of the body of Christ, the Church. As the Church, the body is the means by which Christ carries out God's eternal economy. By this we see that in God's economy the church is a very crucial matter. Without it, Christ cannot accomplish anything. If he would carry out God's eternal plan, he must have the church. C. Concerning the Spirit God is revealed as Elohim and as Jehovah, and Christ is revealed as Jesus and as Christ. The revelation concerning the Spirit, however, is not simple, Matt 28 colon 19. Rather, it is a mystery. Few Christians have ever fought for the revelation of God, and not many have fought for the revelation of Christ. But when we come to the matter of the Spirit, there is much argument because the revelation of the Spirit is a mystery. The Spirit is mysterious because it is related to life. There are many aspects of the revelation of the Spirit, the Spirit of Truth or Reality, John 14,16-17, The Spirit of Life, Rom. 8,2, The Spirit of Power, Luke 24,49, The Spirit of God, Rom. 8,9, The Spirit of Christ, Rom. 8,9, The Spirit of Jesus, Acts 16,7, The Spirit of Jesus Christ, Phil. 1,19, The Holy Spirit, Acts 5.32, and the seven spirits, Revelation 1.4, 4.5, 5.6. Do you know the difference between the spirit of life and the spirit of power? Those in the so-called Pentecostal or Charismatic movement talk about the spirit of power. Only the Lord knows whether or not they have the genuine power. I have heard much so-called speaking in tongues, but I have not seen power in the work of these tongue speakers. 
the baptism of the Holy Spirit empowers people. But so many of the supposed tongue speakers today are just as powerless as the non-tongue speakers. They may have the power to babble incoherently, but they do not have the power to save souls. Although some never have spoken such tongues, thousands of people have been saved through their preaching. That is real power. Not only is there no real power in the so-called charismatic movement, neither is there any life. After speaking in tongues, many will proceed to fight with their wives or to smoke cigarettes. Is this life? No. Life transforms people. We need both the spirit of power and the spirit of life. We are here for the testimony of Jesus. This testimony is not a term or a form. It is a life. How we need to open up ourselves to him that he may impart more life into us. If we truly have Christ as our life, we shall walk, live, and behave ourselves in Christ. Now we can understand why the epistles repeatedly speak about the Spirit. As we have seen, the book of Revelation speaks of the seven spirits of God. For the church life, there is the need of this intensified spirit. Out of this intensified spirit, the real church comes into being. While I do not oppose any genuine Pentecostal gifts, I can testify that in the past I have not seen one proper church built up by the so-called Pentecostal movement. Consider the Catholic charismatic movement today, it is saturated with the worship of Mary. If this movement is proper, how could it tolerate idol worship? That it tolerates idolatry proves that it is not proper. Dirt can be added to a snowball, but not to a diamond. The so-called charismatic movement is like a snowball to which unclean things can be added. Our eyes need to be opened to see that today God desires the real, living, and practical local churches. D. Concerning the church now we come to the last section of the divine revelation, the revelation concerning the church. It is difficult to know the church because Satan, the subtle enemy, is not willing for Christians to see what the real church is. 1. The universal church the church is the body of Christ, 1 cor. 12-12-13, is universally 1, f1-22-23. 4-4-6. Christ as the unique head has one unique body which is constituted with all his genuine believers. 2. The local church is the universal church as the body of Christ is expressed through the local churches. The local churches, as the expressions of the one body of Christ, Rev. 1 12, 20, are locally 1, Acts 8 colon 1, 13 colon 1, ROM 16 colon 1, 1 COR 1 colon 2. Revelation 1 colon 4 says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Asia was a province of the ancient Roman Empire in which were the seven cities mentioned in 111. The seven churches were in those seven cities respectively, not all in one city. This book does not deal with the one universal church but with the local churches in many cities. The church is firstly revealed as universal in Matthew 16:18 and then as local in Matthew 18:17. In Acts the church was practiced in the way of local churches, such as the church at Jerusalem, 8 colon 1, the church at Antioch, 13 colon 1, the church at Ephesus, 2017, and the churches in the provinces of Syria and Cilicia, 1541. Except for a few written to some individuals, all the epistles were written to the local churches. Not one was written to the universal church. Without the local churches there is no practicality and actuality of the universal church. The universal church is realized in the local churches. Knowing the church universally must be consummated in knowing the church locally. It is a great advance for us to know and practice the local churches. Concerning the church, the book of Revelation is in the advanced stage, for it is written to local churches. If we would know this book, we must advance from the understanding of the universal church to the realization and practice of the local churches. Only those who are in the local churches are rightly positioned with the right angle and the proper perspective to see the visions in this book. In 111 the voice said to John, What you see write in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamos, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. 
This verse is composed in a very important way. In this verse we see that the sending of this book to the seven churches equals the sending of it to the seven cities. This shows clearly that the practice of the church life in the early days was that of one church for one city, one city with one church. In no city was there more than one church. This is the local church, local city-wise, not street-wise, or area-wise. The jurisdiction of a local church should cover the whole city in which the church is. It should not be greater or lesser than the boundary of the city. All the believers within that boundary should constitute the one unique local church within that city. Hence, one church equals one city, and one city equals one church. This is what we call the local churches. Revelation 1 colon 4 speaks of the seven churches. Seven is the number for completion in God's operation, such as seven days for God's creation, Gen. 131-2 3, seven seals, 5 colon 5, 7 trumpets, 8 colon 2, and 7 bowls, 15 colon 7, for God's move on the earth. Hence, the 7 churches are for God's move in completion. The church needs to have its expression. If we talk about the church without having the expression of the church, our talk is entirely theoretical. It is not practical. For the church to be real and practical, there is the need of the local churches. If you do not have the local churches, you do not have the church. Likewise, if you do not have the members, you do not have the body. If you do not have the local church, you cannot have the universal church, for the universal church is composed of all the local churches just as the human body is composed of its many members. To have only the universal church is to be in a vanity fair. But we do have the local churches in practicality. If we are asked where the church is, we can point to the churches in Anaheim, San Francisco, Chicago, New York, and many other places. Some Christian friends have argued with me, saying, why do you say that you are the church and that we are not the church? Sometimes I have replied, if you say that you are the church, please show that you are the church. Show me where the church is. Some have responded by saying that they have sent out many missionaries. Deep within, they know that they are not the church. The fact is the fact. If you are the church, then why do you not call yourself the church? You know what you are. Do not pretend or presume to be what you are not. Since I am a man, I must designate myself as a man. What else can I do? In 1963 I was asked to speak at a certain place in Missouri. At the end of the meeting, the host stood up and, in a nice, humble, polite way, said, Brother Lee, please tell us why you call yourselves the church in Los Angeles. I replied, Brother, if we don't call ourselves the church, then what should we call ourselves? We simply are the church. This is not only the truth but also the fact. We are what we are. Although we might pretend or presume to be something else, that is not what we truly are. Before the Lord's recovery came to the United States, no Christians said that they were the church in Los Angeles. Therefore, when we came to Los Angeles, we had to call ourselves the church in Los Angeles. Revelation 1.20 says, The mystery of the seven stars which you have seen on my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are messengers of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are seven churches. When John saw the seven stars in the right hand of Christ and the seven golden lampstands in the midst of which was Christ, it was a mystery to him. He did not realize the significance of the seven heavenly stars and the seven golden lampstands. Hence, the Lord unveiled the mystery to him, saying that the seven stars are messengers of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are seven churches. The significance of this was not only a mystery to John, but also to believers today. All believers need the unveiling of this mystery to see the churches and their messengers. The churches, signified by the golden lampstands, are the testimony of Jesus, 1 2, 9, in the divine nature, shining in the dark night locally, yet collectively. The churches should be of the divine nature golden. They should be the stands, even the lampstands, that bear the lamp with the oil, Christ as the life-giving spirit, 
shining in the darkness respectively and collectively. They are individual lampstands locally, yet at the same time they are a group, a collection, of lampstands universally. They are not only shining locally, but also bearing universally the same testimony both to the localities and to the universe. They are of the same nature and in the same shape. They bear the same lamp for the same purpose and are fully identified with one another, not having any individual distinctiveness. The differences of the local churches recorded in chapters 2 and 3 are all of a negative nature, not of a positive nature. Negatively, in their failures, they are different and separate one from another. But positively, in their nature, shape, and purpose, they are absolutely identical and connected one to another. It is easy for believers to see the universal church, but it is difficult for them to see the churches. The revelation of the local churches is the Lord's ultimate unveiling concerning the church. It has been given here in the last book of the Divine Word. To fully know the church, believers must follow the Lord from the Gospels through the epistles to the book of Revelation until they are enabled to see the local churches as unveiled here. In Revelation the first vision is concerning the churches. The churches with Christ as their center are the focus in the divine administration for the accomplishment of God's eternal purpose. If there were no local churches, I could not bear to go on living. I would rather die. Suppose there were no local churches. What would we do? We would have no goal, no aim, and no purpose, and our Christian life would be meaningless. The local churches are the goal, the aim, and the meaning of our Christian life. As you are enjoying the local church life, you may not appreciate it very much. But if the churches were taken away, then you would realize that you have been stripped of every blessing. Without the church life, we cannot live, for we would lose the goal and meaning of being a Christian today. I hope that we all, especially the young people, will see that the destination of God's revelation is the local churches. God's revelation continued progressively, only stopping when he had reached the local churches. The local churches are God's destination. God has brought his revelation into the local churches. This is the reason that the churches are full of revelation, light, and truth. Outside the churches there is the shortage of light, revelation, and food. But the churches are full of revelation because they are the destination of God's revelation. Thus, all the riches of the divine revelation are here. If you would see this, then you would realize that we are not overzealous for the church. Our spirit testifies to this. Whenever we do not testify of the local churches, our spirit abates. Whenever we try to be wise and not arouse opposition against us by avoiding discussion of the church, we are immediately deadened within. But when we boldly speak of the local church, we are stirred up, our spirit is living and burning, and we feel like shouting, crying, and even thundering. I realize that it is better not to offend people. However, when I try not to offend people, I offend the Lord. But when I strongly tell people that the local churches are the Lord's destination, I sense that the Lord is with me. According to the whole Bible, the Son of Man, Christ, is walking in the midst of the local churches. If you are seeking Christ, then you must come to the local churches. The Son of Man is moving among the churches and caring for them. If you would participate in this caring, you must be in the local churches. Our burden today is to bring God's people to his goal, and our purpose is to help the saints to reach God's destination. Before we came into the local churches, we were wanderers. We never had the sense that we had come home or that we had reached our destination. But the day we came into the local churches, we realized that we had come home. After wandering for years, we knew that we had finally reached our destination. When we first came into the local church life, something deep within said, this is the place, and we knew that we were home. Because we have arrived at our destination, we do not need to travel anymore. So many seeking Christians today are travelers. They travel from one denomination or group to another. But the day we came into the church life, our wandering ceased. The local churches are what God desires today. This is the last station of his revelation. Our need is simply to live the local church life. Our testimony is that we are not an organization we are the local expressions of the body of Christ. 
2. The progress of the manifestation of God God is embodied and expressed in Christ, John 1 colon 1, 14, 1 Tim 3 16, col. 2 colon 9, and Christ is realized and experienced as the Spirit, John 14 colon 16 17, 1 cor 15 colon 45 b, 2 cor 317, rom 10, philosophy 119. The Spirit is the very constituent of the Church which is the body of Christ, His fullness, F1 colon 22 23, 1 cor 1212. Now the body of Christ is expressed in all the local churches, for the local churches are the expressions of the universal church, 1 colon 11 12. The local churches are the expression of the body, the body is the realization of Christ as the life-giving spirit, and Christ is the embodiment of God. Thus, in the local churches we have God, Christ, the Spirit, and the Church. This is why the local churches are so rich. Where can you meet God with His purpose? In the local churches. Where can you gain Christ with all His riches? In the local churches. Where can you participate in the intensified life-giving Spirit? In the local churches. Where can you be a practical part of the body? In the local churches. Oh, the local churches mean so much to us. Hallelujah. Amen. We are no longer wanderers we are people in the local churches. We have reached our destination and have come home. We are home for eternity. Here in the churches we have God with his purpose, we have Christ with his riches, we have the intensified life-giving spirit, and we have the proper church life. Here the Bible is not only open it is real. Hallelujah for the local churches. We really have something to be excited about. God's revelation began with God himself and continued with Christ and the Spirit until it reached its goal in the local churches. Without the local churches, we do not have the goal of the divine revelation. Here the shortage among the Jews, many Christians, and even many so-called spiritual people becomes evident. The Jews have God, most Christians have God and Christ and the improved Christians also have the Spirit, but very few Christians have the proper church life in the local churches. Today, in the local churches, we have God, Christ, the Spirit, and the Church. The issue of the progress of the manifestation of God is the Church. God is embodied in Christ, Christ is realized and experienced as the Spirit who imparts life to us, and the Spirit issues in the churches. When we experience and realize Christ as the life-giving spirit, the issue is the church life. The church is the body, the fullness of Christ. The progress of this revelation is God, Christ, the spirit, the church, and the local churches. This is the revelation of God in his holy word. In this, we can see how God is realized by us and how he is actually expressed and manifested. God firstly took the step of being incarnated of being embodied in Christ. If you want to meet God, you must meet Christ. Do you want to come to God? Then you must come to Christ. Outside of Christ, it is impossible to touch God. God is embodied in a practical and real man by the name of Jesus Christ. When you meet him, you meet God. When you touch him, you touch God. When you gain him, you gain God. When you receive him, you receive God, because he is the very embodiment of God himself. This Christ is realized and experienced by us as the life-giving spirit. He is not only our Savior, our Redeemer, our Lord, our holiness, and our righteousness. He is the very life-giving spirit. His being our Savior, Redeemer, and Lord is for him to be the life-giving spirit. What we actually and practically have today is the life-giving spirit. Most Christians have missed this very crucial point, for the subtle enemy has done his best to hide this matter. In the past years, we have given many messages and printed a number of books concerning Christ as the life-giving spirit, but some Christians do not see it. Rather, they oppose it. This is the subtlety of the enemy. If Christ were only our Savior, Redeemer, and Lord, how could the Church be practically produced? The Savior does not produce the church directly. Neither does the Lord produce the church directly. In order for the church to be produced, there is the need for Christ to be the life-giving spirit. 
In knowing Christ as the life-giving spirit we must not rely upon our mentality, for it is too limited to comprehend this. Although we cannot understand it thoroughly, we can experience it. Check with your experience. Your daily experience testifies that the Christ whom you enjoy is the life-giving spirit within you. Not only is Christ himself wonderful, mysterious, unlimited, and unsearchable, but even the food we enjoy each day is beyond our understanding. Although we cannot know food by exercising our mentality, we can know its taste by our experience. By our experience, we know what food is. Do not pay attention to theological talk. Those who engage in this talk are snared by the over-exercise of their mentality. We just care for the pure word in the divine revelation and for our personal, practical experience. Our experience testifies that the very Christ whom we enjoy each day is the life-giving spirit, do you not have the reality of the living one within you? This is the very Christ whom we are enjoying, experiencing, and partaking of in our spirit. This is the life-giving spirit who is Christ himself. Thus, God is embodied in Christ, and Christ is realized and experienced in us as the life-giving spirit. This experience issues in the church. The more we experience Christ in this way, the more we long for the church. This experience creates a hunger and a thirst deep within. Formerly, when we were not in the local churches, we could not specify what we were hungry and thirsty for. But after coming into the church, we realized that our experience of Christ had created a hunger and thirst for the church life. When we came into the church life, our hunger and thirst were satisfied. This satisfaction creates within us a deeper appreciation of Christ, and this in turn causes us to enjoy him more and more. The more we enjoy Christ, the more we long for the church life. The more we long for the church life, the more we get into the church. And the more we get into the church, the more we appreciate and enjoy Christ. This is a glorious cycle, and we can testify that we are in it. The purpose of this ministry is not to render knowledge to the saints. It is to help the saints open their eyes, mind, heart, and spirit to see God's revelation. Whatever we minister matches our experience. Today we are here for the testimony of Jesus which issues from the genuine experience of Christ as the life-giving spirit. Thus, I say, once again, that God is embodied in Christ, Christ is realized and experienced as the life-giving spirit, and the experience of Christ as the life-giving spirit issues in the church life. The church is the body, the expression, and the fullness of Christ. As such, it must have its local expressions. The universal church is the body, the fullness, of Christ, and the local churches are the expressions of this universal church. We are in these expressions today. Hallelujah! 3. The way to see God's revelation and to realize God's manifestation a. To be separated unto God to see God's revelation and to realize his manifestation, we need to be separated unto God. The Apostle John was fully separated unto God on the island of Patmos, 1 colon 9. He was also brought to the open door of heaven, 4 colon 1, and to a great and high mountain, 21 10, and thus saw God's revelation and realized God's manifestation. Today, many Christians who are talking about the church do not see the local churches, mainly because they are not separated unto God. b. To be in the human spirit Revelation 1.10 says, I was in spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. The book of Revelation not only stresses the spirit of God as the sevenfold intensified spirit for God's intensified move, but also our human spirit as the organ for us to realize and respond to God's move. Only, our, spirit can respond to, God's, spirit. The book of Revelation is composed of four major visions, the vision of the churches, ch1-3. The vision of the destiny of the world, ch4-16. The vision of the great Babylon, ch17-20. And the vision of the new Jerusalem, ch2-22. To see these four visions, John was in his spirit, 110, 4,2, 17,3. 21,10, as mentioned in Ephesians 3,5, by the Spirit should be in spirit, gk. For the revelation of the mystery of Christ. 
we also need to be in our spirit to see the visions of this book. It is not merely a matter of mental understanding, but of spiritual realization. In the first vision of this book, the vision concerning the churches, both Christ and the messengers of the churches are unveiled with the churches as never before, and this in a most particular way. For this the believers need a particular vision in their spirits. The Lord's day in this verse should be the first day of the week, the day the Lord was resurrected, John 20 colon 1. The early church used to meet on this day, Acts 20 colon 7, 1 cor 16 colon 2. It was on this day that John was in spirit to see the visions of God's economy. To see the revelation of the local churches, we need to turn from our reasoning mind to our seeing spirit. Remaining in the reasoning mind confuses the vision of the churches. C. To hear the Lord's voice if Christians only understand the doctrine concerning the local churches, they may not see the vision. All Christians need to hear the voice, the present and living speaking of the Lord. The Lord's voice directs us to the vision of the local churches. D. To turn to the Lord's voice Revelation 1.12 says, And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned I saw seven golden lampstands. To see anything requires the right position with the right angle. The Apostle John firstly heard the voice, V. 10, and when he turned to see the voice, he saw the golden lampstands. He was rightly positioned, but he still needed the right angle to see the vision concerning the churches. Thus, he turned. It is the same with us today. Many Christians need to be adjusted in their position and turned that they may see the vision of the churches. Life Study of Revelation Message 8 The seven lampstands Since nearly everything in the book of Revelation is based upon the Old Testament, most of the items mentioned in this book are not new. Most of what this book reveals can be traced back to the Old Testament. Nevertheless, all the items found in Revelation have a new significance. For example, the city of Jerusalem, a city with twelve gates, is found in Ezekiel 48, but at the end of Revelation we see the city of Jerusalem in a new way. Because Revelation is a book of conclusion, the fulfillment of the things in the Bible, nearly everything contained in it is presented in a new way. This is true of the lampstands in Chapter 1. The lampstand is mentioned in Exodus 25 and Zechariah 4, but in Revelation it is mentioned in a new way. In this message we must consider the seven lampstands in Revelation 1. The lampstands are the symbols of the local churches. Although we have seen that the local churches are the testimony of Jesus, it may be somewhat difficult for many to grasp the meaning of this. What does it mean to say that the local churches are the testimony of Jesus? It means that the churches are the lampstands. Throughout the centuries, few Christians have touched the depths of the significance of the lampstand. In this message we must probe into the depths of this matter of the lampstands. Biblical symbols are difficult to comprehend, for we cannot understand a symbol like the lampstand according to our natural concept. According to our natural concept, a lampstand is simply an object holding a lamp that shines in the darkness. The lampstand in Exodus 25 is pure gold, and the lampstands in Zechariah 4 and Revelation also are golden. Substantially, the lampstand is golden. With the lampstand we see three important things, the gold, the stand, and the lamps. The lampstand implies the significance of the triune God. Gold is the substance with which the lampstand is made, the stand is the embodiment of the gold, and the lamps are the expression of the stand. The gold signifies the Father as the substance, the stand signifies the Son as the embodiment of the Father, and the lamps signify the Spirit as the expression of the Father in the Son. Thus, the significance of the triune God is implied in the lampstand. On the walls of Jewish synagogues there is a symbol of the lampstand. Although the Jews have used this symbol for centuries, they do not know its real significance the significance of the triune God. Have you ever realized that the lampstand implies the significance of the triune God? Substantially, the lampstand is one, but expressively, it is seven because it is one lampstand with seven lamps. At the bottom, the lampstand is one. At the top, it is seven. Should we argue about whether it is one or seven? In substance, the lampstand is one piece of gold, but it holds seven lamps. 
This mysteriously indicates that substantially the triune God is one. In substance, he is one, but in expression, he is the seven spirits. The Father as the substance is embodied in the Son as the form, and the Son is expressed as the seven spirits. How can we prove that the seven lamps are the spirit expressing Christ? The seven lamps are first mentioned in Exodus. If we only had the record in Exodus, however, it would be difficult to realize that these seven lamps are the spirit. But as we proceed from Exodus to Zechariah, we see that the seven lamps are the seven eyes of Christ and the seven eyes of God, Zech 3 9, 4 10. As we continue on to Revelation, we see that the seven eyes of the Lamb are the seven eyes which are the intensified spirit of God. Hence, we have a strong basis for saying that the seven lamps are the sevenfold intensified spirit as the expression of Christ. We have seen that the lampstand implies the significance of the triune God. It symbolizes the triune God embodied and expressed. God the Father as the divine gold is embodied in Christ the Son and then is fully expressed through the Spirit. The expression differs from the embodiment. The embodiment must be uniquely one because our God is uniquely one. Thus, the embodiment must be one stand. The expression, however, must be complete, and complete in God's move. Recall that seven is the number for completion in God's move. Throughout the centuries, God has been expressed in his move. This is the reason that the seven lamps signify the intensified spirit as the expression of Christ in God's complete move. This is the practical understanding of the Trinity. The Trinity is for the dispensing of God into humanity. God, the divine being, is firstly embodied in Christ and then expressed through the sevenfold intensified spirit. Now we not only have the triune God. In the lampstand we have the triune God substantially and solidly embodied and expressed. The gold has been formed into the solid stand. It once was just gold, but now it is the stand. The gold has been formed into a stand for the fulfillment of God's purpose. Without the stand, there is no way for God's purpose to be fulfilled. As we have seen, this stand, which is a type of Christ, is expressed through the seven lamps signifying the seven spirits of God. The seven spirits of God are not separate from God. They are the seven eyes of God and of the Lamb, the Redeemer. As we shall see, they are also the seven eyes of the building stone. Hence, they are the seven eyes with the redemption of Christ for God's building. Whenever these eyes look at people, they are redeemed and built into God's house. This is the Trinity. In Exodus 25 the emphasis is upon the stand, in Zechariah 4 the emphasis is upon the lamps, and in Revelation 1 the emphasis is upon the reproduction. In both Exodus and Zechariah, the lamp stand is one, but in Revelation it has been reproduced and has become seven. Firstly, in Exodus the emphasis is on the stand on Christ. Secondly, in Zechariah the emphasis is on the lamps on the Spirit. Eventually, in Revelation both the stand and the lamps, that is, both Christ and the Spirit, are reproduced as the churches. In Exodus and Zechariah there are just seven lamps, but here in Revelation there are forty-nine lamps, for every lamp stand has seven lamps. Hence, the one lamp stand has become seven and the seven lamps have become forty-nine. The lamp stands with their lamps in Revelation are the reproduction of Christ and the Spirit. When Christ is realized, he is the Spirit, and when the Spirit is realized, we have the churches as the reproduction. The church is not only universally one but also expressed locally in many cities. In the whole universe there is only one Christ, one Spirit, and one church. Why then are there the seven churches? Because of the need for an expression. For existence, one is sufficient, but for expression, many are needed. If we would know the church, we must know its substance, existence, and expression. Substantially, the church, and even all the churches, are one. In expression, the many churches are the many lampstands. What is the church? The church is the expression of the triune God, and this expression is seen in many localities on the earth. The church is signified not by just one lampstand but by seven lampstands. In Revelation 1 there are seven lampstands with 49 lamps shining in the universe. 
This is the testimony of Jesus. The church is the testimony of Jesus. This means that the church is the expression of the triune God substantially and expressively. Substantially, it is of one substance in the whole universe. Expressively, it is many lampstands with the lamps shining in the darkness to express the triune God. The Father as the substance is embodied in the Son, the Son as the embodiment is expressed through the Spirit, the Spirit is fully realized and reproduced as the churches, and the churches are the testimony of Jesus. If we see this vision, it will govern us and we shall never be divisive. This vision will hold us, guard us, and keep us in the testimony of Jesus. We have seen that the lampstand is the divine gold embodied into a substantial form to fulfill God's purpose in his move. The expression of the stand is in the shining of the light. As the expression shines, the shining fulfills God's eternal purpose. Thus, the lampstand not only signifies the triune God, but also the move of the triune God in his embodiment and expression. We also have seen that the local churches are the reproduction of the embodiment and expression of the triune God. This is not a small thing. We should not be satisfied with saying that the local churches are the lampstands shining in the dark night. Although this is correct, it is rather shallow. We must see that the local churches are the reproduction of the embodiment and expression of the triune God. In the Bible, the lampstand is always related to God's building. The first time it was mentioned was in Exodus 25 31-40 when the tabernacle was built. The second instance was in the building of the temple in 1 Kings 7 49. The third instance had very much to do with the rebuilding of God's temple in Zechariah 4 2-10. Here in Revelation it is related to the building of the churches. In Exodus 25 the emphasis is on Christ being the lampstand as the divine light, shining as the seven lamps with the Spirit the oil. In Zechariah 4 the emphasis is on the Spirit, v. 6, shining as the seven lamps which are the seven eyes of God, verses 2, 10. The seven eyes of God are the seven spirits of God, Rev. 5 6, for God's intensified move. This indicates that the lampstand in Zechariah is the reality of the lampstand in Exodus, and the lampstands in Revelation are the reproduction of the lampstand in Zechariah. Christ is realized as the Spirit, and the Spirit is expressed as the churches. The shining Spirit is the reality of the shining Christ, and the shining churches are the reproduction and the expression of the shining Spirit to accomplish God's eternal purpose that the new Jerusalem as the shining city may be consummated. Christ, the Spirit, and the churches are all of the same divine nature. I. The lampstand for the building of the tabernacle, temple, we have seen that the lampstand is for God's building. The lampstand in Exodus 25 was for the building of the tabernacle, the lampstand in Zechariah 4 was for the recovery of God's building, and the lampstands in Revelation 1 are for the building of the church. This indicates that the triune God is for God's building. While Christians talk a great deal about the Trinity, very few have seen that the triune God is for God's building. The lampstand in Exodus 25 typifies Christ as the expression of God shining with the seven lamps, the seven spirits of God. The way the Bible presents the lampstands is very interesting. Firstly, the Bible reveals that for the building of the tabernacle there was the need of the lampstand. The lampstand was also necessary for the function of the tabernacle. The tabernacle had no windows, and its entrance was completely covered by a curtain. Since there were no openings, there was no way light could come in from the outside. Without the lampstand shining in the tabernacle, no one inside would have been able to function. Thus, the lampstand was not only for the building of the tabernacle but also for its function. Likewise, without the lampstand, there is no building of the church and no function in the church. The church's function depends upon the shining lampstand. We in the church need the shining of the lampstand. Often, when you consider what to do or how to do it, you find yourself confused. The more you think, the more dense the darkness becomes. But when you come into the church meeting or fellowship with the saints, you are immediately enlightened and say, Oh, now I see the way. No one gave you a message telling you what to do. You were made clear by the shining of the lampstand in the church. The lampstand shines upon us in the church. 
The lampstand is not only for God's building, but also for the function in God's building. In order to function, we must have light. The light of the shining lampstand is in the church. This is why we cannot afford to stay away from the church. Do not say, as long as I read the Bible and pray at home, everything will be the same. If you try this, you will rush back to the church after a few days. For this reason, we do not like to take a vacation unless we can go to a place where there is a church. The church not only has the lampstand but also is the lampstand. 2. The lampstand for the building of the recovered temple The lampstand is needed even more for the recovery of God's building. Zechariah 4 reveals that the lampstand emphasizing the spirit is for the recovery of God's building. Today, there is a greater need for the lampstand because we are not only in God's building, but also in the recovery of his building. We need the lampstand to shine upon us and to strengthen us. A. Signifying the spirit for God's move for the recovery of his temple, God gave a vision to Zechariah that by it he might be able to strengthen Zerubbabel. In this vision, Zechariah saw a lampstand with seven lamps into which oil was flowing from two olive trees. Then the angel said to Zechariah, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Zech 4 6. This indicates that the Spirit of God is for his move on the earth. B. With seven lamps which are the seven eyes the seven lamps on the lampstand in Zechariah are the seven eyes. Firstly, these seven eyes are the eyes of Christ as the stone for God's building, Zech 4 colon 2, 10, 3 colon 9. Revelation 5 colon 6 also speaks of the seven eyes of Christ, the Lamb, saying that they are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. The seven spirits are the seven eyes of Christ. In Zechariah 3 and 4 Christ is the stone for God's building, and in Revelation 5 he is the Lamb for our redemption. This indicates that the redeeming Christ is the building stone. Both the Lamb and the stone have the seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God. In Zechariah the seven eyes are the eyes of the stone, while in Revelation they are the eyes of the Lamb. The seven lamps, which are the seven eyes of Christ, are also the eyes of God for his move, Zech 4.10. Christ has the seven eyes, the seven spirits of God, for God's move. Firstly, Christ is the redeeming lamb and eventually he is the building stone. This is absolutely for God's move on earth, through redemption to the goal of building. Today we are enjoying redemption for the building. We enjoy Christ not only as the redeeming lamb, but also as the building stone. Christ's redemption is for God's building. In him we are redeemed, and in him we are built up. He is accomplishing this by the seven spirits of God which are for God's move today. C. The lamps being for enlightening and the eyes being for transfusion by looking the lamps are for enlightening, and the eyes are for transfusion by looking. These eyes are not only for searching, observing, and judging, but especially for transfusing. Whenever Christ looks at us with his seven eyes, we are spontaneously infused by him. Whether we are being judged, enlightened, searched, or burned, he transfuses all that he is into us. Whenever Christ enlightens us, he shines into us, transfusing all that he is into us that we might become a transformed precious stone for God's building. 3. The lamp stands being for the building of the local churches a. Symbolizing the local churches as the testimony of Jesus the lamp stands in Revelation are the symbols of the local churches. Every local church is a lamp stand shining forth the testimony of Jesus with the sevenfold intensified spirit of God as the lamps in its locality. B. Divine in nature the lamp stands are golden. As we have seen, gold signifies the divine nature of God. That the lamp stands here are golden signifies that the churches are constituted with the divine nature of God. We have the Father's life and nature, 2 Pet. 1 colon 4, the Father's gold, possessing his golden divine nature. How wonderful that we have this divine substance. C. Shining in the dark age with the seven spirits of God we may pay our attention only to the lamp stands and neglect the lamps, but the lamp stands are not for the lamp stands. They are for the lamps. If the lampstands had no lamps, they would be meaningless. 
therefore, we must point out what the lamps are. We see the lamps in chapter 4, they are the seven spirits of God burning before the throne, 4 colon 5. Thus, the seven spirits of God are the seven burning lamps. Some have said that the lamps are Christ and that the church is the stand which holds Christ as the lamp. This is not bad, but Revelation does not say that the lamp firstly is Christ. Of course, when we come to chapter 21, we see that Christ is the lamp in the New Jerusalem. However, Revelation does not say that Christ is the seven lamps today. Rather, it says that the seven spirits of God are the seven lamps. We must be deeply impressed with how much the seven spirits mean to us. If we are the churches as the lamp stands, what should we hold? To say that we should hold Christ is too doctrinal. Who and what is Christ today? In our experiences for the church life, Christ is not merely Christ he is the Spirit, 2 COR 317. This Spirit, who is the life-giving Spirit, has been intensified in the book of Revelation into the seven spirits which are the seven spirits of God. These spirits are the seven eyes, not only of God, but also of the Lamb. The church life is completely dependent upon these seven spirits. It is not a matter of Christ doctrinally, but of the seven spirits experientially. We must experience the spirit. In our work, daily life, meetings, service, and testimonies, we must have the spirit. If we lack the spirit, we are empty and are nothing. The lamp stands must hold the lamps which are the seven spirits. The seven spirits are the expression of Christ. This is clearly indicated by the lamp stand in Exodus 25. This lamp stand, which was one piece of gold weighing a talent, is expressed through the seven lamps. This solid piece of pure gold signifies God the Father as our very substance. But if we only had God the Father, we would not have the form. We would have the gold, but no stand. To have only the Father without the Son is to have the substance without the embodiment. Only when the gold is beaten into the form of a stand do we have the embodiment. While the stand is the embodiment of the substance, without the seven lamps, this embodiment cannot have its expression. Hence, the substance is the Father, the embodiment is the Son, and the expression is the Spirit expressing God the Father in the Son. Since all that God the Father is in the Son is expressed through the seven lamps, the Bible later tells us that the seven lamps are the seven spirits. Hence, the Spirit is the expression of the triune God. Eventually, in the book of Revelation, we see that this expression is the expression of Christ, because the seven spirits firstly were the seven eyes of God in Zechariah 4.10, and have become the seven eyes of the Lamb in Revelation 5.6. The seven eyes of the Lamb are the expression of Christ. Today, the Holy Spirit, who is the life-giving Spirit and also the seven spirits, is the expression of Christ. Where is this expression today? It is with the churches for the seven spirits are the seven lamps held by the churches as the lamp stands. Many Christians today do not know the life-giving spirit and the sevenfold intensified spirit, or the seven spirits as the expression of Christ held by the churches as the lamp stands. If you would meet this spirit, you must be with the churches. If you would touch, enjoy, and experience this spirit, you must be a part of the church for it is the churches as the lampstands which hold the seven spirits of Christ who are the very expression of Christ. This spirit is no more separate from Christ than your eyes are separate from you. Since a person's eyes are his expression, they cannot be separated from him. Likewise, since the seven spirits are Christ's expression, they cannot be separated from Christ. The churches are the lampstands, and the lamps are the sevenfold intensified spirit of God as the expression of Christ. This light is shining brighter and brighter, and the vision is becoming clearer every day. The local churches as the golden lamp stands shine with such a spirit in the dark age of today. In today's dark age, the church really needs the sevenfold intensified spirit of God to shine forth the testimony of Jesus. D. The church being the embodiment of Christ and the reproduction of the Spirit The church is the embodiment of Christ and the reproduction of the Spirit. The Spirit is the reality of Christ, John 14,17-20, 16, 13-15, and the church is the reproduction of the Spirit, 
Revelation 22 17a. The church with the Spirit is the embodiment of Christ, the testimony of Jesus, Revelation 1 2, 9, 19 10. Therefore, the more Spirit, the more church and the more testimony of Jesus. 4. The two lampstands for God's testimony in the Great Tribulation in 11 4 we see the two lampstands, the two witnesses, for God's testimony during the Great Tribulation. The overcomers will be raptured before the Tribulation, whereas the weaker ones, the green and tender ones, will be left on earth to pass through the Tribulation. Due to this, there will be the need for the strengthening of God's testimony. To meet this need, God will send Elijah and Moses back to earth. Today, the testimony of the church mainly depends upon the stronger, more experienced ones. When the experienced ones have been raptured, the weaker ones will need to be strengthened. Although it may be quite good to be supplied by Moses and Elijah, I want to leave the earth before they return. In principle, the two witnesses in chapter 11 also are lampstands. The Bible describes them as the two olive trees which supply oil to the weaker ones, Zech. 4 colon 3, 12. According to the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25, the five foolish virgins will need to buy oil. Once Brother Nay said that probably these foolish virgins would go to the two olive trees to gain the extra portion of the spirit at a cost. These two olive trees are also called the two sons of oil, for they are full of the spirit for God's testimony. Zech 4.14, and are able to supply the weaker saints. During the Great Tribulation, many of the unripe ones will be strengthened and matured through their ministry. Life Study of Revelation Message 9 The Son of Man in the midst of the churches in Chapter 1 of Revelation There are eight crucial points, the revelation of Christ, the testimony of Jesus, the triune God, the second coming of Christ, the joint partakers in the tribulation, kingdom, and endurance in Jesus, the local churches, the lampstands, and the Son of Man. Having covered the first seven points, we come in this message to the eighth the Son of Man in the midst of the churches, 1 colon 12-20. In this book, Christ is firstly revealed as the Son of Man. Whenever he is related to the church, he is revealed in his human nature because the church is composed of human beings. The head of the church is not only the Son of God but also the Son of Man. That the Lord is still the Son of Man after his ascension indicates that he has not put off his human nature after resurrection and that his dealings with us are based upon his humanity. As a man, he succeeded in being God's testimony. Thus, we in the churches today, being human, can also be God's testimony. The Lord was victorious as a man, and we can be victorious also. Christ today is in the midst of the churches. On the one hand, as the high priest, he is interceding in the heavens for the churches, Hebrew 9.24, 7 25-26, Rom. 8.34, and, on the other hand, he is moving in the churches to care for them. If we would participate in his move and enjoy his care, we must be in the churches. I. In his humanity verse 13 says, and in the midst of the lamp stands one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment reaching to the feet, and girded about at the breasts with a golden girdle. Christ is not only depicted here as the High Priest, as shown by his garments, but also unveiled like the Son of Man. He is still both divine and human. As our High Priest, he is caring for the churches in his humanity. Throughout the centuries, some so-called Christians have taught that Christ was not the Son of God. Even today, there are some so-called Christians who do not believe that Christ is the Son of God. To deny that Christ is the Son of God is heretical. Such a teaching is devilish and comes from Hades, and we must uncompromisingly stand against it. Some Christians, on the contrary, do not believe that Christ today is still the Son of Man. They say that Christ became a man by incarnation, but that in his resurrection he put off his humanity. Some of these Christians think that today Christ is merely the Son of God, no longer being the Son of Man. When about 15 years ago I fought against this concept, some opposed me saying that it was erroneous to teach that Christ is still the Son of Man. While some Christians do not believe that Christ is the Son of Man today, we believe it. 
According to the pure word, the Lord Jesus is still both the Son of God and the Son of Man. We cannot explain this adequately because our mind is so limited. Nevertheless, we believe and accept the fact that our Christ is both the Son of God with divinity and the Son of Man with humanity. In Him we have true divinity and proper humanity. During the past 19 centuries, especially during the first six centuries, Christology was a subject of intense controversy among Christians. Concerning the person of Christ there have been differing opinions, and Christians have fought with one another about them. We must drop all these so-called theological schools. According to the Bible, we believe that our Christ is truly the Son of God and the Son of Man. He has two natures, divinity and humanity. When Christ comes to deal with us in the churches, he does so not only in his divinity but also in his humanity. You may excuse yourself, thinking that the Lord could make it because he was the Son of God but that since you are human the Lord must sympathize with you. As the Son of God, the Lord is quite capable, but you, as a mere son of man, are pitiful, and the Lord should not condemn you so much. But when he comes to us as the Son of Man, you have no excuse. He also was a man and made it as a man, not as the Son of God. Do not make any excuses for yourself. If you are defeated and fail in the church life, do not sympathize with yourself, saying that it is excusable because you are only a human being. Human beings are just the right material for the church life. Thus, in the midst of the churches, Christ is walking as the Son of Man. In Daniel 3 we are told that the Son of God was walking in the fire, but in Revelation 1 we see that it is the Son of Man who is walking in the midst of the churches. We all must worship him as the Son of Man. Because he is both human and divine, he is such a wonderful one. Because he is both divine and human, he knows heaven and earth, God and man. In him we have divinity and humanity. In him we are in the heavens and also are on the earth. Today the Lord is both in the heavens and on the earth walking, in his humanity, in the midst of the local churches. 2. As the priest verse 13 says that Christ is clothed with a garment reaching to the feet. This garment is the priestly robe, exo. 28.33.35, signifying the fullness of Christ's divine virtues and human attributes, CFISA 6.1.3. Although the word priest is not mentioned here, we know by his garment that Christ is depicted here as the high priest. Today, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, who is walking in the midst of the churches, is a priest. Among the three offices of priest, prophet, and king, the most dear, intimate, precious, and lovely office is that of the priest. The priest is so dear and lovely because he takes care of the people. As Christ walks among the churches, he takes care of them. 3. Not working with strength, but caring for the churches in love verse 13 also says that Christ, the Son of Man, was girded about at the breasts with a golden girdle. Have you ever seen someone girded about at the breasts with a girdle? This is quite meaningful. The priests in the Old Testament were girded at the loins for their ministry, Exo 28,4. In Daniel 10,5 Christ is also girded with fine gold at his loins. But here Christ as our high priest is girded about at the breasts. The breasts signify love. To be girded at the loins is to be strengthened for work whereas to be girded about at the breasts signifies care in love. Christ's work in producing the churches has been accomplished. Now he no longer needs to be girded at his loins for work. What he is doing now in the midst of the churches is to care for them in love. This requires him to be girded about at the breasts with a golden girdle. This golden girdle signifies divine strength. Christ is now exercising a divine care over the churches, moving among them in his humanity and caring for them with his divine strength. What a loving care he exercises over his churches today. 4. Being ancient verse 14 says that his head and hair were white as white wool, as snow. White hair signifies great age, Job 15:10. The black hair with which the Lord is depicted in Song of Songs 5:11 signifies his unfading and everlasting strength but the white hair with which he is depicted here signifies his ancientness. Although Christ is ancient, he is not old. 
In this chapter we see that his head and his hair were white as wool and as snow. White wool issues from the nature of life, and white snow comes down from the sky, from heaven. Wool is not made white. It is born white, and its whiteness comes out of its nature. White wool is the color of Christ's nature. His ancientness is of his nature. Snow is white because it comes from heaven and contains no earthly dirt or stain. Hence, white wool, both here and in Daniel 7,9, signifies that the ancientness of Christ is of his nature, not of his becoming old, while white snow signifies that his ancientness is heavenly, not earthly. V. With watching, observing, searching, judging, and infusing eyes in verse 14, we see that his eyes are as a flame of fire. In Song of Songs 5.12 the eyes of Christ are like doves. That is for the expression of his love. Here his eyes are as a flame of fire. This is for him to observe and search in his judging by enlightening. In this book his eyes are not two but seven, five colon six. Seven is the number of completion in God's move. Hence, his eyes in this book are for God's operation. These seven eyes of his are the seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God, 4 colon 5, cf Dan 10 colon 6. The fire burning equals the flame of fire and is for observing and searching. The seven spirits of God which are sent forth into all the earth are also for God's move upon the earth. Thus, the eyes of Christ in this book are the seven spirits of God for God's move and operation on earth today. Christ's eyes are for watching, observing, searching, judging by enlightening, and infusing. We must experience all these different aspects of his eyes, especially the aspect of infusing. His eyes infuse us with all that he is. His infusing eyes are a flame of fire which is continually burning. This can be proved by our experience. Do not exercise your mind to understand this, but check with your experience. Since the day we were saved, Christ's eyes have been like a burning fire enlightening and infusing us. His eyes also stir us up to be hot. After Christ has looked at us, we can never be cold as we once were. By looking at us, he burns us and stirs us up in the Lord. Many times the Lord comes to us with his piercing eyes. Perhaps when we are trying to hide something from our wives, the Lord comes with seven shining eyes piercing into our being and exposing our true condition. I have had this kind of experience hundreds of times. When I was arguing with others, especially with my intimate ones, the shining eyes of Christ were upon me, and I could not go on speaking. His shining stopped my mouth. The book of Revelation is a book with a judging nature. Fire is for divine judgment, 1 Cor 3.13, Hebrew 6.8. 1027. Our God is also a consuming fire, Hebrew 12:29. His throne is like the fiery flame and its wheels as burning fire, and a fiery stream issues and comes forth from before him, Dan 7:9-10. All this is for judgment. The main significance of the Lord's eyes being as a flame of fire is for his judgment, 2:18-23. 19:11-12. When he comes to take possession of the earth by exercising judgment over it, even his feet will be like pillars of fire, 10 colon 1. 6. Having tried and shining feet verse 15 says, his feet were like shining brass, as having been fired in a furnace. Feet signify the walk. In typology, brass signifies divine judgment, exo 27 colon 1 6. When Christ was on earth, his earthly walk and daily walk were tried and tested. Because his walk was tested, he came out shining. Now the feet of Christ are as shining brass, as mentioned also in Ezekiel 1 colon 7 and Daniel 10 colon 6, signifying that his perfect and bright walk qualifies him to exercise divine judgment. To be fired in the furnace is to be tried by being burned. Christ's walk was tried by his sufferings, even by his death on the cross. Hence, his walk is bright as the shining brass, which qualifies him to judge the unrighteous. As we have already pointed out, when he comes to possess the earth by judging it, his feet will be like pillars of fire, 10 colon 1. 7. 
With a serious and solemn voice verse 15 also says that his voice is as the sound of many waters. The sound of many waters, a tumultuous sound, is the sound of the voice of the Almighty God, Ezek 1 24, 43,2. It signifies the seriousness and solemnity of his speaking, CF 10,3. Sometimes the Lord's voice is gentle and tender, but at other times his voice shocks us like thunder. Whenever we are sloppy or sleepy, the voice of the Lord will wake us up. His voice, which is that of the Almighty God, warns us and wakes us up. 8. Holding the messengers of the churches verse 16 says, He had in his right hand seven stars. As verse 20 makes clear, the seven stars are messengers of the seven churches. The messengers are the spiritual ones in the churches bearing the responsibility of the testimony of Jesus. Like stars, they should be of the heavenly nature and in a heavenly position. In the Acts and the Epistles the elders were the leading ones in the operation of the local churches, Acts 14 23, 2017. Titus 1 5. The eldership is somewhat official, and, as we have seen, at the time this book was written the offices in the churches had deteriorated in the degradation of the church. In this book the Lord calls our attention back to spiritual reality. Hence, it emphasizes the messengers of the churches rather than the elders. The office of the elders is easily perceived, but the believers need to see the importance of the spiritual and heavenly reality of the messengers for the proper church life to bear the testimony of Jesus in the darkness of the church's degradation. Both the lampstands and the stars are for shining in the night. A lampstand representing a local church is a collective unit, whereas a star representing a messenger of a local church is an individual entity. In the dark night of the church's degradation, there is the need of the shining both of the collective churches and of the individual messengers. As Christ walks among the churches, he holds the leading ones in his right hand. How comforting this is! The leading ones must praise him that they are in his hands and that he is holding them. Since the leading ones are in his hands, there is no need for them shrink back, to be weak, or to be mistaken. Christ truly takes the responsibility for his testimony. In the book of Revelation there are no elders in the churches. Rather, there are messengers. At the time this book was written, the church had become degraded. Hence, in Revelation, the Lord repudiates all formalities. Being an elder may be somewhat legal or formal. Do not aspire to be an elder. Desire to be a shining star. Do not be one with a mere position be a shining star. Both the lampstand and the stars shine at night. Both the church and the leading ones in the churches must shine. All the leading ones must be stars. 9. Out of his mouth preceding the judging word in verse 16 we are told that out of his mouth preceded a sharp two-edged sword. In Song of Songs 5:16. His mouth is most sweet, and in the Gospels, words of grace proceeded out of his mouth, Luke 4.22. But here out of his mouth proceeded a sharp two-edged sword. This is his discerning, judging, and slaying word, Hebrew 4.12, F6.17. The words of grace are for his supply of grace to his favored ones, whereas the sharp two-edged sword is for his dealing with negative persons and things. We often say that the Spirit speaks to the churches. Remember that the speaking Spirit today is just this Christ who speaks with a two-edged sword. There is judgment here, and we all have experienced this. Because of the church's degradation, we all need a certain amount of judgment. Today all Christians need the judgment of the Lord by His Word. Many times we have experienced this judgment because of our being mistaken and going astray from the Lord. Since we had wandered away from him, he came to judge us. His speaking today is mainly a type of judgment. I can testify to you that if the Lord would speak to you, most of his words would be words of judgment. When he speaks, he judges. Every word out of his mouth in the churches today is like a sharp knife which judges us. The words which proceed out of the Lord's mouth are sharp, piercing into our being, dividing our soul from our spirit and discerning the intents of our heart. This is the Christ we experience today in the church life. In Christianity, there are numerous opinions and frequent debates and fights because of these opinions. I have seen this myself. 
I know of one case of some Christians who were serving as board members. Once, as they were meeting together, they were discussing and debating with one another. Eventually the debate turned into a fight. At a certain point one of the board members even threw a Bible at another member. But in the Lord's recovery today we have one who is walking in our midst. He watches over us with his seven burning eyes, and out of his mouth proceeds a sharp two-edged sword. This sword has killed all the different concepts among us. This is the reason that there are almost no debates in the churches. Recently, we completed our meeting hall in Anaheim. We can testify that during the months the building work was going on, we never fought with one another. One of the city inspectors told us that, according to his experience, whenever a church building is constructed, the building committee fights among itself. We could testify to this inspector that because of the killing sword, we did not fight with one another. This does not mean that we have no opinions or concepts. We are human and have many opinions. But, as we all can testify, every time an opinion rises up, the sword cuts it to pieces. The more you think about your opinion, the more you are cut. This is not doctrine this is our experience. Whenever two brothers are close to fighting, the third party, the strongest party, appears, using the sharp sword to cut the opinions of both brothers. As we were building our meeting hall, the two-edged sword quelled all the turmoil. This third party is the very Christ, the Son of Man, who, as the High Priest, walks among the churches and cares for them in love. In the Old Testament, there was the need for the priests to trim the lamps. Today our priest, the Son of Man, knows the right time to trim us. This is the reason that there is such calm among us. This is a secret of the church life which the outsiders do not understand, for they do not have the priest trimming and dealing with the lamps on the lampstand. Now the priest is walking among the churches caring for them by trimming all the lamps. X. With a shining face in verse 16 we are also told that his face was as the sun shines in its power. In the Song of Songs 5, 10 and 13, his face appears lovely for his seeker's appreciation of him, and in the epistles, his face reflects God's glory, 2 cor. 4 colon 6, for the imparting of life into his believers. Here, however, his face is as the sun shines in its power, as in Daniel 10 colon 6, for the judging enlightenment to bring in the kingdom. When he was transfigured and his face shone as the sun, that was his coming in the kingdom, Matt. 16, 28-17, When he comes to take over the earth for the kingdom, his face will be as the sun, 10, 1. 11. Being the beginning and the ending, the first and the last verse 17 says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand on me, saying, Do not fear. I am the first and the last. Christ is not only the first and the last, but also the beginning and the ending. This assures us that, having started the church life, he will surely accomplish it. He will never leave his work unfinished. All the local churches must believe that the Lord Jesus is the beginning and the ending. He will accomplish what he has begun in his recovery. 12. Being the living one in verse 18 we see that the Lord is the living one the one who became dead and who is living forever and ever. The very Christ who walks in the midst of the churches, who is the head of the churches and to whom the churches belong, is the living one full of life. Hence, the churches as his body should also be living and full of life. Hallelujah, we have a living Christ who has overcome death. Our Christ, who is the resurrected Christ, is living in us and among us. He is living forever and ever. What a living Christ we have in the recovery. In the recovery, all the churches should be as living as Christ, full of life and overcoming death. 13. Having authority over death and Hades in verse 18 the Lord also said, I have the keys of death and of Hades. Due to the fall and sin of man, death came in and is now working on earth to gather up all the sinful people. Death resembles a dustpan used to collect the dust from the floor and Hades resembles a trash can. Whatever the dustpan collects is put into the trash can. Thus, death is a collector and Hades is a keeper. 
In the church life today are we still subject to death in Hades? No. Christ abolished death on the cross and overcame Hades in his resurrection. Although Hades tried its best to hold him, it was powerless to do it, Acts 2.24. With him, death has no sting and Hades has no power. But what about us? It must be the same. In the church life, the keys of death and Hades are in his hand. It is impossible for us to deal with death. We simply do not have the ability to handle it. Whenever death enters, it will deaden many. But as long as we give the Lord Jesus the ground, the opportunity and the free way to move and act among us, both death and Hades will be under his control. However, whenever the Lord Jesus does not have the ground in the church, death immediately becomes prevailing and Hades becomes powerful to hold the dead ones. Praise the Lord that Christ has the keys of death and Hades. Death is subject to him and Hades is under his control. Hallelujah. Life Study of Revelation Message 10 The Church in Ephesus Love, Life and Light The Book of Revelation is very well composed. Following Chapter 1, Chapters 2 and 3 give us a clear view of seven practical churches. These seven churches are excellent illustrations, revealing the local churches, not in doctrine, but in actual practice. By considering these seven churches we can see clearly what a local church is and should be. The seven epistles in chapters 2 and 3 are the record of the actual situation existing in the seven churches at the time these epistles were written. However, since this book is a book of signs with a prophetic nature, the situations of the seven churches are also signs, signifying prophetically the progress of the church in seven stages. The first epistle, to the church in Ephesus, affords a picture of the church at the end of the first stage, during the last part of the first century. The second epistle, to the church in Smyrna, prefigures the suffering church under the persecution of the Roman Empire, from the last part of the first century to the early part of the fourth century, when Constantine the Great, the Caesar of the Roman Empire, brought the church into imperial favor. The third epistle, to the church in Pergamos, pre-symbolizes the worldly church, the church married to the world from the day Constantine accepted Christianity to the time the papal system was established in the latter part of the 6th century. The epistle to the church in Thyatira depicts prophetically the apostate church, from the ordination of the papal system in the latter part of the 6th century to the end of this age, when Christ comes back. The fifth epistle, to the church in Sardis, prefigures the Protestant church, from the Reformation in the early part of the 16th century to Christ's coming back. The sixth epistle, to the church in Philadelphia, predicts the church of brotherly love, the recovery of the proper church life, from the early part of the 19th century, when the brothers were raised up in England to practice the church life outside all denominational and divisive systems, to the second appearing of the Lord. The seventh epistle, to the church in Laodicea, foreshadows the degraded church life of the brothers in the 19th century from the latter part of the 19th century until the Lord's return. In this message and the following six messages we shall treat each of these churches respectively. In this message we come to the church in Ephesus, 2,1-7. The crucial words in this message are love, life, and light. The basic requirement for having the church life is our love toward the Lord. There is no problem, of course, with the Lord's love toward us. He has loved us and he continues to love us. The problem is with our love toward him. Although we have loved him in the past and may love him now, there is the danger that our love for the Lord Jesus might fade. The epistle to the church at Ephesus warns us of this. This letter also gives us a clear revelation of the source of the degradation of the church life the fading of the first love. As we shall see, love gives us the position, the ground, the right and the privilege to eat of the tree of life. Love gives us the supply of life. If we love the Lord, we shall have the full right to enjoy Him as the tree of life, as our life supply. Light always follows life, issuing out of the abundant supply of life. Life gives us light. In the tabernacle the lampstand comes after the showbread table, indicating that when we enjoy Christ as our life supply, we shall have the light of life. It is vitally important that we love the Lord. If we have love, 
then we shall have the life symbolized by the tree of life and the light signified by the lampstand. In brief, the problem with the church at Ephesus was the fading of the first love toward the Lord. Because of this, the Lord came in to deal thoroughly with this church, warning her that if she did not repent, she was in danger of having her lampstand removed. Anyone among them who would repent and return to his first love would be considered by the Lord to be an overcomer. The Lord promised the overcomer the right to enjoy him as the tree of life. Of course, the lampstand will always remain among those who have overcome. However, if we would not repent of our fading love toward the Lord, we will miss the right to eat of the tree of life and the lampstand will be removed from us. If this were the case, we would be without love, and light. What a pitiful condition this would be. I. The speaker Revelation 2 colon 1 says, To the messenger of the church in Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Each of these seven epistles begins with a description of the speaker. Before the Lord says anything to the churches, he declares who he is. In the first epistle, the Lord declares that he is the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. These two items prove that the Lord is so normal, genuine, and proper. He cares for the churches by holding the leading ones in his right hand and by walking among all the churches. The messengers of the churches, the spiritual ones, signified by the shining stars, who bear the responsibility of the testimony of Jesus, are held in the right hand of the Lord, and the Lord is walking in the midst of the churches, signified by the seven golden lampstands. What a wonderful scene! While the Lord is sitting at the right hand of God as our high priest interceding for us, the churches, Hebrew. 725, he is holding the messengers of the churches and is walking in the midst of the churches to care for them. 2. The church's virtues The word Ephesus in Greek means desirable. This signifies that the initial church at its end was still desirable to the Lord. The Lord still had much expectation in her. A. Works Let us now consider the virtues of the church in Ephesus. Firstly, she did many works for the Lord. The church in Ephesus was neither idle nor sloppy. She was quite good in working for the Lord. B. Labor this church not only worked for the Lord but also labored for him, verses 2 to 3. We must differentiate between work and labor. Labor is higher than work. While work is ordinary, labor is special. Those who worked full time on our meeting hall in Anaheim not only worked they labored. If we had hired a contractor and had used union workers, they would have worked without laboring. C. Endurance The church in Ephesus also had the virtue of endurance. This means that the church was afflicted and endured suffering. D. Bearing not evil men The Lord said to the church in Ephesus, You cannot bear evil men, v2. The word men is not found in the Greek. I believe that the Lord's word here regarding evil includes two things evil men and evil matters. The church in Ephesus did not tolerate anyone or anything evil. It certainly was a good church. E. Having tried the false apostles the Lord also said, You have tried those who call themselves apostles and are not, and have found them to be false, v2. This church was very discerning, trying the false apostles and rejecting them. They discerned that the self-assumed apostles were false. Throughout the generations, there have been self-appointed apostles. This is also true today. F. Hating the works of the Nicolaitans in 2 colon 6 the Lord said, But this you have, that you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. The church in Ephesus hated what the Lord hates the works of the Nicolaitans. As far as virtues were concerned, this church was good, pure, right, and normal. The Lord hates the works of the Nicolaitans. If you want to understand what the works of the Nicolaitans are, read Brother Nace book, the Orthodoxy of the Church. The works of the Nicolaitans refer to a hierarchy among the saints in which some set themselves to rule over others. This brings into being the so-called clergy and laity. In the church in Ephesus there was not the doctrine, the teaching, of the Nicolaitans. This was to develop later. But there were the works and activities of the Nicolaitans, that is, 
there was some type of hierarchy of clergy and laity. The word Nicolaitans is an equivalent of the Greek word Nicolaitai, the root of which is Nikolaos, composed of two Greek words Niko and Laos. Niko means conquer or above others. Laos means common people, secular people, or laity. So Nikolaos means conquering the common people, climbing above the laity. Nicolaitans, then, must refer to a group of people who esteem themselves higher than the common believers. This was undoubtedly the hierarchy followed and established by Catholicism and Protestantism. The Lord hates the works, the behavior, of these Nicolaitans, and we must hate what the Lord hates. God in his economy intended that all his people be priests to serve him directly. In Exodus 19, 6 God ordained the children of Israel to be a kingdom of priests. This means that God wanted them all to be priests. However, because of the worship of the golden calf, Exo. 32, 1-6, they lost the priesthood, and only the tribe of Levi, because of their faithfulness to God, was chosen to replace the whole nation of Israel as priests to God, Exo. 32, 25-29, Deuterium. 33, 8-10. Hence, there was a mediatorial class between God and the children of Israel. This became a strong system in Judaism. In the New Testament, God has returned to his original intention according to his economy in that he has made all believers in Christ priests, 1 colon 6, 5 10, 1 pet 2 colon 5, 9. But at the end of the initial church, even in the first century, the Nicolaitans intervened as the mediatorial class to spoil God's economy. According to church history, this became a system adopted by the Roman Catholic Church and was also retained by the Protestant churches. Today in the Roman Catholic Church there is the priestly system, in the state churches there is the clerical system, and in the independent churches there is the pastoral system. All these are a mediatorial class, spoiling the universal priesthood of all believers. Thus, there are two distinct classes the clergy and the laity. But in the proper church life there should be neither clergy nor laity. All believers should be the priests of God. Because the mediatorial class destroys the universal priesthood in God's economy, the Lord hates it. In Acts 6 5 among the seven serving ones was one named Nicolaus, Greek. There is no trace in church history that this Nicolaus is the first of the Nicolaitans. 3. The origin of the church's degradation Although the church in Ephesus had so many virtues, it was degraded because it had left its first love. In verse 4 the Lord said, But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. The Greek word for first is the same as the word translated best in Luke 15:22. Our first love toward the Lord must be the best love for him. The church in Ephesus had left this best love toward the Lord. The church is the body of Christ. F. 123, is a matter of life. As the new man, F. 215, it is a matter of the person of Christ. And as the bride of Christ, John 329, it is a matter of love. The first epistle to the Ephesians tells us that for the church life we need to be strengthened in our inner man that Christ may make his home in our hearts, that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that we may be filled with all the fullness of God, f. 3 colon 16 19. And that it is for the church life that grace is with all them who love the Lord Jesus, f. 6 24. Now the second epistle to the Ephesians reveals that the degradation of the church begins with our leaving the first love toward the Lord. Nothing but love can keep us in a proper relationship with the Lord. The church in Ephesus had good works, labored for the Lord, endured suffering, and tried the false apostles, but she left her first love toward the Lord. Leaving the first love is the source of all the degradation in the following stages of the church. We in the local churches today must be warned of the possibility of losing our first love for the Lord. We may work and labor for the Lord and we may be pure doctrinally and correct scripturally, yet not have the first love for the Lord. Perhaps in the coming years we shall not love him as much as we do now. Beware of this. It is better to lose some of our work than to fail in our love for the Lord. Our love for him must be the first love. 
we all must say, Lord, I love you. I do not love the works I do for you, and I do not appreciate the labor I spend for you. Lord, I love you. If my labor for you frustrates me from loving you, I will cease laboring. Do not allow anything to separate you from the love of the Lord. We must take care of the first love and constantly love the Lord. I can never forget a short paragraph concerning John Nelson Darby. This paragraph reveals that when Darby was very old he was traveling and stayed in a hotel for the night. As he was going to bed, he prayed in a simple way, saying, Lord Jesus, I still love you. It is precious for an old saint to say this. John Nelson Darby began to love the Lord during his youth. After more than 60 years, he still loved him. We all must daily tell the Lord, Lord Jesus, I still love you. I may change in everything else, Lord, but I would never change in loving you. Rather, I want my love for you to increase all the time. I read this paragraph about Darby more than 20 years ago, and I cannot tell you the help it has rendered me throughout the years. We must constantly say, Lord Jesus, I still love you. Once we have fallen from our first love, our degradation has begun. We may remain the same in everything else in work, labor, and in other things but we are degraded because we have left our first love. Eventually, the church at Ephesus had more work but less love. Today, we all must say that we want more love and less work. If we would do any work, it must be out of our love for the Lord. Love should motivate everything we do for the Lord. If we cannot do a certain thing because we love Him, we should not do it. Our work should simply be an expression of our love for Him. We must be like this. Otherwise, we shall not be kept in His presence. 4. The consequence of the church's degradation In verse 5 we see the consequence of the church's degradation, Remember therefore whence you have fallen and repent and do the first works. But if not, I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place, unless you repent. The consequence of the church's degradation is losing the testimony. To lose the testimony simply means to have the lampstand removed. If we leave our first love toward the Lord and do not repent, we shall lose the testimony of the Lord and the lampstand will be removed from us. Years ago, the testimony with the brethren was quite bright, but it is not so today. There is no doubt that the lampstand has been removed from most of the so-called brethren assemblies. When you enter into their assemblies, you do not sense any shining there. There is no light, no testimony. We must be careful and constantly on the alert to avoid this consequence. Do not think that because we are the local churches as the lampstands and are the testimony of Jesus that we cannot lose our testimony. The day we lose our first love toward the Lord will be the day we lose the testimony. On that day, the lampstand will be removed. V. The Spirit speaking the first part of 2 colon 7 says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. At the beginning of each of the seven epistles in chapters 2 and 3, it is the Lord who speaks, 2 colon 1, 8, 12, 18. 3 colon 1, 7, 14. But at the end of all seven epistles it is the Spirit speaking to the churches, 2 colon 7, 11, 17, 29. 3 colon 6, 13, 22. Once again, this proves that the speaking Christ is the Spirit. Whatever Christ speaks, that is the speaking of the Spirit. No one can argue with this. Who was speaking to the church in Ephesus? Christ, the Son of Man holding the messengers in his right hand and walking in the midst of the churches. As verse 7 indicates, the speaker eventually is the Spirit. This proves that Christ is the speaking Spirit. This not only indicates that the Spirit is the Lord and the Lord is the Spirit. It also emphasizes the vital importance of the spirit in the darkness of the church's degradation as indicated by the sevenfold intensified spirit in 1 colon 4. The same emphasis is also seen in 14 13 and 22 17. It is foolish to say that Christ today is not the speaking spirit, and it is ridiculous to separate the speaking spirit from Christ. The two are one. If the speaker were only Christ without being the speaking spirit, he could never speak some words into our spirit, 
and his speaking would not be very subjective and touching. But, as our experience testifies, if, as we read these epistles, we are open in our spirit to him, the spirit will immediately speak something of Christ into us. Because the speaker is not the objective Christ but the subjective spirit, he speaks not only in the black and white letters of the Bible, but also in our spirit. Once we hear his speaking, something indelible is wrought into us, and nothing can take it away. Our Christ today is the speaking spirit. I rejoice over this fact and I boldly proclaim it. A. To the churches on the one hand, each of the seven epistles is the word of the Lord to a particular church. But, on the other hand, it is the word of the Spirit to all of the churches. Every church should not only give heed to the epistle written to her particularly, but also to all the epistles written to the other churches. This implies that all the churches, as the Lord's testimony in the Spirit, should be the same. Since the Spirit today is speaking to the churches, we must be in the churches to be rightly positioned to hear the Spirit's speaking. How else can we hear what the Spirit is saying? The Spirit is speaking to the churches, not to any religion, denomination, or group of seeking Christians. This is the reason that not many Christians can hear the speaking of the Spirit. The Spirit does not even speak just to one church, but to the churches. Although some supposed churches want to be unique, we should not be a unique or particular church. If we are, we shall miss the speaking of the Spirit because the Spirit is speaking to the churches. In none of the seven epistles does the Spirit speak to a particular church. All the churches should be common, not unique. During the past years, I have heard many say that every church must be distinctive. Those who hold this concept say that every church must have its local uniqueness. Although this thought sounds attractive, actually it is quite repulsive. To make your local church unique is to separate yourself from all the other churches. If you do this, you are through with the Spirit's speaking. Which is better to be unique or to be common? Although you may say that it is better to be common, the fact is that everyone likes to be unique. In your heart, you want the church in your locality to be unique. Nevertheless, in the local churches, do not try to be unique. We all must be common because the Spirit speaks to the churches, not to any unique church. When we are in the church and among the churches, we have the right position and the right angle to hear the Spirit speaking. B. Requiring a proper ear to hear in spiritual things, seeing depends upon hearing. The writer of this book firstly heard the voice, 110, and then saw the vision, 112. If our ears are heavy and cannot hear, then we cannot see. ISA 6 9 10. The Jews would not hear the word of the Lord, so they could not see what the Lord was doing. Matt 13 15. Acts 28 27. The Lord always wants to open our ears to hear his voice. Job 33 14 16. ISA 50 4 5. Exo 21 6. That we may see things according to his economy. The heavy ears need to be circumcised, Je 6.10. Acts 7.51. The sinner's ears need to be cleansed with the redeeming blood and anointed with the Spirit, Lef. 14.14, 14, 17, 28. To serve the Lord as priests also requires our ears to be cleansed with the redeeming blood, Exo 29.20, Lef. 8.23-24. In this book, as the Spirit is speaking to the churches, we all need an opened, circumcised, cleansed, and anointed ear to hear the Spirit speaking. Although our angle and position may be right, we still may not have the proper ear to hear. Chapter 1 emphasizes seeing and chapters 2 and 3 emphasize hearing. We need to both see and hear. Among our physical senses, which is more important seeing or hearing? Suppose you had the choice of losing either your sight or your hearing. Which would you choose? We may say that seeing is more important than hearing, but hearing is deeper than seeing. Thus, we must tell the Lord, Lord, I need to both see and hear. Have mercy on me, Lord, and grant me eyes to see and ears to hear. We may have to struggle with the Lord, telling him that we must be able to both see and hear. Hearing is more intimate than seeing. 
Our closest friends will speak intimately to us. If you lose your hearing organ, you will be unable to enjoy this intimacy with your loved ones. In Chapter 1, John saw. In Chapters 2 and 3, he heard. We need to see the church life and we need to hear the intimate contents of the church life. To see the church is one thing, and to hear the intimate contents of the church life is another. Although many of us have seen the church, not many have heard the intimate contents of the church life. Hence, we need an ear to hear. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 6. The promise to the overcomers eating of the tree of life now we come to the promise to the overcomer, to him who overcomes, to him I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God, v7. To overcome in these seven epistles means to overcome the degraded situation of the churches. In this epistle, it means to recover our first love toward the Lord and to hate the works of the Nicolaitans, the hierarchy which the Lord hates. In 2 colon 7 the Lord said that to him who overcomes he will give to eat of the tree of life. Religion always teaches, but the Lord feeds, John 6.35. The Apostle Paul did the same thing, feeding the believers, 1 cor 3 colon 2. For the proper church life and the recovery of the church life, that is, for the proper growth in the Christian life, what we need is not merely the mental apprehension of teachings, but the eating in our spirit of the Lord is the bread of life, John 6:57. Even the words of the scripture should not be considered as merely doctrines to teach our mind, but as food to nourish our spirit, Matt 4, 4 Hebrew. 5 colon 12 dash 14. Here in this epistle the Lord promises to give the overcomer to eat of the tree of life. This refers back to Genesis 2 colon 8 dash 9 and 16 concerning the matter of eating ordained by God. In the epistle to the church in Pergamos, the Lord promises the overcomer to eat of the hidden manna, 2.17, which refers to the eating of manna by the children of Israel in the wilderness, Exo. 16 colon 14 16, 31. And in the epistle to the church in Laodicea, the Lord promises to dine with the one who opens the door to him, 3.20. To dine is not merely to eat one food, but to eat the riches of a meal. This may refer to the eating of the rich produce of the good land of Canaan by the children of Israel, Josh. 5.10-12 This indicates that the Lord desires to recover the eating by God's people of the proper food, as ordained by God and typified by the tree of life, the manna, and the produce of the good land, all of which are types of the various aspects of Christ as food to us. The degradation of the church distracts God's people from the eating of Christ as their food to the teaching of doctrines for knowledge. In the church's degradation are the teaching of Balaam, 2.14, the teaching of the Nicolaitans, 2.15, the teaching of Jezebel, 2.20, and the teaching of the deep things of Satan, 2.24. Now the Lord comes in these epistles to recover the proper eating of himself as our food supply. We must eat him not only as the tree of life and the hidden manna, but also as a meal full of his riches. The word for tree here, as in 1 Peter 2.24, is wood in Greek, not the usual word used for tree. In the Bible, the tree of life always refers to Christ as the embodiment of all the riches of God, col. 2.9, for our food, general 2.9. 3.22, 24, Rev. 22 colon 2, 14, 19. Here it refers to the crucified, implied in the tree as a piece of wood one pet. 224, and resurrected, implied in the Zoe life John 11:25, Christ who is in the church today, the consummation of which will be the new Jerusalem, in which the crucified and resurrected Christ will be the tree of life for the enjoyment of all God's redeemed people for eternity. 22 colon 2, 14. It was God's original intention that man should eat of the tree of life, Gen. 2 colon 9, 16. Due to the fall, the tree of life was closed to man, Gen. 3 colon 22 dash 24. Through the redemption of Christ, the way to touch the tree of life, which is God himself in Christ as life to man, has been opened again, Hebrew. 10 colon 19 dash 20. But in the church's degradation, 
religion crept in with its knowledge to distract the believers in Christ from eating him as the tree of life. Hence, the Lord promises to grant the overcomers to eat of himself as the tree of life in the paradise of God as a reward. This is an incentive for them to leave the knowledge of religion and to return to the enjoyment of himself. This promise of the Lord restores the church to God's original intention according to his economy. What the Lord wants the overcomers to do is what the whole church should do in God's economy. Due to the church's degradation, the Lord comes to call the overcomers to replace the church in the accomplishment of God's economy. The eating of the tree of life not only was God's original intention concerning man, but will also be the eternal issue of God's redemption. All his redeemed people will enjoy the tree of life, which is Christ with all the divine riches as their portion for eternity, 22 2, 14, 19. Because of religion's distraction and the church's degradation, the Lord in his wisdom makes the enjoyment of himself in the coming kingdom a reward to encourage his believers to overcome religion's distracting knowledge of teachings and return to the enjoyment of himself as the life supply in the church today for the accomplishment of God's economy. A. In the paradise of God as we have seen, the promise to the overcomers in the church in Ephesus was to eat of the tree of life. The tree of life is in the paradise of God. If we know the Bible, we shall realize that the paradise of God in 2 7 is not the Garden of Eden but the coming New Jerusalem. The paradise in Luke 23 43 is the pleasant and restful place where Abraham and all the dead saints are, Luke 16 23-26. But, as we have pointed out, the paradise of God in this verse is the New Jerusalem, 312. 21-2, 10. 22-1-2, 14, 19, of which the church is a foretaste today, Adam was in the Garden of Eden, and Abraham and all the dead saints are in paradise. We are waiting to enter into another paradise, the paradise of God in the New Jerusalem. As we are waiting for this, we have a miniature of the New Jerusalem today the church life. In the church we enjoy the Lord Jesus as the tree of life. We are enjoying the crucified and resurrected Christ as the tree of life the food supply in our spirit, as a foretaste today in the church. This enjoyment of the foretaste will usher us into the full taste of the crucified and resurrected Christ as the tree of life, our nourishment of life in the new Jerusalem for eternity. The promise of eating the tree of life given to the overcomers in Ephesus indicates that they shall eat Christ in the church life today and eat him as the tree of life in the new Jerusalem for eternity. Our experience confirms this. Strictly speaking, to eat of the tree of life. In the paradise of God in this verse refers to the particular enjoyment of Christ as our life supply in the New Jerusalem in the coming millennial kingdom, because this is a promise of reward made by the Lord to his overcomers. The enjoyment of Christ as the tree of life in the New Jerusalem in the new heaven and new earth will be the common portion of all God's redeemed people, whereas the particular enjoyment of him as the tree of life in the new Jerusalem in the coming millennial kingdom is a reward only to the overcoming believers. If we overcome all distractions in the church's degradation to enjoy Christ as the tree of life in the church today, we shall be thus rewarded. Otherwise, we shall miss this particular enjoyment in the coming kingdom, though we still shall enjoy him as the tree of life in the new Jerusalem in the new heaven and the new earth for eternity. All the Lord's promises concerning the reward and all his predictions concerning the loss at the end of each of the seven epistles refer to his dealing with his believers in the coming millennial kingdom. These promises have nothing to do with eternal destiny eternal salvation or eternal perdition. b. Back to the beginning this matter of eating the tree of life brings us back to the beginning, Gen. 2 9, 16, because at the beginning there was the tree of life. The tree of life always brings us back to the beginning where there is nothing but God himself. There is no work, labor, endurance, or anything else only God himself. In the church life, again and again we need to be brought back to the beginning, forgetting all other things and enjoying God himself as the tree of life. C. Enjoying Christ as the life supply when we are back to the beginning with the tree of life, we enjoy Christ as the life supply. Eating the tree of life that is, enjoying Christ as our life supply, should be the primary matter in the church life. The content of the church life depends upon the enjoyment of Christ. The more we enjoy him, the richer the content will be. 
but to enjoy Christ requires us to love him with the first love. If we leave our first love toward the Lord, we shall miss the enjoyment of Christ and lose the testimony of Jesus. Hence, the lampstand will be removed from us. Loving the Lord, enjoying the Lord, and being the testimony of the Lord go together. If we would be brought back to the beginning, we should forget everything and simply enjoy Christ as the life supply. For this, we must love him above all things, above our work for him and whatever we have for him. By simply loving him, we shall be brought back to the beginning where we care for nothing except God himself as our life supply in the tree of life. This is the proper way to maintain the church life and to be kept in the church life. Here we have the best love, the tree of life as our life supply, and the lampstand with the shining light. How marvelous! The more we love him, the more we have the right to eat of him and to enjoy him as the tree of life. Then, as a result of this, the light of his testimony will shine brightly. Life Study of Revelation Message 11 The Church in Smyrna The Resurrection Life and the Crown of Life The Lord was sovereign in selecting the churches to fulfill his purpose. He chose seven cities in Asia Minor, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. According to the Greek, the name of each city is very meaningful, exactly matching its spiritual significance. As we have pointed out, Ephesus means desirable, indicating that the church in Ephesus was precious to the Lord and desirable in his eyes. In Greek Smyrna means myrrh. Myrrh is a sweet spice which, in figure, signifies suffering. In typology, myrrh signifies the sweet suffering of Christ. Thus, the church in Smyrna was a suffering church, prefiguring the church under the persecution of the Roman Empire from the latter part of the first century to the early part of the fourth century. This persecuted church suffered in the sweetness and fragrance of Christ. In other words, this church was in the tribulation of Jesus and in the fellowship of his sufferings. The church in Smyrna suffered as Christ himself did, having become a continuation of his suffering. In Colossians 1.24 Paul said that he filled up that which is lacking of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body, which is the church. Paul was completing the sufferings of Christ. Although no one can continue Christ's redemption, his sufferings must be completed by all his followers both individually and collectively. In the church in Smyrna we see the collective continuation of the sufferings of Jesus. Because this church was a continuation of Jesus' suffering, it was truly the testimony of Jesus. I. The speaker A. The first and the last let us now consider the speaker to the church in Smyrna. In verse 8 the Lord says, These things says the first and the last, who became dead, and lived again. The Lord told this suffering church that he was the first and the last. This means that no matter how great were the sufferings through which he passed, those sufferings could not terminate or damage him. He was the first and eventually he was also the last. In suffering, the church must know that the Lord is the first and the last, the ever-existing, unchanging one. Whatever the environment may be, he remains the same. Nothing can precede him, nor can anything exist after him. All things are within the limit of his control. When the Lord told the church in Smyrna that he was the first and the last, he was indicating that the church had to be victorious. The church should not be frustrated by any type of suffering. She must pass through all the sufferings and come to the end, because the Lord, who is the life and head of the church, is the first and last. B. The one who became dead and lived again in this verse the Lord also said that he is the one who became dead, and lived again. Lived again means resurrection. The Lord suffered death and lived again. He entered into death, but death could not hold him, Acts 2.24, because he is the resurrection, John 11.25. The suffering church also needs to know him as such a one that she may endure all kinds of suffering. However severe the persecution may be, the church will still be alive, for the resurrection life of Christ within her can endure death. The most suffering or persecution can do is kill us. Following the death from persecution, there is resurrection. Therefore, the Lord seemed to be telling the suffering church, you must realize that I am the one who was persecuted to death. 
but that death was not the end it was the gateway into resurrection. When I entered into death, I came into the threshold of resurrection. Do not be frightened by persecution, nor terrified at the prospect of being killed. You must welcome death and be happy, for once you have passed into death you also will be on the threshold of resurrection. Remember, I am the one who became dead and lived again. Whatever we need, the Lord is. His qualifications exactly match our need. To the suffering church, the Lord is not only the first and the beginning but also the last and the end. Whenever you are undergoing persecution, you must rise up and declare, Hallelujah, I am going to the end, to the last. I am about to enter into the gateway of resurrection. 2. The church is suffering a tribulation in verse 9 the Lord said to the church in Smyrna, I know your tribulation. The content of this epistle is nothing but tribulation, suffering, and persecution. To the church, tribulation is a test of life. The extent to which the church experiences and enjoys the resurrection life of Christ can only be tested by tribulation. Moreover, tribulation also brings in the riches of the resurrection life of Christ. The Lord's purpose in allowing the church to suffer tribulation is not only to testify that his resurrection life overcomes death, but also to enable the church to enter into the riches of his life. Hence, tribulation is precious to the church. b. Poverty, yet being rich, the Lord said, I know your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. The Lord did appraise this suffering church. The suffering church was poor in material things but rich in the Lord with the riches of his life. Thus, the Lord seemed to be saying, You are suffering tribulation and poverty, yet you are rich. You are poor physically, but you are rich spiritually. You are poor in earthly things, but you are rich in heavenly things. Suffering persecution is the means to bring us into the riches of Christ. The more we are persecuted and suffer poverty, the richer we are in Christ. See slander of the unbelieving Jews of the synagogue of Satan in verse 9 the Lord also said that he knew the slander of those who call themselves Jews and are not but are a synagogue of Satan according to this epistle the persecution came from religion from the unbelieving Jews of the synagogue of Satan the slander of the Judaizers toward the suffering church was their evil criticism of her the Judaizers were Jews in flesh but not Jews in spirit Rom. 2.28-29 Merely being the seed of Abraham in the flesh did not constitute them true Jews. Those who are the children of the flesh are not the children of God. Rom 9.7-8 Therefore, the Lord said that they call themselves Jews and are not. These Judaizers stubbornly insisted upon keeping their Judaistic system consisting of the Levitical priesthood, the sacrificial rituals, and the material temple which were all types now fulfilled and replaced by Christ. Since the church under the new covenant in God's economy had no part in their religious practice, the Judaizers slanderously criticized her. In principle, it is the same today in that religious people slander the churches in the Lord's recovery which seek the Lord and follow him in spirit and in life and do not care for any religious system or practice. The Lord said that those who call themselves Jews and are not are a synagogue of Satan. This term, a synagogue of Satan, is a terrible term. A synagogue was a place where the Jews worshipped God mainly by studying their scriptures, the Old Testament. However, due to their stubbornness in clinging to their traditional, religious concepts, they became one with Satan in opposing God's way of life to fulfill his purpose. The synagogue was under the manipulating, maneuvering hand of Satan, for he was the power at the back of the synagogues at that time. The synagogues persecuted the Lord Jesus, Matt 12 colon 9-14. Luke 4 colon 28-29. John 9 22, the Apostles, Acts 6 colon 9. 13 43, 45 to 46, 50. 14 colon 1-2, 19. 17 colon 1, 5 to 6, and the churches, Revelation 3 colon 9. Therefore, the Lord called them the synagogue of Satan. Even when he was on earth, he considered the synagogues to be of Satan, 
as implied in Matthew 12 25 29 and John 8 44. Apparently, they were worshipping God. Actually, they were opposing God. They persecuted and killed God's true worshippers, yet they considered themselves to be offering service to God. John 16 2. When the Lord was on earth, the Jews could not deal with him directly because at that time they did not have the right to kill the Lord Jesus by stoning him. Instead, they utilized the Roman government to sentence him to death and to crucify him. In the same principle, the Jewish synagogue stirred up the Roman government to persecute the suffering church. Through all the centuries since then, religious people have followed in their steps, persecuting the genuine seekers and followers of the Lord in spirit and life while still considering themselves to be defending the interest of God. Religion always utilizes politics to damage the church. Religion has no power to cause physical damage to the Lord's lovers, but it does use politics and the government to damage the church. Roman Catholicism and Protestantism, as well as Judaism, all fall into this category, becoming an organization of Satan as his tool to damage God's economy. D. Imprisonment by the devil in verse 10 the Lord says, Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison that you may be tried. Verse 9 mentions Satan and verse 10 mentions the devil. Satan in Greek means adversary. He is not only the enemy of God from without, but also his adversary from within. The Greek word diabolos, translated devil, means accuser, slanderer, 12 colon 9-10. The devil, who is Satan, the adversary of God, accuses us before God and slanders us before men. The persecution suffered by the church began from the religious synagogue of the Jews instigated by Satan, the adversary. It was consummated by the Roman government used by the devil, the slanderer, to put the saints into prison. The imprisonment of the suffering church was a cooperation of devilish politics with satanic religion. E. Tribulation full yet short in verse 10 the Lord also said that they would have tribulation ten days. Ten is a number for fullness, such as the Ten Commandments, which express God's demand in full, and the tithes of the offerings which show that ten parts constitute the full offering. Ten days in the Bible signify a period of time which is full, yet short, General 24,55, Je 42,7, Dan. 1,12-13. Hence, it signifies that the tribulation of the suffering church was full, yet short. However long the persecution may seem to us, in the eyes of God it is short. It is not a thousand days or even a hundred days but just ten days. Praise the Lord! This suffering is only a temporary suffering. As a sign, these ten days indicate prophetically the ten periods of persecution which the Church suffered under the Roman emperors, beginning with Caesar Nero in the second half of the first century and ending with Constantine the Great in the first part of the fourth century. However severe the persecutions instigated by the devil, Satan, through the Roman Caesars, who did their utmost to destroy and eliminate the church, they were unable to subdue and terminate her. History demonstrates that the church of the living Christ who became dead and lived again withstood the persecutions victoriously and multiplied flourishingly by the indestructible resurrection life. 3. The resurrection life able to endure unto death in verse 10 the Lord also said, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. In this epistle we see some indications that resurrection life is in the church. When the Lord revealed his qualifications in verse 6, saying that he became dead and lived again, he was indicating that his resurrection life is in the church. The Lord seemed to be saying, I, the one who is the resurrection, am living in you. Because you have resurrection life in you, there is no reason or excuse for you to fail. You need not be defeated by persecution. Rather, you must suffer this persecution victoriously by my resurrection life. Because of this resurrection life, the church is able to suffer tribulation even unto death. The church is always qualified to be a marvelous, victorious, and glorious martyr. We all are qualified to be victorious martyrs because we have resurrection life within us. 4. The Spirit speaking even the Lord's word in this epistle to the suffering church is the speaking of the Spirit to all the churches. 
This indicates that all the churches may experience the same suffering. Actually, in all the churches there have been some saints who have undergone the same kind of persecution. They all have had to listen to the speaking of the Spirit to this suffering church. Through the Spirit's speaking again and again, the word of the Lord in this epistle has been for all the saints who have suffered persecution for the Lord's sake throughout the generations. V. The promise to the overcomer A. The crown of life in verse 10 we see the promise to the overcomer the crown of life. Eventually, life will become a crown. It will be the glory of the victorious martyrs. A crown in New Testament usage always denotes a prize in addition to salvation. 3.11 James 1.12 2 Tim 4 colon 8, 1 Pet 5 colon 4, 1 Cor 9 25. The crown of life as a price to those who are faithful unto death in overcoming persecution denotes the overcoming strength which is the power of the resurrection life, philosophy 310. It also signifies that these overcomers have attained to the out-resurrection from among the dead, that is, the outstanding resurrection, Phil. 311, Greek. V. Not hurt of the second death in verse 11 the Lord says, He who overcomes shall by no means be hurt of the second death. To overcome in this epistle means to overcome persecution by being faithful unto death. The promise to the overcomer in this epistle has both a positive side receiving the crown of life and a negative side not being hurt of the second death. Verse 11 has been a great problem to the expositors of the book of Revelation. Due to the fall and the entering in of sin, Every man must die once, Hebrew 9.27. This first death, however, is not the final settlement. All the dead, except those who through faith in the Lord Jesus have been recorded in the Book of Life, will be resurrected and pass through the judgment of the great white throne at the close of the millennium, that is, at the conclusion of the old heaven and the old earth. As a result of this judgment, they will all be cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death as the final settlement, Rev. 20.11-15. The second death is God's dealing with man after man's death and resurrection. Since the overcomers have overcome death through their faithfulness unto death under persecution and have left nothing requiring further dealing by God after their resurrection, they will be rewarded with the crown of life and will not be touched, or hurt, any more by the death after resurrection, which is the second death. Nearly every Christian teacher has a problem here, thinking that after the believers are resurrected there will be no further settlement required of them. Let me ask you this question, if you were to die today, could you say that you have nothing which requires the Lord's further dealing? Probably you cannot say this. This means that if you died today, you would still have something which requires the Lord's further dealing. This does not mean that you would be lost. Nevertheless, this further dealing would not be something positive. It would surely be negative. Every negative thing comes from death. Thus, if you require a further negative dealing, it means that you can still be touched by death. This does not mean that you will perish, but it does indicate that you will suffer something. We must hear the word of the Lord. If we overcome persecution, on the positive side, we shall receive the crown of life and, on the negative side, we shall not be hurt by the second death. We all need to be overcomers. If you are not an overcomer in this age, you will be hurt by the second death in the next age. It is difficult for anyone to say clearly what it means to be hurt by the second death. Nevertheless, one thing is clear, if you do not overcome persecution, something will hurt you. I say again that this does not mean that you will be lost, that you will suffer perdition. No. Every saved one is saved for eternity. John 10 28 and 29 show that no saved one can ever perish again. However, after we have been resurrected, we may suffer some dealing from the Lord. Do not hold to the traditional theology which teaches that after you have been resurrected everything will be all right. After the unbelievers are resurrected, they will be dealt with by God regarding their eternal destiny. In the same principle, after our resurrection, there will still be some dealings from the Lord. It all depends upon how we live and walk today. If we live and walk in an overcoming way, this will indicate that we have overcome death and that nothing remains requiring a further dealing from the Lord. We must take the Lord's clear word. 
Do not accept the teaching which says that if you fail after being saved you will be lost again and perish. This is not true. At the other extreme is the teaching which says that after you have been saved you can have no problems with the Lord. However, a person who has been eternally saved may still need to be dealt with by him. This is the full gospel. The full gospel is the whole New Testament, not just John 3.16. Here in Revelation 2.11 is a portion of the full gospel which says that we must overcome all persecution. If you do not overcome, you will not receive the crown of life. Instead, you will be hurt by the second death. If you do overcome persecution and tribulation by the resurrection life within you, you will receive the crown of life positively and you will not be touched by the second death negatively. This is the Lord's clear promise with his clear word, and we all must take it. Whether we understand it or not, we all must accept the word of the Lord. If you believe John 3.16, then you must believe Revelation 2.11. Both are the Lord's word. I say again that this is the full gospel. This matter has been veiled for a long time, and few Christians dare to touch it. Since they have been unable to understand it, their practice has been always to neglect it, to ignore it. But the Lord will never ignore his word. He will follow through with whatever he says. Therefore, be warned that we must overcome tribulation, suffering, and persecution, that we may receive a crown of life and not be hurt by the second death. If we overcome in this way, we shall have nothing remaining that will require the Lord's further dealing in the future. Life Study of Revelation Message 12 The Church in Pergamos Eating for Transformation In this message we come to the third church, the church in Pergamos. 2.12-17. As we have pointed out, the name of each of the seven cities is very meaningful. In Greek Pergamos means marriage, implying union, and fortified tower. As a sign, the church in Pergamos prefigures the church which entered into a marriage union with the world and became a high fortified tower, equivalent to the great tree prophesied by the Lord in the parable of the mustard seed, Matt. 1331-32. When Satan failed to destroy the church through the persecution of the Roman Empire in the first three centuries, he changed his strategy. He sought instead to corrupt her through Constantine's welcoming her as the state religion in the first part of the fourth century. Through Constantine's encouragement and political influence, multitudes of unbelieving ones were baptized into the church, and the church became monstrously great. Since the church is a spouse to Christ as a chaste bride, her union with the world is considered spiritual fornication in the eyes of God. I. The speaker he who has the sharp two-edged sword verse 12 says, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. In this epistle, the Lord as the speaking spirit declares that he is the one with the sharp two-edged sword. Such a worldly church is qualified to receive the Lord's judgment in his sharp word. 2. The church's marriage to the world in the epistle to the first church the Lord advised the church in Ephesus to repent and to recover her first love. We must believe that his advice was heeded, for the second church, the church in Smyrna, truly loved the Lord and suffered persecution and became a suffering church. According to the facts of history, during the first three centuries, the church suffered a great deal as the Roman government tried its best to damage her. Eventually, the enemy, Satan, realized that persecution did not work very well. Therefore, being the subtle one, he changed his strategy from persecuting the church to welcoming her. In the early part of the 4th century, Constantine the Great accepted Christianity and made it a state religion. From that time onward, Christianity became a type of Roman state church. This welcoming of the church by the Roman Empire ruined her, because it caused the church to become worldly. As we all know, the church has been called out of the world and has been separated from the world to God. However, by being welcomed by the Roman Empire, the church went back to the world and, in the eyes of God, even married the world. God considers this type of worldly union to be spiritual fornication. Due to this marriage, the church lost her purity and became worldly. Because the church had entered into union with the world, many worldly things came into the church. Worldly things are related to idol worship, for worldliness is always associated with idolatry. 
the church in Pergamos firstly became worldly and then idolatrous. Satan saturated her with the world and with idols. As a result, the church became absolutely different from what God intended her to be. God desires a church which is outside of the world, having nothing to do with the world. The church must be a golden lampstand, the pure expression of the triune God, and must have no connections with the world. But after the Roman Empire had made the church a worldly religion, she became altogether impure, worldly, and idolatrous. A. Where Satan dwells in verse 13 the Lord said of the church in Pergamos, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Satan's dwelling place is the world. Since the church has entered into union with the world and has become worldly herself, she now dwells where Satan dwells in the world. B. Where Satan's throne is the church in Pergamos also dwells where Satan's throne is. This also refers to the world. The world is not only Satan's dwelling place, but also the sphere wherein he rules. Now the church is not only one with the world but even one with Satan. This is dreadful. The worldly Christianity of today is still in union with the world and is still being saturated with the thoughts, concepts, theories, and even the practices of Satan. We must see the seriousness of this. The enemy, Satan, is subtle. His welcome is more serious than his persecution. Firstly, Satan stirs up persecution, and then, when this fails, he changes his tactics and welcomes us instead. We have seen this very thing in the past. Firstly, religion persecuted us, and then, changing its strategy, tried to lure us into compromising with it. This is Satan's subtlety. If we are snared by it, we shall eventually become worldly and not only be in union with Satan, but also one with him. The Lord has included the seven epistles in the book of Revelation that we may see the true situation of so-called Christianity and also see where and what the church should be. The church should be a pure golden lampstand outside of the world. The church must have nothing to do with the world and must not yield an inch to Satan's evil and subtle saturation. The church must constantly stand against this. The two meanings of the word Pergamos marriage and fortified tower correspond to two of the parables in Matthew 13, the parable of the great tree, Matt. 13 31 32, and the parable of the leaven, Matt 13 33. In the parable of the great tree, a tiny mustard seed became a tree. This undoubtedly signifies monstrous Christianity for Christianity has certainly become a great tree. In the parable of the leaven, we read of a woman who put leaven into three measures of fine flour. Leaven signifies all the sinful, worldly, evil, satanic, demonic, and devilish things. All these wicked things were put into the fine flour. In the Bible, the fine flour used in the meal offering signifies Christ as food for God's people. The great tree is the equivalent of the high tower, and the woman with the leaven is the equivalent of the apostate church which has married the world. The meaning of the Bible in this matter should be very clear to us all. In the eyes of God, Christendom is a great whore, an evil woman who has mixed worldly, demonic, satanic, and devilish things with the good things of Christ to produce a hellish mixture. We must absolutely abandon this great tree, escape from this high tower, come out of this evil system, and be separated to God returning to his original intention that the church be a pure golden lampstand having nothing to do with worldliness, idolatry, or Satan's saturation. We are not in the place where Satan dwells, in the place where Satan sits on his throne. No, in the church there is no ground for Satan. Here there is no place for Satan to do anything. In the first three epistles we see three churches the desirable church, the persecuted church, and the worldly church. We certainly want to be a desirable church and a persecuted church, but we must refuse to be a worldly church. We must reject anything worldly. Be careful. After the enemy has persecuted you, his strategy may change. Instead of persecution, there might be a welcome. Do not regard this welcome as a good thing. Rather, you must fear being welcomed more than being stung by a scorpion. It is good for us to suffer persecution, opposition, and attack. But whenever people extend us a warm welcome, that is a most dangerous time. 
when you are attacked and are undergoing persecution, do not be discouraged, for that is a strong sign that you are on the right track and that you have not been distracted from following the Lord's steps. But beware of a warm welcome. It is better to suffer persecution than to receive a warm welcome. The epistle to the church in Pergamos teaches us that we should not be in union with the world in any way, sense, or aspect. We must have nothing to do with the world. During the past 50 years, a warm welcome was extended to us quite a number of times in a subtle way, but thank God that we rejected it every time. As a result, throughout the years we have been preserved by being persecuted. We have never received a good name, because Satan will not allow you to have a good name unless you enter into union with him. This is why we in the Lord's recovery are constantly involved in a battle and are continuously attacked. A war is raging all the time. The Lord's recovery is not carrying out a common Christian work. No, this testimony is a warfare. 3. The testimony of Antipas This testimony was with Antipas. In verse 13 the Lord says, You hold fast my name, and you have not denied my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. In Greek, the name Antipas means against all. This faithful witness of the Lord stood against all that the worldly church brought in and practiced. Hence, he became a martyr of the Lord. In Greek the word martyr is the same word as witness. As an anti-witness, Antipas bore an anti-testimony, a testimony against anything that deviated from the testimony of Jesus. It must have been through this anti-testimony that in his day the church in Pergamos still held fast the Lord's name and did not deny the proper Christian faith. Antipas took the lead to fight against the worldly church, pioneering the way for us to fight against the worldly church today. Whatever the worldly church was, had, and did, Antipas fought against it. A. Holding fast the Lord's name in verse 13 the Lord says, You hold fast my name. The Lord's name denotes his person. The person is the reality of the name. The church in Pergamos still held fast the name of the Lord the reality of his person. The deviating tendency of the worldly church is to give up the reality of the Lord's person. But in the Lord's recovery we must fight against this, that the church may hold fast the Lord's name, the reality of the Lord's person, for eternity. b. Not denying the Lord's faith The Lord also said, You have not denied my faith. The faith of the Lord denotes all that we must believe in of his person and work. It is not the subjective faith within us of believing, but the objective faith of the things we believe in. Because the church entered into union with the world, she began to disregard the Lord's name and to deny the proper Christian faith. C. Faithful unto death Antipas was faithful in his anti-testimony, even unto death. Because of his testimony against the worldliness of the church, he was killed and became a martyr. To testify against the worldly church we need the spirit of martyrdom. We need to be faithful for the Lord's testimony against the worldliness of the church even unto death. We have seen that Antipas was an anti-witness and an anti-testimony. Today, we in the Lord's recovery are also an anti-testimony. Ever since Protestant Christianity went to China in 1830, it has been, with some exceptions, rather worldly. Beginning in 1922, the Lord raised up the testimony of the local churches. This testimony did an excellent job for the Lord's recovery. Although many Christians opposed the recovery, they nevertheless were positively influenced by it, and, as a result, they changed in many ways. They would not take the way of the Lord's recovery, but they did feel its influence and they took from us many of our teachings. If you check with the missionaries who were in China between 1922 and 1936, they would tell you that the Lord's recovery exercised a great influence upon Christianity. I was born and raised in Christianity, but I had never heard the word fellowship. But due to the influence of the Lord's recovery, nearly every denomination began to use this word. Formerly, on their bulletin boards they had the words worship time. But because of our influence they changed the words to meeting time. There is a great difference between worship time and meeting time. Under the influence of the Lord's recovery, 
during the past 40 years Christianity in the Far East has become more fundamental and has come back to the Bible. They even use our books as the basis for much of their teaching and preaching. However, some of them dare not admit that they have learned from us. They take the teachings but oppose the way of the Lord's recovery and criticize our testimony. Nevertheless, the Lord has gained something. I have been told that in Taipei the outsiders always purchase a good quantity of books from our book room. A certain missionary was giving a report about Taiwan. When he was asked about our work on that island, he said that, except for a dead fly in the ointment, it was a good work. Do you know what that dead fly was? It was the church ground. According to his concept, if we would drop the church ground, our ointment would be purified. But he did not realize that for us to drop the church ground is to drop our life. Three years ago, during a visit to Taipei, I met a Christian of high social standing. He said that one preacher had told him that they cannot understand why there is always so much new light in the churches. The reason is that the Spirit is speaking to the churches. The light is neither on the street nor in the outer court. It is in the holy place, that is, in the church. This is why we always have something fresh from the Lord. We are here for all Christians. Thirteen years ago I had a talk with the brothers in Los Angeles about the human spirit, the church practice, and mingling. I said, brothers, wait for a period of time and you will see that the outsiders will begin to use these terms. This is exactly what has happened. Some of the things we have been preaching and teaching have been taken up by others. On the one hand, they oppose us, but, on the other hand, they secretly use our materials. I know of a certain preacher who openly opposes me, yet he teaches people from the book, The Economy of God. During a visit to Tyler, Texas, I gave a series of messages on transformation. One of the attendants, who took notes on every message, was a noted preacher in South America. At the end of the conference he asked for permission to use some articles from our stream magazine. I granted him this permission. After several months, I returned to Tyler and was greeted by a brother who said, Here is a book by Witness Lee. As I looked at that book, I did not see the name Witness Lee. Rather, I saw the name of that preacher who had attended our conference and had taken notes on all the messages. He had gone to another place, had delivered the messages, and then had them published as a book, under his name. What should we say about this? As long as God's people are helped, we do not care about it. However, we are not standing here for this help we are standing here for the testimony of Jesus. We must be today's Antipas. 4. The teaching of Balaam in verse 14 the Lord says, But I have a few things against you, because you have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat idol sacrifices and to commit fornication. In these epistles, the Lord desires, according to God's economy, that we should eat him as the tree of life, 2 7, the hidden manna, 2 17, and the rich produce of the good land, 3 20. But the worldly church turned from life to mere teachings, thus distracting the believers from the enjoyment of Christ as their life supply for fulfillment of God's purpose. The enjoyment of Christ builds up the church, whereas the teachings issue in a religion. This verse mentions the teaching of Balaam. Balaam was a Gentile prophet who caused God's people to stumble. For the sake of reward, 2 Pet 2.15 Jude 11, he brought fornication and idolatry to God's people, number 25 1-3, 31-16. In the worldly church, some began to teach the same things. Today, in Protestantism as well as in Catholicism, the same teaching prevails. Idolatry always brings in fornication, number 35 colon 1-3. Acts 15:29. When the worldly church disregarded the name, the person, of the Lord, she turned to idolatry, which issued in fornication. In today's Christendom, many of the hired preachers do not teach people to take Christ as their life supply. Rather, they subtly teach people to eat idol sacrifices, that is, to take in evil, devilish, and demonic things. 
These teachings cause people to deviate from the person of Christ, leading them into spiritual fornication. Christ should be the unique husband to the church, the unique bridegroom to all the saints. But so many teachings in today's Christianity cause people to take in the demonic things and to be related to things other than Christ. This indeed is to eat idol sacrifices and to commit fornication. What does it mean to deny the Lord's name and to deny the faith of the Lord? As we have seen, faith here does not denote the subjective faith, the believing ability. It denotes the objective faith, the items in which we believe. The faith of the Lord includes what he has done for us in his redemptive work, his death and resurrection, and all the items which we must believe in order to be saved. These things constitute our faith. The name denotes the Lord's person. We should neither deny the name nor the faith of the Lord. We must always hold on to his name and believe in him. When I was young, I was baptized in a Chinese Presbyterian church where there were some bombs. On a particular Sunday morning, one of these Balaams delivered a lecture on sanitary education, talking specifically on how to kill flies. Later, someone proposed that a particular object be set up in the church building and that everyone in the congregation bow down to it. When some of us opposed this, that Balaam said, even if Jesus Christ would rise up from the tomb and tell me not to bow down to this object, I would still do it. By this remark he revealed that he did not believe in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. This is an example of denying the Lord's person and of denying our faith in him. If you read history and study today's Christianity, you will discover many things like this. In many so-called churches modernism is prevailing. The modernists do not believe that Jesus is God, that he was born of a virgin, or that he died on the cross for our redemption. They merely believe that he was crucified as a martyr, and they do not believe that Jesus Christ was resurrected. The teachings of Balaam always cause people to enter into union with the worldly things. This is to eat idol sacrifices and to commit spiritual fornication. V. The teaching of the Nicolaitans in verse 15 the Lord says, Thus you also have those who hold in like manner the teaching of the Nicolaitans. The worldly and degraded church holds not only the teaching of Balaam, but also the teaching of the Nicolaitans. The teaching of Balaam distracts believers from the person of Christ to idolatry and from the enjoyment of Christ to spiritual fornication, whereas the teaching of the Nicolaitans destroys the function of believers as members of the body of Christ, thus annulling the Lord's body in expressing him. The former teaching disregards the head, and the latter destroys the body. This is the subtlety of the enemy in all religious teachings. In the church in Ephesus only the works of the Nicolaitans were found. 2 6, whereas in the church in Pergamos their works progressed into a teaching. Firstly, they practiced the hierarchy in the initial church. Now they taught it in the degraded church. Today, in both Catholicism and Protestantism, this Nicolaitan hierarchy prevails in both practice and teaching. The Lord hates the Nicolaitan hierarchy because it kills the function of the members of the body and builds up an organization in place of an organism. Consider the situation of today's Christianity, there is no organism. Rather, there is a strong organization. This hierarchy is evil and satanic, and the Lord hates it. In arranging the services of the church, we must be careful not to build up an organization. If we would have the proper church life, we must develop the function of all the members, encouraging them to function according to life in a living way that the body might be built up as an organism. This vision must govern the church life, and we must never stray from it. However, if we are even a little negligent, we shall leave the organism and return to organization. Always be on the alert against the formation of any type of organization. We must come back to the organism that all the members of the body may have the opportunity to function. 6. The coming and warring of the Lord in verse 16 the Lord says, Repent therefore. But if not, I come to you quickly, and I will war with them with the sword of my mouth. Here the Lord says that he will come quickly and war with the sword of his mouth against some in this worldly church. This should not refer to the Lord's coming back, but to his coming to war with the Nicolaitan teachers in the degraded church with the slaying word out of his mouth. The worldly church, signified by the church in Pergamos, issues in the Roman Catholic Church, 
signified by the church in Thyatira, and the worldliness and evil brought in by this degraded church will continue in the Roman Catholic Church until the Lord comes back to exercise his full judgment. 7. The Spirit speaking the degraded worldly church has a great need for the speaking of the Spirit. It has the Bible in dead letters, but it lacks the speaking of the Spirit. Mere Bible knowledge without the Spirit's speaking cannot supply what is needed to a deadened Christianity. Its deadness and its degradation must be judged by the sharp sword out of the Lord's mouth. The worldly church needs the sharp speaking with the living word by the Lord's Spirit. 8. The promise to the overcomer in verse 17 the Lord says, To him who overcomes, to him I will give of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows but he who receives it. To overcome here means specifically to overcome the church's union with the world the teaching of idolatry and fornication, and the teaching of the hierarchy. a. To eat the hidden manna the Lord promises to give of the hidden manna to the overcomer. The promise to the first church concerned the eating of the tree of life, and the promise to this church concerns the eating of the hidden manna. The worldlier the church becomes, the greater is the need for some to stand up and testify and to maintain intimate fellowship with the Lord. These will be privileged to enjoy the Lord as the hidden manna. Manna is a type of Christ as the heavenly food enabling God's people to go his way. A portion of that manna was preserved in a golden pot concealed in the ark, Exo. 1632-34, Hebrew 9,4. The open manna was for the enjoyment of the Lord's people in a public way. The hidden manna, signifying the hidden Christ, is a special portion reserved for his overcoming seekers who overcome the degradation of the worldly church. While the church goes the way of the world, these overcomers come forward to abide in the presence of God in the Holy of Holies, where they enjoy the hidden Christ as a special portion for their daily supply. This promise is fulfilled today in the proper church life and will be fulfilled in full in the coming kingdom. If we seek the Lord, overcome the degradation of the worldly church, and enjoy a special portion of the Lord today, He, as the hidden manna, will be a reward to us in the coming kingdom. If we miss him as our special portion today in the church life, we shall surely lose the enjoyment of him as a reward in the coming kingdom. The hidden manna was placed in a golden pot. Gold signifies God's divine nature. Thus, placing the hidden manna in the golden pot signifies that the hidden Christ is concealed in the divine nature. The open manna is for all the people of God, but the hidden manna is for those who are intimate with the Lord those who have forsaken the world and every separation between them and God. They come into the very intimacy of God's presence and here in this divine intimacy they enjoy the hidden manna in God's divine nature. This is deep. It is not outward. It is absolutely inward. It is so inward that those who eat of the hidden manna are actually in the divine nature enjoying the hidden Christ. How can we eat the hidden manna? This is something absolutely outside of the world. While the worldly church is going down into union with the world, we are coming up from Egypt to the wilderness, from the wilderness to the good land, from the good land to the tabernacle, from the outer court to the holy place, from the holy place to the holy of holies. After we have entered into the holy of holies, we must still dive into the ark, touch the golden pot, and enjoy Christ as the manna hidden there. The more the church becomes worldly, the more we need to enter into the Holy of Holies to eat the hidden manna. The manna is in the golden pot, the golden pot is in the ark, and the ark is in the Holy of Holies. By this we can see how inward it is. If we would enjoy it, we must abide in the deep intimacy of God's presence. We must be in His divine nature where there is nothing worldly or distracting and where there is the intimate fellowship between us and God. Here we enjoy Christ as the hidden manna. Some of us have had this experience of the hidden Christ. We have said, Lord, I don't care for the world. I only care for you, Lord, not for any human relationship or friendship. Lord, I am willing to drop every tie. Lord, now I'm thoroughly free, and I love you from the depths of my being. I love you without anything frustrating me. When we say this to the Lord, we are immediately in the golden pot in the intimacy of the divine nature, partaking of the hidden Christ. Oh, we must eat such a Christ. 
This promise of eating the hidden manna is also prophecy. In the millennium some overcomers will have a special portion of Christ for their enjoyment. That special portion is what is promised here as the hidden manna. However, in principle, even today we can enjoy Christ in such an intimate and hidden way. We enjoy Christ in a way in which those who only enjoy the open manna cannot understand. B. To receive a white stone with a new name written on it the Lord also promised the overcomer, saying, I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows but he who receives it. Enjoying Christ as the hidden manna produces transformation. How can we say this? Because after referring to the hidden manna, the Lord speaks of a white stone. A stone in the Bible signifies material for God's building. Man was not made with stone but with dust, General 2 7. In a sense, man is just clay, and Romans 9 reveals that man is simply a clay vessel. However, when the Lord first met Simon Peter, he immediately changed his name from Simon to Cephas which means a stone, John 1.42. Recall Jacob's dream in Genesis 28. When he awoke from that dream, he took the stone which he had used for a pillow and called it the house of God. In 1 Corinthians 3 Paul indicates that precious stones are to be used for the building of the church, and in Revelation 21 we see that precious stones are materials in the New Jerusalem. As we put all these verses together, we see that a stone signifies a transformed person. We cannot understand a verse like 2.17 by itself. We must consider it in the context of the whole Bible. The Lord promises the overcomer to eat of the hidden manna and to give him a white stone. This indicates that if we eat the hidden manna, we shall be transformed into white stones. In our natural being we are not stones, but clay. Because we have received the divine life with its divine nature through regeneration, we can be transformed into stones even precious stones, by enjoying Christ as our life supply, 2 COR 318. By eating Jesus as the hidden manna we shall be transformed into white stones for God's building. If we do not follow the worldly church, but enjoy the Lord in the proper church life, we shall be transformed into stones for the building of God. These stones will be justified and approved by the Lord, as indicated by the color white, while the worldly church will be condemned and rejected by him. In the book of Revelation the color white denotes approval. When we are transformed into a stone, we shall be approved by the Lord. This will make him very happy. The white stone is for God's building. God's building, the building of the church, depends upon our transformation, and our transformation issues from the enjoyment of Christ as our life supply. The Lord said that on the stone would be a new name written, which no one knows but he who receives it. A name designates a person, and the new name here is the designation of a transformed person. Every transformed believer as a white stone bears a new name, which no one knows but he who receives it. Such a new name is the interpretation of the experience of the one being transformed. Hence, only he himself knows the meaning of that name. A certain brother may still be quite muddy. Nevertheless, he loves the Lord, has forsaken the world, and has given up every separation. Thus, the Lord would say to him, I shall give you to eat of the hidden manna. The more this brother eats the hidden manna, the more he will be transformed into a white stone. As this brother eats the Lord Jesus as the hidden manna, he will have certain experiences and the Lord will write a new name upon him. This new name is simply the new designation of what this brother is. Since this new name is based upon what this brother is according to his experiences, others cannot know what it is. Revelation 2.17 is a word spoken by the Lord to us. Do not take it objectively but as your biography. Consider it as a word for you. In a sense, we are living in the age of Pergamos, for the so-called church has become worldly. But, being an anti-witness, we are here fighting for the Lord's recovery. Therefore, the Lord gives us this word in verse 17, and we all need to understand it and say, Amen, Lord. Thank you for this promise. I may eat of you as the hidden manna, and this eating will transform me from clay into a stone which will please you, be approved by you, and be used by you for the building up of your dwelling place. Lord, 
I agree with your promise. From now on, I shall eat you in a hidden way and be transformed to become a white stone for your building. Is this not a wonderful promise from the Lord? Yes, the church may become worldly, but the Lord has promised that we may become a white stone for God's building. Life Study of Revelation Message 13 The Church in Thyatira Authority and Morning Star In this message we come to the fourth church, the church in Thyatira, 2.18-29, the church in apostasy. Thyatira in Greek means sacrifice of perfume, or, unceasing sacrifice. As a sign, the church in Thyatira prefigures the Roman Catholic Church, which was fully formed as the apostate church by the establishment of the universal papal system in the latter part of the 6th century. This apostate church is full of sacrifices, as demonstrated in her unceasing mass. I. The Speaker A. The Son of God verse 18 says, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes as a flame of fire, and his feet like shining brass. The apostate Catholic Church strongly emphasizes Christ as the Son of Mary. Thus, here, the Lord, protesting against the apostasy of the Catholic Church, says that he is the Son of God. B. Who has eyes as a flame of fire and whose feet are like shining brass in dealing with the worldly church, the church in Pergamos, the Lord referred to himself as the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. In dealing with this apostate church, the church in Thyatira, he refers to himself as the one who has eyes as a flame of fire, and feet like shining brass. The worldly church requires the dealing of his smiting and killing word, whereas the apostate church needs the judging of his searching eyes and treading feet. The Lord's eyes search the inward parts and the heart, and his feet judge and give to everyone according to his works. 2.23 2. The church's virtues in verse 19 the Lord says, I know your works and love and faith and service and your endurance, and that your last works are more than the first. The apostate Catholic Church has many works and services. Her works in the last days are more than in the past. 3. The woman Jezebel One of the crucial points in the epistle to the church in Thyatira concerns the woman Jezebel. The Lord refers to her in verse 20, where he says, But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my slaves astray to commit fornication and to eat idol sacrifices. As we shall see, the woman here is the very woman prophesied by the Lord in Matthew 13:33, who added leaven, signifying evil, heretical, and pagan things, into the fine flour, signifying Christ as the meal offering for the satisfaction of God and man. This woman is also the great prostitute of Revelation 17 who mixes abominations with the divine things. The pagan wife of Ahab, Jezebel, was a type of this apostate church. The apostate church is filled with all manner of fornication and idolatry, both spiritual and physical. A. Calling herself a prophetess here the Lord indicates that the apostate church is a self-appointed prophetess. A prophet is one who speaks for God with God's authorization. The apostate Catholic Church presumes to be authorized by God to speak for God. She demands that people listen to her rather than to God. b. Teaching and leading the Lord's slaves to commit fornication and to eat idol sacrifices The church in Pergamos had the teachings of Balaam and of the Nicolaitans, and these are continued in this apostate church. Furthermore, the Catholic Church herself teaches, causing her people to listen to her rather than to the Holy Word of God. Her adherents are all drugged by her heretical, religious teaching, not caring for Christ as their life and life supply, as indicated by the tree of life and hidden manna promised by the Lord to the churches in Ephesus and Pergamos, 2 colon 7, 17. Matthew 13 33 says, Another parable he spoke to them, The kingdom of the heavens is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal until the whole was leavened. The sound teachers of the Bible agree that the Jezebel in Revelation 2 is undoubtedly the woman prophesied by the Lord in Matthew 13:33. These two women actually are one. The great harlot in Revelation 17 is also the same woman. Thus, the woman in Matthew 13 is the Jezebel in Revelation 2, and Jezebel becomes the great harlot who is called the great Babylon in Revelation 17. If she is not the harlot, then who is? 
The Jezebel in the Old Testament was a prefigure of the woman Jezebel in Revelation 2. When the Lord spoke to the church in Thyatira, he said that there was a present-day Jezebel. According to history, this present-day Jezebel undoubtedly is the apostate church, the Roman Catholic Church. In using the name Jezebel, the Lord was reminding us of what Jezebel, the wife of Ahab, did. She came from a heathen background and brought pagan things into the worship of God by his people. This is the crucial and most central point in the epistle to Thyatira. The principle of the deeds of the apostate church is to mix the heathen, pagan things with the worship of God by his people. She helps God's people to worship him, but she does not do so in God's way. She does it in her own pagan, heathen way. Ever since the apostate church began, she has been absorbing paganism. Wherever she goes, she assimilates things related to the worship of idols. One of the most striking examples of the deeds of this apostate church is the so-called Christmas. We want Christ, but we do not need a Mass. Originally, December 25th, the so-called Christmas Day, was the day the ancient Europeans worshipped the sun. They said that December 25th was the birthday of the sun. When the apostate church spread to Europe, she assimilated this ancient custom because she had taken in thousands of unbelievers into the church. These unbelievers still wanted to celebrate the birthday of their God. Therefore, to accommodate them, the apostate church declared December 25th to be the birthday of Christ. This is the source of Christmas. The book, The Two Babylons, exposes the origin of the evil, demonic, pagan things that were brought into the apostate church. If we see this picture on the negative side, then we shall know what we must be on the positive side. From the very beginning of the Bible, God's intention has been to feed his people with the life supply. Thus, in the garden there was the tree of life as the life supply. After man's fall, God, in his redemption, did not give up this thought of feeding his people. When he instituted the Passover, God commanded his people to strike the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and, under the covering of the blood, to eat the meat of the lamb. After the children of Israel had been delivered from Egypt and were traveling through the wilderness, God gave them heavenly manna as their life supply, Exo. 16.14-15 Eventually, the children of Israel entered into the good land of Canaan. On the day they entered into the land, the manna ceased and they began to eat the rich produce of the land, Josh 5.12. The New Testament confirms that all these are types of Christ, not only as our Redeemer but also as our life supply. As the Lamb, Christ has two elements the blood for redeeming and the meat for feeding. In John 6 the Lord Jesus revealed that he is the heavenly manna on whom God's people may feed. We know that the rich produce of the land signifies the riches of Christ. Christ is not only our lamb and our manna. He is also our good land. As the lamb, he has the meat, and as the good land, he has all the riches for our life supply. In the Old Testament there were also the offerings which came from the produce of the good land. Among the five main offerings, the second was the meal offering which was for the feeding of God's people. All the serving priests fed upon the meal offering. This signifies that Christ is the life supply for God's priests. All God's serving ones should feed on Christ. Although this is clear in the Holy Word, most Christians have missed it. When I was in Christianity, I never heard a message telling me how to eat Christ. Nevertheless, the crucial point in the Holy Word is that Christ is our life supply and that we must eat him, John 6:57. In Matthew 13:33, the Lord indicated that he was the fine flour. His word regarding the meal, or fine flour, in this verse refers to the meal offering which was primarily composed of fine flour. Hence, the fine flour is a full and complete type of the Lord Jesus as our life supply. As the meal offering, Christ in his humanity is the fine flour for our food. In Matthew 13 the Lord Jesus predicted that an evil woman would add leaven to this fine flour. This is exactly what the apostate church does, taking in the pagan leaven and adding it to the fine flour of Christ to form an evil mixture. In this, the apostate church is very evil and subtle. Some in the apostate church would say, don't you think we have something real? 
Don't you think we have God, Christ, and the Bible? Yes, they do, but it is not pure. It is a mixture. The apostate church has the fine flour, but within the flour there is leaven. When I was in Manila, I visited a Catholic cathedral. At the entrance of this cathedral was a statue of Mary. Noticing that one of the hands of the statue was almost completely worn out, I asked the people what had happened. They said that everyone who entered the cathedral firstly touched the hand of the statue and that, through the years, this had worn out the hand. When I asked them about the need for such a statue, they said, if people do not have statues, they cannot understand what you are saying when you talk about the Bible. They need something solid to grasp. This is their justification for having statues of Jesus and Mary. What subtlety! That is not Jesus or Mary that is an idol. Apparently, they worship Jesus. Actually, they worship an image of stone. This is the subtlety of the enemy. Now we can see the evil of the apostate church it absorbs pagan things and adds them to the fine flour. How wicked this is! Due to this evil mixture, there is much idol worship in the apostate church. The Lord said that Jezebel teaches people to commit fornication and to eat idol sacrifices. Jezebel teaches her people to worship idols. In the Roman Catholic Church the worship of idols is taught. In Manila, I saw many people purchasing candles at the candle counter and placing them before the images and idols on the walls. Wherever there is idolatry, there is also fornication. Jezebel not only brought in paganism and idolatry. She also brought in fornication. This is abominable, and we cannot tolerate it. It is not a matter of doctrinal debate it is a matter of idolatry and fornication. In 1937, when I was traveling in North China, a case of demon possession was brought to my attention. A certain Christian sister had become possessed. When I was asked the reason for this, I said that, in principle, either sin or some idols or images in that sister's home would give ground for the demon to possess her. I was told that there were no idols or images in her home. Nevertheless, the demon came again and again to trouble her. I told her that since she was not involved in anything sinful, there must be some sort of idol or image in her home and that she should search thoroughly for it. Eventually, I learned that on her wall was a picture of the so-called Jesus, and I told her to burn it. From the moment she burned that picture, the demon departed. In this, we see the subtlety of the enemy. See. Not willing to repent of her fornication in verse 21 the Lord Jesus said, I gave her time that she might repent, and she is not willing to repent of her fornication. History proves that this is true of the apostate Catholic Church. Even up to this day, she will not repent of her evil deeds. D. Sick in bed the Lord also said, Behold, I will cast her into a bed. A bed is normally used for sleep and rest, and abnormally for sickness. The Lord indicates here that the apostate church is incurably sick and will remain so until her final judgment. Jezebel's evils have made her sick. She is not at all healthy. The entire apostate church is in a sick condition. Look at her situation, some things are heavenly and others are earthly. Some things are of God and more things are of Satan. Some things are holy and other things are secular, common, and worldly. This leaven is not only in that apostate church, but has spread into the so-called reformed church. Jezebel is demonic, satanic, devilish, and even hellish. It is not a small thing for us to have our eyes open to see the devilish and demonic things in the Catholic Church. We simply cannot imagine how deplorable this apostate church is. E. Her lovers suffering great tribulation in verse 22 The Lord not only said that he would cast Jezebel into a bed but also those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works. The great tribulation here is different from that in 7.14 and from the great tribulation in Matthew 24.21. The great tribulation in 7.14 is the tribulation which the church suffers throughout the centuries of persecution. The one in Matthew 24,21 is the great tribulation in the last three and a half years of the age which will fall upon all the dwellers of the earth. But the great tribulation here is the affliction which the Lord will cause the apostate church to suffer, 
probably through the attacks of the Antichrist on her at the end of this age. F. Her children being killed with death in verse 23 the Lord said, and I will kill her children with death. This may refer to God's destroying the Roman Catholic Church through the Antichrist and his followers at the end of this age. If we read Revelation carefully, we shall see that at the end of this age the Antichrist will damage the Catholic Church. The Antichrist will rebel against every religion, set himself up as God, 2 Thess. 2 colon 4, forbid the Jews and the Catholics to worship their God, and compel people to worship him. At that time, he will persecute the Jews and kill many of those in the Catholic Church. 4. The deep things of Satan verse 24 says, But I say to you, the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they say, I place no other burden upon you. Deep things means depths as in Ephesians 3.18. It figuratively denotes mysterious things. The Roman Catholic Church has many mysteries or deep doctrines. Against the suffering church there was the synagogue of Satan, 2.9. With the worldly church there was the throne of Satan, 2.13. And within the apostate church there are the deep things of Satan. The religion of the synagogue, the world under Satan's throne, and the philosophy of the satanic mysteries are all used by Satan to damage and corrupt the church. We have seen that the church suffered persecution from the synagogue of Satan and that she eventually became worldly, dwelling in the place where Satan dwells and where his throne is. All this is the subtlety of the enemy. It all originates with Satan. But here in the fourth church there is something more serious than this. It is not merely a matter of the synagogue of Satan, the place where Satan dwells, or where Satan's throne is. Now Satan has come into the church and has saturated the church with himself. In the apostate church are the deep things of Satan, the mysterious teachings of Satan. This is the satanic philosophy. The apostate church does teach the satanic mysteries. This indicates that the deep thought of Satan, Satan's concept, has saturated the apostate church. Eventually, this church becomes the embodiment of Satan. The proper church is the body of Christ, but the apostate church is the embodiment of Satan. Christ indwells the church, but Satan indwells the apostate church in a subtle way. Satan always acts in a subtle way. When he first came to man, he came in the form of a beautiful serpent. Yet that was not merely a serpent it was Satan. Satan always takes on a good form. No one would imagine that Satan could put on the church as his form. But in the epistle to the church in Thyatira we see that this is the real situation of today's Christendom. Christendom has become an organ of Satan. Although it has the name Christ in it, actually within it there is Satan himself. We all must see this. The deep things of Satan, being the satanic philosophy, are subtle. In the apostate church there are many so-called mysteries. All the mysteries taught by this evil church are satanic philosophies. One of their philosophies is that if you do not add things to the truths of the Bible, it will be difficult for people to accept them. The Lord, being wise, likened this to the leaven put into the fine flour that makes the bread easy to eat. The apostate church says that if people do not have a Christmas, it will be difficult for them to accept the truth regarding the birth of Christ. The Mass is the leaven added to the fine flour. This is subtle and evil. If you think that it is too strong to say that this evil woman is the embodiment of Satan, I would ask you to consider Revelation 17 colon 4 and 5. Verse 4 says, And the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet, and gilded with gold and precious stones and pearls having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the unclean things of her fornication. This evil woman does have a good appearance, she is gilded with gold, precious stones, and pearls, the very materials with which the New Jerusalem is built. While the New Jerusalem is solidly built with these three precious materials, this evil woman is merely gilded with them. To be gilded means to wear a facade, to be superficially attractive, to have a pleasing or showy appearance that conceals something evil. Her appearance is attractive outwardly, but she is detestable inwardly. This woman also has a golden cup full of abominations and the unclean things of her fornication. In typology, gold signifies the divine nature. 
Apparently, this evil woman holds something of God, but actually she is inwardly full of abominations. In the Bible abomination mainly denotes two things idolatry and fornication. These two things are abominations in the eyes of God. Apparently, this woman is very attractive, being gilded with gold, pearls, and precious stones and holding a golden cup. If you have no insight, you will be cheated by her. But we must have the insight to see through her. When we see what this woman is inwardly, we realize that she is filled with abominations and filthiness. Verse 5 says, And upon her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of the prostitutes and the abominations of the earth. The Lord searches the hearts of people and knows what is within them. He has insight and sees inside this evil woman. The Lord calls her, the mother of the prostitutes, meaning that she is the source of all spiritual fornication. Therefore, it is fair to say that she is the embodiment of Satan. We need the insight to see through her outward appearance. This is why we have the two-edged sharp sword, the word of the Holy Bible. We thank the Lord for his sovereign grace. Because his grace is sovereign, he can save us in any environment. Many have been saved even in the evil environment of the apostate Catholic Church. No one can say that the Catholic Church does not preach the Bible. In China, many heathen Chinese learn the name of God the name of Jesus, and a few verses from the Bible through the teaching of the Catholic Church. The evil thing, however, is this, after people are helped by this apostate church, they are frustrated from going on to know the Lord in a genuine way. Some who, through the Lord's sovereign grace, were saved when they were in the apostate church spontaneously loved that evil thing. Many of them would say, if this is evil, then how could I have been saved through it? Therefore, although many former Catholics have come into the church life, deep within, some of them may still sympathize with this evil woman. They do not hate her as the Lord does. Read the epistle to Thyatira once again. The Lord has no sympathy with Jezebel because that evil woman has been thoroughly saturated with Satan, the evil one. Satan is in every fiber of that wicked woman. We should have nothing to do with this apostate church. It is not the body of Christ. It is not the church of God it is the embodiment of Satan. It is subtle and evil. If you would see even more about the apostate church, read Brother Nay's book, The Orthodoxy of the Church. Anyone who has a heart for the Lord and for his recovery must thoroughly know this apostate church. Once we know her, we would not appreciate anything related to her. Rather, we must declare that she is the great harlot the great Babylon, and that we must desert her. As we shall see, the book of Revelation indicates that this great harlot has some daughters. We must be thoroughly enlightened about the apostate church. Once we are enlightened, we shall know where we must be as far as the church is concerned. We are in the Lord's recovery. We are in the body of Christ, the church of God, and we have nothing to do with Jezebel, the evil woman, the harlot the great Babylon. And we have nothing to do with her daughters. In this epistle the Lord indicates that he will judge Jezebel. In 1716 we are told that during the great tribulation the Lord will allow the Antichrist to kill and to damage this apostate church. At that time, religious Babylon will be torn down. But before that time, this apostate church will go on according to prophecy. Verse 25 indicates that the apostate Catholic Church will remain until the Lord comes back. V. The overcomers the rest in Thyatira in verse 26 the Lord says, And he who overcomes, and he who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. To overcome here means to overcome Catholicism. The overcomers, the rest in Thyatira, do not have Jezebel's teaching. V. 24 have not known the deep things of Satan, hold fast the Lord's testimony until he comes, v. 25, and keep the Lord's works until the end, v. 26. My works in verse 26 refers to the things the Lord has accomplished and is doing, such as his crucifixion, resurrection, intercession, etc. In contrast to the works of the apostate church under the influence of Satan. 6. The promise to the overcomer a. 
To receive authority over the nations in verse 26 the Lord says that to the one who overcomes he will give authority over the nations. This is a price to the overcomers of reigning with Christ over the nations in the millennial kingdom, 20 colon 4, 6. This promise of the Lord strongly implies that those who do not answer his call to overcome degraded Christianity will not participate in the reign of the millennial kingdom. b. To shepherd the nations with an iron rod as the Lord has received from the Father in verse 27 the Lord says, speaking of the overcomer, and he will shepherd them with an iron rod, as vessels of pottery are broken in pieces, as I also have received from my Father. In the millennial kingdom, the ruler is a shepherd. In Psalm 2 9, God gave Christ authority to rule over the nations. Here, Christ gives the same authority to his overcomers. C. To have the morning star finally, in verse 28 the Lord gives a promise to the overcomer, saying, I will give him the morning star. At Christ's first appearing, the wise men, not the Jewish religionists, saw his star, Matt. 2 2, 9 to 10. At his second appearing, he will be the morning star to his overcomers who watch for his coming. To all the others, he will appear only as the sun, Mal 4 2. 7. The Spirit speaking once again, in verse 29, the Lord says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All those in the apostate church, which demands that people listen to her rather than to God, need more of the speaking of the Spirit. If anyone listens to the speaking of the Spirit, he will hear the living word of the Lord to deny all the apostate items taught by the apostate church and become an overcomer for the satisfaction of the Lord. At the end of each of the first three epistles, the ear for hearing is mentioned first, and then the call for overcoming. At the end of each of the last four epistles, the order is reversed. This proves that the first three of the seven churches are one group and the last four are another. The number 7 in the Bible is composed either of 6 plus 1, such as 6 days plus 1 day equaling 1 week, or 3 plus 4, as in these two chapters where the seven churches are divided into one group of 3 and another group of 4. 6 plus 1 is in God's creation, whereas 3 plus 4 is in God's new creation, the church. Since all things were created in 6 days, the number 6 signifies the creation, especially man who was created on the sixth day. And since the seventh day was the conclusion of the six days as the one day of God's rest, the number one signifies the unique creator. Hence, six plus one means that all things were created unto God for the accomplishment of his purpose. The unique creator, God, is triune, as signified by the number three. Since the creation is represented before God by four living creatures, four colon six dash nine, the number 4 signifies creatures, especially man. Hence, 3 plus 4 means that God is added to his creature, man, and thus his purpose is being accomplished. The church is not only the creature, but the creature with the creator, the triune God, dispensed into her. She is the real number 7. The real 3, the triune God, added to the real 4, the created man. Therefore, the number 7 denotes the completion in God's move, firstly in the old creation, and then in the new creation, the church. Life study of Revelation message 14 The church in Sardis white garment and name confessed by the Lord It is truly sovereign of the Lord that the situation and condition of the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3 match the stages of church history. The history of the church from the first century to the present is clearly divided into seven stages, the initial stage the suffering stage, the worldly stage, the apostate stage, the stage of reformation, the stage of the recovered church, and the stage of the degradation of the recovered church. In this message we must consider the church in Sardis, the church in reformation, 3 colon 1-6. Sardis in Greek means the remains, the remainder, or the restoration. As a sign, the church in Sardis prefigures the Protestant church from the time of the Reformation to the second coming of Christ. The Reformation was God's reaction to the apostate Roman Catholic Church, signified by the degraded church in Thyatira. It was accomplished by a minority of the believers, the remainder. Hence, it was the restoration by the remainder. I. 
the speaker he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars and three colon one the Lord says, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. The seven spirits of God are for the church to be living intensely, and the seven stars are for her to be shining intensely. To the church in Ephesus, Christ is the one who holds the seven stars and walks in the midst of the seven lampstands. The initial church needed the care of Christ, and her leaders needed his keeping grace. To the church in Smyrna, he is the one who became dead and lived again. The suffering church needed the resurrection life of Christ. To the church in Pergamos, Christ is the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. The degraded, worldly church needed his judging and slaying word. To the church in Thyatira, he is the one who has eyes like flaming fire and feet like shining brass. The apostate church needed his searching and judging. Now to the church in Sardis, he is the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. The dead reformed church needs the sevenfold intensified spirit of God and the shining leaders. If we examine the situation of Protestant Christianity today, we shall see that it lacks the seven spirits. Their deadness is due to the lack of the seven spirits. Because of their organization, they also need the shining stars. This is all they need the intensified spirit and the shining stars. However, they do not pay attention to the seven spirits. The seven spirits are the full intensified realization of Christ as the spirit. This is not a matter of the so-called Pentecostal or charismatic movement, but of the indwelling sevenfold intensified spirit. This is what dead Protestantism needs today. It also needs the shining stars, not the positions or the organization. Their leading ones must be shining ones. 2. The Church's Condition A. Living in name, but dead in actuality to the messenger of the church in Sardis the Lord says, I know your works, that you have a name that you are living, and you are dead. Become watchful and establish the things which remain, which were about to die. For I have not found your works completed before my God. These two verses present a full picture of the so-called Protestant church. The reformed Protestant church has been considered to be living, but the Lord says that she is dead. Hence, in her dead condition, she needs the living spirits and the shining stars. b. The remaining things being about to die in verse 2 the Lord says to establish the things which remain, which were about to die. The things which remain are the things lost and restored by the Reformation, such as justification by faith and the open Bible. Though these things were restored, they were about to die. Hence, the Protestant Church needs revivals to keep things alive. This is the actual situation of the Protestant churches. C. Having no work completed the Lord also said, I have not found your works completed before my God. Nothing begun in the Reformation has ever been completed. Therefore, the church in Philadelphia is needed for the completion. In the eyes of God, there are no complete works in the so-called Reformed churches. Do not think that justification by faith is completed among them. If you have the inner sight, you will see that the justification by faith recovered by Martin Luther was quite shallow, for Luther did not touch justification very much in the way of life, but mainly in the way of doctrine, in a superficial way. We thank the Lord for this great servant of God, but he was not perfect. None of the work under his hand was completed. The things recovered in the days of Luther have been dying and are still about to die. This is why so many Protestant churches have frequent revivals. The crucial point about the fifth church is that it is dead and dying. While it has a name that it is living, actually it is dead. Many of us can testify that when we were saved, we were quite living. But after getting into a denominational church, we were put into the refrigerator and, after a few months, we cooled down and died. The reformed churches are deadening. I was raised in a so-called Protestant church and I know that there is absolutely no life there. In nearly every way, it is filled with death. 3. The Lord's charge in verse 3 The Lord says, Remember therefore how you have received and heard, and keep it and repent. In both this verse and in verse 2, the Lord charges the church in Sardis to be watchful, to establish the things which remain and which are about to die, to keep what she has received and heard, and to repent. 4. 
the Lord's coming in verse 3 the Lord also says, If therefore you will not watch, I will come as a thief, and you shall by no means know at what hour I will come upon you. A thief comes to steal precious things at an unknown time. Since the reformed Protestant churches are dead, they will be unaware of the Lord's coming as a thief in his secret appearing to his seekers. Hence, there is the need of watchfulness. The revelation in the New Testament regarding the Lord's second coming is not according to our natural understanding. According to our natural thought, the Lord will suddenly descend from the throne in the heavens to the earth. This thought has caused much difficulty to the students of the Bible, and we must drop it. In understanding anything found in the Bible, we should have no trust in our thoughts, and we should never apply our natural concepts. This is why we need a clear, renewed mind when we come to the Word of God. We must drop the colored eyeglasses of our concepts and come to the pure Word. The Lord's coming back is a process. His coming back will begin from the throne and will pass through a process until He descends to fight the battle at Armageddon. As we have pointed out, the Lord will descend from the throne to the air where he will accomplish many things, the rapture of the majority of the saints, the judgment at the judgment seat, and the wedding of the Lamb. After all this has been accomplished in the air, the Lord will descend to the earth. The rapture of the early overcomers, including the man-child, ch. 12, and the first fruits, ch. 14, will occur at the start of the process of the Lord's coming back. In other words, when they are raptured, the process of the Lord's coming back begins. In 3 3 and Matthew 24 43 we are told that the Lord will come as a thief. Suddenly, some of the believers who are the early overcomers will be taken away. No one knows the time of the beginning of the process of the Lord's coming back and of the rapture of the early overcomers. When it comes, there will be no time for you to prepare yourself. You must be thoroughly prepared before that time. Therefore, we must be prepared, ready, and watchful. V. The OVERCOMERS a few names in Sardis a. Not having defiled their garments with death in verse 4 the Lord says, but you have a few names in Sardis who have not defiled their garments. Garments in the Bible signify what we are in our walk and living. To defile the garments means particularly to stain them with deadness. Death is more defiling before God than sin, Lef. 11 colon 24 dash 25, number. 6 colon 6, 7, 9. In this verse, the defilement denotes anything of the death nature. The defilement in Sardis was not the defilement of sin. It was the defilement of death. Death is dirtier than sin. According to the Old Testament, if anyone sinned, he could be forgiven simply by offering the sin offering, Lef. 4 colon 27 31. However, anyone who touched the dead body of a man had to wait seven days before he could be cleansed, number. 19 11, 16. This indicates that the defilement of death is more serious than that of sin. Christians today have no consciousness of death. If you go to Las Vegas to gamble in a casino, you will sense that you have sinned. But if you came to a meeting in a dead way, you may not sense the seriousness of it. But in the eyes of God, this death situation is more serious than gambling in a Las Vegas casino. Although Christians condemn sin, they do not condemn deadness. People sit in the meetings like corpses and they see nothing wrong with it. I do not like to be near anything dead. One day, my mother died. Although we all loved her, none of us dared to stay near her dead body overnight. If your dear wife would dirty herself while doing something for you, you would love her more than ever before. But if she were to die, you would not want to be near her dead body. The Lord hates death. However, most Christians in the Reformed churches do not have this concept of death. They may say, what is wrong with the denominational churches? They are not only wrong they are filled with death. Though there may be nothing wrong with the corpses in a mortuary, they are full of death. Death is the greatest problem. How ugly it is. It is a stench to God, and he cannot tolerate it. In the local churches, we all must hate death. I would rather see the people in the churches wrong than to see them dead. 
Many times I have asked the brothers and sisters why they do not function in the meetings. Often their reply was, I'm afraid of making a mistake. To this, I responded, the more mistakes you make, the better. Living children make many mistakes. But the dead children in the cemeteries make no mistakes at all. If you simply sit in the meeting without doing anything, you will never be wrong. Although you may be right, you will be dead right. I would rather be livingly wrong than dead right. I may make mistakes, but everyone will know how living I am. Which do you prefer to be dead right or livingly wrong? B. Walking with the Lord in white speaking of these who have not defiled their garments, the Lord says that they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy, v4. White not only signifies purity, but also approvedness. White garments here signify the walk and living which are unspotted by death and which will be approved by the Lord. It is a qualification for walking with the Lord, especially in the coming kingdom. 6. The promise to the overcomer If you read the context of Revelation 2 and 3, you will see that every time the Lord gives a promise in these seven epistles, strictly speaking it refers to the coming kingdom. It never refers to eternity, to our eternal destiny. Rather, it refers to our future in the coming kingdom. This is the basic and governing principle in understanding all the promises in these seven epistles. In verse 4 the Lord promises that the living ones, those who have not defiled their garments, will walk with him in white. When will this be? In the wedding day of Christ which will last for a thousand years. To walk with the Lord in white means to walk with him during these thousand years. In principle, this must also be applied to our walk with the Lord today. In verse 5 the Lord says, He who overcomes, he shall be clothed in white garments, and I will by no means erase his name out of the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. To overcome here means to overcome the deadness of the Protestant churches, that is, to overcome dead Protestantism. The whole of verse 5 is the Lord's promise to the overcomers. It will be fulfilled in the Millennial Kingdom after he comes back. A. To be clothed in white garments, walking with the Lord firstly, the Lord promises the overcomer that he will be clothed in white garments. To be clothed in white garments in this promise will be a price to the overcomers in the Millennial Kingdom. In what they have been walking in this age, will be a price to them in the coming age. Every Christian needs two garments. The first is the garment of salvation signifying Christ as our righteousness objectively. In Luke 15, when the prodigal son returned home, the father had the best robe prepared for him. The first thing the father did was to have the best robe placed upon him. Wearing that robe, the prodigal son was justified in the presence of the father. He had been a pitiful beggar, no longer worthy to be with the father. But once he had the robe upon him, he was justified and approved. This means that he was justified in Christ and that Christ became his justifying covering. He was covered by Christ as his righteousness. Thus, the garment of justification is for salvation. However, besides this, we need another garment to make us approved and well-pleasing to the Lord. The fine linen, bright and pure in 19,8 denotes this second garment. According to typology, the queen in Psalm 45 has two garments, one for salvation and the other for her to be with the king in his reign. After we have been saved, we need to mature and overcome all frustrations and distractions. We must run the race and reach the goal. As we are running the race, there are many things which would frustrate us from reaching the goal. We must overcome all these frustrations. Yes, we have been saved and justified and have the first robe for our salvation but we must go on to maturity and reach our destination. If we do so, then we shall receive a reward. This is not a matter of Christ as our objective righteousness, but of experiencing Christ as our subjective righteousness. Christ as our objective righteousness has been put upon us, whereas Christ as our subjective righteousness comes out of us. We must live out Christ as our second garment. This garment is for the reward. The white garments mentioned in verse 5 refer to this second garment. When we have this second garment, we are well pleasing to the Lord and shall receive the reward. B. 
name not to be erased out of the book of life to the one who overcomes the Lord promises that he will by no means erase his name out of the book of life. We cannot understand this verse by itself. It is dangerous to do this. In order to understand a verse such as this we need to be safeguarded by the whole Bible. The name being erased out of the book of life indicates that that name was already written in the book of life. The book of life is a divine record of the names of those who partake of the blessings God has prepared for them. The names of all the saints chosen by God and predestinated to partake of these blessings are written in this book, Luke 10 20. These blessings are in three stages, the church, the millennial kingdom, and eternity. The blessings in the stage of the church, such as forgiveness, redemption, regeneration, eternal life, and the divine nature are all the initial portions. All God's chosen ones whose names are written in the book of life have a share in these initial portions to begin their spiritual life. If they cooperate with God's supplying grace, they will mature in life in the church age, and this earlier maturity in life will constitute a prize with which the Lord will reward them at his coming back. That prize will be the entrance into the millennial kingdom and participation in the divine blessings in that stage, such as the joy and rest of the Lord, Matt. 25 colon 21, 23, Hebrew. 4 colon 9 dash 11, and the reign over the nations, Revelation 2 colon 26 dash 27. 20 colon 4, 6, which God has prepared as an incentive for his chosen ones to go on with him in the church age. However, many of his chosen ones, after receiving his forgiveness, redemption, eternal life, divine nature, etc., will not cooperate with his grace and go on with him. Hence, they are unable to mature in life in the church age and thus will not be ready at the Lord's coming back to enter into the millennial kingdom and share in the divine blessings of that age as a prize. Therefore, during the millennial kingdom their names will be erased from the book of life. After being disciplined by the Lord and growing in life unto maturity during the millennial kingdom, they will share in the divine blessings in the stage of eternity, such as the eternal service with God's eternal presence, the eternal kingship, 22.3-5, the New Jerusalem, the Tree of Life, 22.14, and the Water of Life, 22.17. Then their names should be written in the Book of Life again. This means that all God's chosen ones whose names are written in the Book of Life and who have been brought into the participation of the divine blessings in the stage of the church shall by no means perish forever. John 10:28 that is they shall by no means lose the divine blessings of eternity but some who will not cooperate with the lord in the church age will be dispensationally disciplined by the lord during the millennial kingdom and will miss the divine blessings in that stage we face the danger of having our names erased from the book of life during the thousand years if you are defeated and refuse to be an overcomer by the lord's grace your name will not be there in the book of life when he is reigning during the thousand years. This means that you have been called but that you have not been chosen. In 1714, we can see that, at his coming back, after all the saints have been raptured, the Lord will make a selection. This selection will depend on how we have lived our Christian life. If we have lived in a defeated way, the Lord certainly will not select us. But if we have lived in a victorious way, we shall be selected, and our names will be there during the thousand years. This is similar to graduation from school. Although all the names of the students may be on the class list, only a few names will be on the list to receive a reward. To erase the name of a believer from the book of life does not mean that he shall perish for eternity. It only means that during the thousand years of the coming kingdom his name will not be there. This means that he will lose his birthright in the millennial kingdom having no right to share what God originally intended to give to all of his chosen ones. God's original intention is that all his chosen ones should enjoy Christ to the uttermost today that they might also have the right to enjoy Christ in the coming age. Since many are unwilling to do this now, when the kingdom comes, they will lose their birthright. Only those who cooperate with God's original intention will be in the kingdom enjoying Christ as their special portion. Their names will be in the book of life at that time but the names of many others will not be there. Because not many Christians have seen this vision, they cannot understand the verses concerning this matter. God's intention is to work Christ into us for our enjoyment. 
the church age is the time for this to be accomplished. But whether or not we are willing to cooperate with God in this matter depends on us. Because many will not cooperate with God, in his wisdom he has decided to make the enjoyment of Christ in the coming kingdom age a reward. This reward is an incentive encouraging us to cooperate with God and to enjoy Christ today. If we do not cooperate, we shall miss the kingdom age. The Book of Life is a record of all the names who have a share in the enjoyment of Christ. During the church age all our names are there. But in the kingdom age, the names of the sloppy ones will be erased from this book. After the millennial kingdom, their names will then be put back into the Book of Life. It is good to see that God's blessing in his salvation is of three ages, the church age, the kingdom age, and the age of eternity. Whether or not we will be in the kingdom sharing the full enjoyment of Christ depends upon whether we are willing to enjoy Christ today in the church life. Do not miss the opportunity today. If we enjoy Christ today, we shall be rewarded in the coming kingdom. Those who miss the special enjoyment of Christ in the coming kingdom will be dealt with by God that they might be brought into the full enjoyment of Christ. Therefore, eventually, when we all have passed through these two ages, the church age and the kingdom age, we all shall be ripe in the enjoyment of Christ and shall enter into the age of eternity. C. Name to be confessed by the Lord before the Father and the angels if we are overcomers, the Lord will not erase our names out of the book of life. Rather, he will confess our names before the Father and his angels. This indicates that since the names of those believers who are unwilling to be overcomers will be erased out of the book of life, their names will not be confessed by the Lord before the Father and his angels. 7. The Spirit speaking the dead reformed church needs the speaking of the living Spirit. The knowledge of the dead letters can never replace the speaking of the intensified Spirit. The letter kills, 2 COR. 3 colon 6. It is the Spirit who gives life, John 6 colon 63. All those in dead Protestantism must listen to the speaking of the Spirit. Life study of Revelation message 15 The church in Philadelphia rapture before the great tribulation and a pillar in God's temple in this message we come to the church in Philadelphia, the church in recovery, 3 colon 7 dash 13. In Greek, Philadelphia means brotherly love. As a sign, the church in Philadelphia prefigures the proper church life recovered by the brothers who were raised up by the Lord in England in the early part of the 19th century. Just as the Reformed Church, prefigured by the church in Sardis, was a reaction to the apostate Catholic Church, prefigured by the church in Thyatira, so the church of brotherly love is a reaction to the dead Reformed Church. This reaction will continue as an anti-testimony to both apostate Catholicism and degraded Protestantism until the Lord comes back. I. The Speaker A. The Holy One, the True One verse 7 says, These things says the Holy One, the True One. To the Church of Brotherly Love, the Lord is the Holy One, the True One by whom and with whom the recovered Church can be holy, separated from the world, and true, faithful, to God be. He who has the key of David to the recovered church, the Lord is also the one who has the key of David, v. 7, the key of the kingdom, with authority to open and to shut. Not many know the meaning of the term the key of David. According to Genesis 1, when God created man, he gave him dominion over all creatures. This indicates that, in God's intention, man is to be the power representing God on earth. Due to the fall, however, man lost this power and has never fully recovered it. Man has not regained dominion on earth to represent God. In the lives of Adam, Abel, Enosh, Enoch, and Noah we do not see this power. Neither do we see it in the lives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We do not see this power until God's chosen people, the children of Israel, entered into the good land and built the temple. Apparently, the temple was built by Solomon. Actually, it was built by David, for he was behind the building of the temple. Remember what is revealed in Genesis 1:26. God made man in his own image that he might express him and with his dominion that he might represent him. The temple is related to God's image because, being God's house, it is his expression. The temple was built in the city. The temple signifies God's expression 
and the city signifies God's dominion. The image and dominion revealed in Genesis 1 are, to some extent at least, fulfilled in the temple and the city. In the temple we have God's presence for his expression, and in the city we have God's dominion. God's king is in the city representing him as he rules on earth. This is a necessary background for understanding what the key of David is. The key held by David is the key of God's entire dominion. God's dominion includes the whole universe, especially mankind. This dominion has a key which is possessed by the person who fought the battle for the kingdom and who made preparations for the temple. The name of this person is David. David represented God in establishing God's kingdom on earth. Hence, he has the key of God's dominion in the universe. David, however, was just a type, not the reality. The real David is Christ, the greater David. He is the one who built God's temple, the church, and established God's kingdom. Therefore, in the church today, which is both a house and a kingdom, we have God's expression and representation. As the greater David, Christ has built up the house of God, the real temple, and he has set up the kingdom of God, the dominion in which he exercises full authority to represent God. Thus, he holds the key of David. The key of David is something representing God to open the whole universe for God. This is the key of David held by Christ. This term signifies that Christ is the center of God's economy. He is the one who expresses and represents God the one who holds the key to open everything in God's dominion. C. He who opens and shuts verse 7 also says that Christ is the one who opens and no one shall shut, and shuts, and no one shall open. Because the universal key, the key of God's economy, is in his hand, he opens and shuts. As we have pointed out, nearly everything found in the book of Revelation is not new but a fulfillment of things revealed in the Old Testament. This is also true of the key of David. Isaiah 22:22-24 -22 is a prophecy concerning Christ as the one who holds the key of David. The deep thought in Christ's holding the key of David is found there. In Isaiah 22 it was prophesied that Christ would not only be the one holding the key of David, but that he would also be a nail or peg. Very few Christians have heard that Christ is a nail. If you consider the context of Isaiah 22 and if you read the context of the word regarding Christ as the one holding the key of David in Revelation 3, you will realize that Christ's holding the key of David is for God's house, for God's building. The crucial subject in Isaiah 22 is the house of God. And the epistle to the church in Philadelphia eventually speaks of the New Jerusalem. The overcomers in Philadelphia will be pillars in the temple of God and the temple of God will ultimately be enlarged into the New Jerusalem. According to Revelation 21-22, there is no temple in the New Jerusalem, for, in eternity, the temple will be enlarged into a city, which, having three equal dimensions, 21-16, will be the enlargement of the Holy of Holies. This is the ultimate consummation of God's house. Christ's holding the key of David, fighting the battle for God, and building the temple and establishing the kingdom of God are all for God's building. Christ holds the key of David and he opens and shuts, not that we might be holy or spiritual, but that we might be built up. He does not care for so-called holiness or spirituality. During the past two centuries, certain people claimed to be holy and spiritual. Although they saw something, they were rather short-sighted. Holiness is not for holiness and spirituality is not for spirituality. Both holiness and spirituality are to enable us to be pillars in the temple of God. Eventually, we shall not bear the name of holiness or spirituality but of the New Jerusalem. In 3.12 the Lord did not say, I will write holiness upon you, or, I will write spirituality upon you. He said, I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the New Jerusalem which descends out of heaven from my God, and my new name. What we have here is neither holiness nor spirituality but God and the new Jerusalem. God's purpose is not to make us holy or spiritual. It is to make us part of the new Jerusalem. God already has all the holiness he needs, but he does not yet have the new Jerusalem. God's desire is not for more spirituality. He is seeking the new Jerusalem. 
God desires a builded church. He wants today's Bethel, the house of God which will consummate in the new Jerusalem. Are you willing to see this? When I saw this light 18 years ago, I made a strong declaration in my message that God does not want spirituality. Some opposers took this sentence out of context and said, Listen, Witness Lee says that we don't need spirituality and that God does not want spirituality. In that message I said again and again that any spirituality which is not for God's building is not genuine. Our spirituality must be tested by the church life. If our spirituality does not fit into the church life, it is an abnormal spirituality. It does not supply the body. Rather, it is a cancer. Many so-called spiritual persons are cancers. Cancer is a disease of the cells in the body. Unlike germs, cells are constituents of the body, and there is nothing wrong with them. But if the cells are not properly balanced and become too concentrated, they will develop into a cancer. The so-called spirituality that cannot be tested, adjusted, or balanced and that cannot fit into the building of the church is a cancer. The speaker to the church in Philadelphia holds the key of David, not to make us holy or spiritual, but to deal with us that we might be transformed and built up. Once we have been built up, he will become a nail to us, and we shall be the vessels hanging on him. Firstly, Christ holds the key of David and eventually he holds us. Christ used the key to open the door of our prison. Before we came into the church life, we were all imprisoned. For example, some were imprisoned in the dungeon of Catholicism. But wherever we were, Christ, the one who holds the key of David, opened our prison and released us. According to our experience, all the doors opened for us by Christ are prison doors. Although the opposers are trying their best to imprison us, and to make the church a prison, we are released by the key held in the hand of Christ. As today's David, he has the key to open whatever God desires to open. Once he opens the door and we are released, we enter into the house of God where we become the household with many vessels held by Christ as the nail. If we remain in our mentality, we shall not have the realization or the sense of being held by Christ in this way. Nevertheless, Christ is the nail in God's house, and by this nail, we all are held up from the earth. Firstly, Christ uses the key to release us from prison. After we have been released and have entered into the house of God, he becomes the nail holding us off the ground. The purpose of his doing this is that we might be transformed into a pillar in God's house. Eventually, we, the pillars, will become parts of the New Jerusalem. As we shall see, Christ's writing the name of the New Jerusalem upon us means that we have been transformed into a part of the New Jerusalem. If you see this, your view will be changed. In the past, you might have pursued holiness or spirituality, but you sought holiness and spirituality in an aimless way. You did not have God's goal in view. You did not see that both holiness and spirituality are for God's building. Today, Christ, the real David, uses the key to release us from prison. He then brings us into God's house that we might be transformed to be pillars and parts of the new Jerusalem. This is the church life, and this is the temple of God. Within this temple our Christ is a great nail holding us off the ground for God's building. 2. The Church's Condition A. Having a little power in 3 colon 8 we see the condition of the church in Philadelphia. Firstly, this church had a little power. Many times we estimate the church in Philadelphia too highly, thinking that this church was strong and prevailing. Actually, it was not so. Some may think that when the Lord raised up the brothers in England 150 years ago, every one of them must have been like David. While we estimate the church in Philadelphia very highly, the Lord says that she had a little power. What pleases the Lord is not that we are strong, but that we use our little power to do the best we can. Do not try to be strong. The strong ones may not please the Lord as much as those who do their best with the little power they have. You can never surpass what the Lord gives you. Simply spend what you have received from Him. Do not usurp the Lord's grace. None among us can say that he has received nothing from the Lord. Even the least among us has received a certain amount of grace from him. You must spend that grace, 
using it to do your best. If you do this, the Lord will appreciate you and say, Good. You have a little power, yet you have kept my word with the power you have. Do not seek to be a giant. The Lord is not happy with giants. He is happy with the little ones who have an amount of grace. Although that grace may be limited in its capacity, as long as we use it, spending it to do as much as we can to keep the Lord's word, he will be pleased. b. Having kept the Lord's word in verse 8 the Lord said that the church in Philadelphia kept his word. One outstanding feature of Philadelphia is that she kept the Lord's word. According to history, no other Christians have kept the Lord's word as strictly as these in the church in Philadelphia. Likewise, by his grace, we are keeping his word today. Although many condemn us, saying that we are heretical, among today's Christians no one regards the Lord's word more than we do. We keep the word of God, not in the traditional way, but in the way of the pure word. This offends those who want to hold the traditions of their forefathers. The church in Philadelphia does not care for tradition. She cares for the word of God. C. Having not denied the Lord's name in verse 8 the Lord also said that the church in Philadelphia did not deny his name. Since the brothers were raised up in England in the early part of the 18th century, they have not taken any name other than the name of the Lord. The word is the Lord's expression, and the name is the Lord himself. The apostate church has deviated from the Lord's word and become heretical. The reformed church, though recovered to the Lord's word to some extent, has denied the Lord's name by denominating herself with many other names, such as Lutheran, Wesleyan, Anglican, Presbyterian, and Baptist. The recovered church has not only returned to the Lord's word in a full way, but has also abandoned all names other than that of the Lord Jesus Christ. The recovered church belongs to the Lord absolutely, having nothing to do with any denominations, any names. To deviate from the Lord's word is apostasy and to denominate the church with any name other than the Lord's is spiritual fornication. The church as the chaste virgin espoused to Christ, 2 Cor. 11 colon 2, should not have any name other than her husband's. All other names are an abomination in the eyes of God. In the recovered church life we have no teachings of Balaam, 2.14, no teachings of the Nicolaitans, 2.15, no teachings of Jezebel, 2.20 and no mysterious doctrines of Satan, 224. We have only the pure word of the Lord. Amen. The recovered church has no denominations, names, but the unique name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The deviation from the word to heresies and the exaltation of so many names other than that of Christ are the most striking signs of degraded Christianity. The return to the pure word from all heresies and traditions and the exaltation of the Lord's name by abandoning every other name are the most inspiring testimony in the recovered church. This is why the church in the Lord's recovery has the revelation and presence of the Lord and expresses the Lord in a living way, full of light and with the riches of life. Because we have an all-sufficient name, the name above every name, we do not need the names Lutheran, Methodist, Baptist, Episcopalian. Presbyterian, or any other names. We have only one name the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is a serious matter to take a name. Suppose you are Mrs. Smith. If you take the name of M.R.S. Jones, it indicates that you have committed fornication. The church should have only one husband, only one name, the name of Jesus Christ. In the past, some friends in the denominations have asked me, why do you call yourselves the church? Why do you say that we are not the church? I answered, you call yourselves Presbyterian. Don't blame me for this you have designated yourself in this manner. If you are the church, why do you designate yourself in this way? Are you Mrs. Smith? Then why do you call yourself Mrs. Jones? When I call you MRS, Jones and say that I am MRS. Smith, you are jealous. Don't blame me for this, for you have called yourself Mrs. Jones. After this, all their mouths were shut. Do not think that a name is a small thing. We are saved in the Lord's name. Besides his name, we should never take any other name. George Whitefield, 
a contemporary of John Wesley, once declared that besides the name of Jesus Christ he would have no other name. Although Whitefield was an Englishman, he renounced the name of the Church of England, not belonging to that name anymore. The Church in Philadelphia does not deny the Lord's name. She has no name other than His. Sometimes people have argued with us, saying, We have never denied the Lord's name. We replied, Yes, you have never denied His name, but you have taken another name in addition to and even above His name. Now you have two names. Why don't you drop the other name you have taken? If you would drop this other name, then we could be one. All other names cause divisions. You call yourself a Presbyterian. I hate that name because taking it makes me a fornicator. Since you like it and I hate it, if you still hold on to it, how can we be one? But if you drop this name, we shall immediately be one in the unique name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some have said that the name on the outside of their so-called church building is merely an outward sign, and that they do not really care about it. If they do not care about it, then they should prove their honesty in this manner by removing that sign. But some have said that it is too difficult for them to do that because the church board would hinder them. To this I replied, then you must bear the responsibility for division. D. Having an open door in verse 8 the Lord said, Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut. As the one who has the key of David and who opens and no one can shut, the Lord has given the recovered church an open door which no one can shut. Since the recovery of the proper church life began, in the early part of the 19th century, until now, a door has always been wide open to the Lord's recovery. The more that organized Christianity tries to shut the door, the wider it is open. In spite of much opposition, the door today is open worldwide. The key is in the hand of the head of the church. It is not in the hand of the opposers. Hallelujah, we have an open door. During the past 50 years, the denominations have tried their best to close this door. But the more they attempted to shut it, the more the Lord has opened it. No one can deny that there is an open door for the Lord's recovery today. The Lord has the key. As long as we are in his recovery, the door will always be open to us. 3. The subduing of the Jewish religion verse 9 says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, those who call themselves Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will cause them to come and worship before your feet, and they shall know that I have loved you. The Jewish synagogue holds on to Judaism, which comprises the mediatorial priests, the ordinances of letters, the material temple, and the earthly promises. The recovered church has subdued Judaism by exposing its error and stubbornness in holding on to the above four things and has made the Jews know that the Lord has loved her. As we pointed out in message 11, the Judaizers were Jews in flesh but not in spirit. Due to their stubbornness in clinging to their traditional religious concepts, they became one with Satan in opposing God's way of life to fulfill his purpose. Hence, the Lord calls them the synagogue of Satan. Nevertheless, according to the epistle to the church in Philadelphia, the opposing Jews are subdued before the church, and the Lord's love toward the church is made known to them. All denominations are actually today's synagogues. Do you know what a synagogue is? As revealed in Deuteronomy chapters 12, 14, 15, and 16, God's economy is to have one unique temple on earth. The Lord charged his people in Deuteronomy not to have any place as their worshipping center other than that place which he would choose. That chosen place was Jerusalem, and on the selected site God had the temple built. This unique temple not only signifies that the testimony of God must be one. It also maintains the oneness of God's people. Eventually, however, God's people became degraded, and, due to this degradation, division came in. As a result of this division, the people of God were scattered, having lost their unity. But since they still had to worship God and since they had no right to build the temple except on the designated site in Jerusalem, they established worshipping centers called synagogues wherever they went. A synagogue is a degraded worship center. There can be only one temple, but there are many synagogues, all of which are divisive. This is a type of the degradation of the church. 
As we apply this type to the church situation, we see that in God's economy the church is uniquely one. But due to the degradation, the church was divided. In every division there is a worshipping center. These worshipping centers have become today's synagogues. Just as the temple was unique, but the synagogues were many, so the church is unique and the denominations and free groups are many. When the epistles to the seven churches were written, the church was being slandered by the Jewish synagogue, 2 colon 9. But eventually, the synagogue realized that the Lord loved the church in Philadelphia. In typology, this is a sign of the real church in Philadelphia that the Lord raised up about 150 years ago. In the late 1820s the brothers were raised up in England as the fulfillment of the church in Philadelphia. At that time, they were surrounded, not by Jewish synagogues, but by the synagogues of the denominations which criticized and slandered them. During the past 50 years, we also have been the subject of slander and rumors, and even today many rumors and slanders are circulating about us. The source of these rumors and slanders is today's synagogues. Nevertheless, it is undeniable that the Lord loves the recovery, and eventually all the slanderers will acknowledge this fact. While some slander us, some say, we cannot explain why they are so strong, others testify, they truly understand the Bible, and still others confess, they always have new light. Any light and understanding we have come from the blessing from the one who holds the key of David. Although I do not boast of myself, I may boast of the Lord's blessing. The Lord's recovery in this country is not the work of man. Who could do such a work? I certainly cannot. Eventually, all the critics of the Lord's recovery will be subdued and realize that Jesus Christ loves us. Wait for another period of time and you will see more of how much the Lord loves his churches. He will vindicate his church before all the denominations. Our work is not the common work of Christianity, nor a work under human control. No, it is the work of his recovery. It is the Lord's heart's desire, and he loves it. When people touch this matter, they touch the apple of his eye. The Lord loves Philadelphia, and the opposing Jews of the synagogue of Satan were subdued before the church because the Lord's love for the church was made known to them. 4. The Lord's charge in verse 11 we see the Lord's charge, I come quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one take your crown. The recovered church has gained a crown already. However, if she does not hold fast what she has in the Lord's recovery until the Lord comes back, her crown may be taken away by someone. V. The Lord's promise to the overcomer Let us now consider the promise to the overcomer in Philadelphia, verses 10 to 12. To overcome in this epistle means to hold fast what we have in the recovered church. A. To keep him out of the hour of trial verse 10 says, Because you have kept the word of my endurance, I also will keep you out of the hour of trial which is about to come on the whole inhabited earth, to try them who dwell on the earth. The word of my endurance is the word of the Lord's suffering. The Lord today is still suffering rejection and persecution with his endurance. We are the joint partakers, not only of his kingdom, but also of his endurance. 1 9. Hence, his word to us today is the word of endurance. To keep the word of his endurance we must suffer his rejection and persecution. Trial in this verse undoubtedly denotes the great tribulation, Matt. 24 21, which is about to come on the whole inhabited earth, as indicated by the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpets with the seven bowls, 8 1 9 21, 11 14 15, 15 1, 16 1 21. The Lord promises the recovered church that he will keep her out of the hour of trial, not just out of the trial, but out of the hour of trial, because she has kept the word of his endurance. This promise of the Lord, like his promise in Luke 21 36, indicates that the saints who have kept the word of the Lord's endurance will be raptured before the great tribulation, implying that those who have not kept the word of his endurance will be left in the great tribulation. B. The Lord's coming quickly in verse 11 the Lord tells the recovered church that he will come quickly. In this epistle the Lord brings the church in his recovery into the sensation of his coming because she loves him. 
All the churches in the Lord's recovery should love the Lord under the inspiration of His coming back. The Lord's coming back quickly should be precious to us while we are testifying of Him in His recovery. C. Crown A crown has been given by the Lord to the recovered church. Being a reward from the Lord, this must be kept until He comes back. D. To make him a pillar in God's temple in verse 12 the Lord says, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall by no means go out any more. In 2.17 the overcomer becomes a transformed stone for God's building, but here the overcomer will be made a pillar built into the temple of God. Because he is built into God's building, he shall by no means go out any more. This promise will be fulfilled in the millennial kingdom as a prize to the overcomer. To overcome in the church in Philadelphia is not to get anything or to overcome other things. It is to keep what we have received in the Lord's recovery to the end. If you do this, the Lord will make you a pillar in God's temple. This reminds us of Jacob's dream in Genesis 28. After Jacob had that dream, he set up the stone which he had used for a pillow to be a pillar. That pillar was for God's building. The overcomers in Philadelphia will be pillars in God's temple. The principle is exactly the same today. The Lord has set up a good number of stones to be pillars in his recovery. Praise the Lord that there are many pillars among us. Once a stone has been set as a pillar into the building, it can never be removed, for it has been built in. Some stay in the church for a short while or for several months and then go away. However, if you have been built into the temple as a pillar, you could not leave even if you wanted to. If you can still go out of the church, it means that you have never been built in. E. To write upon him one. The name of God in verse 12 the Lord also promises the overcomer, saying, I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which descends out of heaven from my God, and my new name. Firstly, the Lord says that he will write on the overcomer the name of God. A name is a designation. Your name designates who you are. For the overcomer to bear the name of God means that God has been wrought into him. Only when God has been wrought into us are we worthy to bear his name. This does not mean that we become God. It means that God has been wrought into us and that we are one with him. Therefore, the Lord gives us a designation God. God is upon the overcomer, indicating that he has been saturated with God. When you see him, you see God. 2. The name of the city of God, the New Jerusalem Secondly, the Lord promises to write upon the overcomer the name of the city of God, the New Jerusalem. For the overcomer to bear the name of the New Jerusalem means that he is a part of the New Jerusalem. This indicates that the coming New Jerusalem has been wrought into his being. Thus, the overcomer also bears the designation of the New Jerusalem. The Lord's writing always corresponds to the facts. It would be ridiculous to write the word lion upon a monkey, or to write the word lamb upon a cat. When the Lord writes the names of God and the New Jerusalem upon us, it reveals that we are one with God and are a part of the New Jerusalem. 3. The Lord's new name Finally, the Lord promises to write upon the overcomer his new name. This new name will be according to our experiences. I cannot tell you what the Lord's new name will be because it is according to our personal experiences of him. In other words, what we experience of the Lord will become us. We experience God, and God becomes us. We experience the New Jerusalem, and that also becomes us. We experience the Lord in an intimate, personal way, and that becomes us. Therefore, the Lord will rightly designate us, writing upon us the name of God the name of the New Jerusalem, and his new name. This will indicate that we have become a person who is one with God, who is a part of the New Jerusalem, and who has experienced the Lord himself as the one who makes himself us. The name of God, the name of New Jerusalem, and the Lord's new name written upon the overcomer indicate that the overcomer is possessed by God, by the New Jerusalem, and by the Lord. That God himself, his city, the New Jerusalem, and the Lord himself all belong to him. And that he is one with God, with the New Jerusalem, and with the Lord. The name of God means God himself, the name of the New Jerusalem means the city itself, 
and the name of the Lord means the Lord himself. To write the name of God, the name of the New Jerusalem, and the name of the Lord upon the overcomer indicate that what God is, the nature of the New Jerusalem, and the person of the Lord have all been wrought into the overcomer. The mentioning of the New Jerusalem as a price to the overcomer indicates that this promise will be fulfilled in the Millennial Kingdom. The New Jerusalem in the Millennial Kingdom will be a prize only to the overcoming saints, whereas the New Jerusalem in the New Heaven and New Earth will be the common portion of all the redeemed for eternity. 6. The Spirit speaking the recovered church also needs to take heed of the Spirit speaking. The more we love the Lord and the more we are in His recovery, the more we need the rich speaking of the intensified Spirit. Life Study of Revelation Message 16 The Church in Laodicea to dine with the Lord and to sit on His throne Now we come to the Church in Laodicea, the Church in Degradation, 3.14-22. In Greek Laodicea means the opinion, the judgment, of the people or of the layman. The Church in Laodicea as a sign prefigures the degraded recovered Church. Less than a century after the Lord recovered the proper Church in the early part of the 19th century, some of the recovered churches, assemblies, became degraded. This degraded recovered church differs from the reformed church signified by the church in Sardis, and also differs from the proper recovered church signified by the church in Philadelphia. It will exist until the Lord comes back. Some Christian teachers consider the church in Laodicea as the cold reformed church. Strictly speaking, this is not so. According to the context and according to history, the church in Laodicea must be a sign of the degraded recovered church. Approximately 150 years ago the recovered church began in England. According to what we have read, it was wonderful. It was a real recovery of the church life. However, it did not last very long. If you read the history of the brethren and if you visit them today, you will see that many of the brethren assemblies have become the church in Laodicea. As we shall see, Although they are proud of their Bible knowledge, they are poor in the enjoyment of the riches of Christ and blind in spiritual things. I. The Speaker A. The Amen in 314 The Lord says, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. To each of the seven churches the Lord refers to what He is and what He does respectively according to their situation and condition. Here, to the church in Laodicea he refers to himself as the Amen. In Greek Amen means firm, steadfast, or trustworthy. The Lord is the firm, steadfast, and trustworthy one. b. The faithful and true witness because the Lord is the firm, steadfast, and trustworthy one, he is the faithful and true witness. This indicates that the degraded church in Laodicea is not firm, steadfast, trustworthy or faithful and true as the Lord's witness. c. The beginning of the creation of God in verse 14 The Lord also refers to himself as the beginning of the creation of God. This refers to the Lord as the origin or source of God's creation, implying that the Lord is the unchanging and ever-existing source of God's work. This indicates that the degraded recovered church is changing by leaving the Lord as the source. 2. The Church's Condition A. Neither cold nor hot lukewarm in verses 15 through 17 we see the condition of the church in Laodicea. In verses 15 and 16 the Lord says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I am about to vomit you out of my mouth. Once the recovered church becomes degraded, it is lukewarm neither cold nor hot. This is the actual condition of so many brethren assemblies today. This should be a warning to us. Once we become lukewarm, we are not fitting for the Lord's move and shall be vomited out of his mouth. b. Proud of being rich in verse 17 the Lord says, You say, I am rich and have become rich and have need of nothing. The degraded recovered church, assembly, boasts of her riches, mainly in the knowledge of doctrines. She does not realize that she is poor in life, blind in sight, and naked in conduct. Therefore, as we shall see, she needs gold for her poverty, eyes alve for her blindness, and white garments for her nakedness, as mentioned in the following verse. 
the most outstanding feature of those in the degraded assemblies is their pride. They think they know everything. Undoubtedly, they have much knowledge in doctrine. They do know the Bible better than those in the denominations. Although, in a sense, they know the Bible, what they have is mere knowledge. Because they have this knowledge, they consider themselves rich. But the Lord says that they actually are poor. They are not poor in knowledge, but they are poor in the riches of Christ. They have the knowledge concerning Christ, but they are poor in the enjoyment of the riches of Christ. Shortly after coming to this country, I was invited to speak in three brethren assemblies. After speaking there and hearing what they said in response, I was completely convinced of the truth of the Lord's word to the church in Laodicea. If you were to stay with them for a short while, you would sense that they are proud of their knowledge. In their conversation they condemn the ignorance of others, thinking that they know everything. However, after staying with them, you would realize the poverty among them. They simply do not realize the riches of Christ or even talk about them. C. Wretched in the eyes of the Lord, the degraded assemblies are wretched because they are proud of being rich in the vain knowledge of doctrines, but are sorely poor in the experience of the riches of Christ. D. Miserable the degraded recovered church is also miserable because she is naked, blind, and full of shame and darkness. E. Poor the proud degraded church is poor in the experience of Christ and in the spiritual reality of God's economy. She mostly cares for vain knowledge, but scarcely cares for the living experiences of Christ. This is real poverty, the poverty that makes her wretched and miserable. F. Blind in the eyes of the Lord, the church in Laodicea is not only poor in the riches of Christ, but also blind in genuine spiritual things. She does not have true spiritual insight. Although she has some amount of knowledge about spiritual things, she has no insight. G. Naked we Christians have all received Christ as our objective righteousness to cover us like a robe. This is for our justification before God. After being justified in Christ, we need to live by Christ and to live out Christ, that he may be our subjective righteousness as another splendid robe to cover our daily walk. Due to the lack of the subjective experience of Christ, the degraded recovered church is naked in the eyes of the Lord. The vain knowledge of doctrines vanishes under the flaming eyes of the Lord, leaving those who hold them nakedly exposed. Only the experienced Christ can be our covering under his judging eyes. H. About to be vomited out of the Lord's mouth in verse 16 the Lord says, Because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I am about to vomit you out of my mouth. When the recovered church becomes degraded, she is in danger, unless she repents to be hot in seeking the rich experiences of the Lord, of being vomited out of the Lord's mouth. To be vomited out of the Lord's mouth is to lose the enjoyment of all that the Lord is to his church. I. The Lord standing at the door and knocking in verse 20 the Lord says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. The door is not the door of individuals, but the door of the church. The church in Laodicea has knowledge, but she does not have the presence of the Lord. The Lord as the head of the church is standing outside the degraded church, knocking at her door. The degraded recovered church must realize this. 3. The Lord's counsel in verse 18 We see the Lord's counsel to the church in Laodicea, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness may not be manifested, and eyes alve to anoint your eyes that you may see. To buy requires the paying of a price. The degraded recovered church needs to pay a price for the gold, white garments, and eyes alve, which she desperately needs. After having contact with the brethren assemblies, I realized that probably no one among them understands what it means to pay a price. Perhaps they have never heard that they must pay some price in order to experience the riches of Christ. They know the knowledge and doctrine, but they do not know how to pay the price. They know how to learn, but they do not know how to buy. They know certain truths, but they do not know the cost of experiencing the riches of Christ. A. To buy from the Lord gold refined by fire Firstly, the Lord counsels the church in Laodicea to buy gold refined by fire. In the Bible, our working faith, Gal. 5 colon 6, 
is likened to gold, one pet, one colon seven, and the divine nature of God, which is the divinity of Christ, is also typified by gold, exo 25 colon 11. We partake of the divine nature of God by faith, two pet, one colon one, four to five. The degraded recovered church has the knowledge of the doctrines concerning Christ, but not much living faith to partake of the divine element of Christ. She needs to pay the price to gain the golden faith through the fiery trials that she may participate in the real gold, which is Christ himself as the life element to his body. Thus, she may become a pure golden lampstand, 120, for the building of the golden new Jerusalem, 2118. If we have experience, we shall realize that all three things which the Lord counsels the church in Laodicea to buy gold, white garments, and isilvar just the Lord himself. As we have seen, in typology, or in biblical figure, gold signifies two things, God's divine nature and the living faith by which we appreciate and appropriate the divine nature. These two things are combined. If we do not have the living faith to appreciate and apply the divine nature, it cannot be ours. The divine nature can only become our enjoyment through our living faith. Christ is the embodiment of the divine nature, and he is also our living faith. If we have faith, then we can participate in the divine nature. This means that we must have Christ. We must pay the cost and tell the Lord, saying, Lord, I have much knowledge of the Bible truths, but I admit that I don't have much of you. Lord, I would rather have you than mere knowledge or vain teachings. Lord, you are the real gold, the embodiment of the divine nature. In order to appreciate and apply this divine nature, I need living faith. Yet, Lord, I don't have this living faith, but I look unto you. Lord, be my living faith. I want to live by you as my faith, the faith of the Son of God, Gallon 2.20. If you speak to the Lord in this way, he will immediately say, All right, if you would gain me you must pay the price. There is a certain thing that I want you to drop because it is a hindrance and a frustration from my becoming your enjoyment. Dropping these things is the paying of the price. Many of us have experienced the Lord in this way. Often the Lord has said, I am here. Do you want me, or do you want that thing? If you want to keep that thing, then I shall stay away. Your hands are full of many things. You must drop them, empty your hands, and then grasp me. Then you will have me as your enjoyment. Only when we pay the price can we gain Christ. Consider the words of the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3 8, But surely I count also all things to be lost on account of the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, on account of whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them refuse that I may gain Christ. For Paul, there remained nothing except Christ. He spent everything for Christ, paying the full price. Whatever Paul had, he spent it to gain Christ. Today, we must follow this spirit to pay any price, even the cost of our lives, in order to gain Christ. We can never separate living faith from the divine nature. Although this is difficult to explain doctrinally, we know experientially that when we have the living faith, we enjoy the divine nature. And when we are in the divine nature, we surely have this living faith. Hence, these two things are combined and are both signified by gold. The church in Laodicea needs this gold the divine nature applied, appropriated, by the living faith which is Christ himself. If we would gain this, we must pay the price. b. To buy from the Lord white garments Secondly, the Lord counseled the church in Laodicea to buy white garments that they may be clothed and that the shame of their nakedness may not be manifested. In figure, garments signify conduct. White garments here refer to conduct approvable to the Lord, which is the Lord himself lived out of the church, and which is required by the degraded recovered church to cover her nakedness. We pointed out in message 14 that these white garments are not Christ as our objective righteousness for justification. Rather, the white garments are Christ as our subjective righteousness, Christ lived out of our being. The Christ who is lived out of us will be our second garment for us to be approved by the Lord. This is not for salvation but for being chosen. We all need this second garment. 
When we have living faith and participate in the divine nature, this divine nature will eventually come out of us to be our living. This living is Christ lived out of our being, and this is the second garment which gives us the standing and the qualification to be approved by Christ. This garment will cover our nakedness. Yes, we all have been justified and have been covered by the first garment, the best robe put on the prodigal son in Luke 15. But after being justified, we must love the Lord, be on fire, and be absolutely for the Lord. If we are this kind of Christian, then we shall have the living faith to participate in the rich, divine nature, which will become the Christ lived out of our being as the second garment to cover our nakedness. If, after being justified, you do not love the Lord and live by, for, and with Him, you are naked. It is difficult to explain this doctrinally, but experientially we all may realize that a brother who does not love the Lord or live by the Lord is shameful and is naked. He does not have the lovely Christ as his covering. He believes in Christ and he belongs to Christ, but since he neither loves him nor lives by him, he is naked in both the eyes of the Lord and in the eyes of other believers. He does not have Christ as his beautiful covering. We must pay the price for this second garment, the Christ lived out of our being. This is the subjective Christ, the very Christ experienced by us in a subjective way. Do not try to understand this by the exercise of your mentality. Check this word with your experience. Although this is foreign to your mentality, it is more than familiar to your spirit and to your experience. According to your experience, you can testify that, on the one hand, you may have the assurance that you are justified, but, on the other hand, have the sense that you are naked. Undoubtedly, as a child of God, you have been justified, redeemed, saved, and regenerated, and you are a member of Christ. But, on the other hand, you sense that you are naked, not having Christ lived out of you to be your beautiful covering. Inwardly, you condemn yourself for this. If you check this word with your experience, you will see that it is true. Thus, we all must pay the price, saying to the Lord, Lord, whatever the cost, I'll pay the price to have you live out of my being. Lord, I want to have you as my living. I don't want to behave myself, correct myself, or improve myself. Lord, I like to have you lived out of me. Day by day, I want you to live out of my being to be my outward living. Lord, be not only my inward life but also my outward living. If you pray this way to the Lord, he will become your outward covering, the second garment for you to be approved and chosen by him. There is no need to wait for the coming day. Even today you may have the assurance that you have been approved and chosen. Therefore, when that day comes, he will surely say, Well done. Come with me to enjoy your portion and to fight with me against the army of the Antichrist. C. To buy from the Lord the eyes of thirdly, the Lord counsels the church in Laodicea to buy from him eyes alve to anoint their eyes that they may see. The eyes alve needed to anoint their eyes must refer to the anointing spirit, 1 John 2:27, who is also the Lord himself as the life-giving spirit, 1 Cor 15:45. Because she has been distracted by the dead knowledge of letters, the degraded recovered church also needs this kind of eyes alve for her blindness. For all three items the Lord counsels her to buy she must pay the price. We have pointed out that the eyes alve is the anointing spirit. Spiritual insight is always related to the spirit. We need more spirit, not more knowledge. We do not need many doctrines we need more spirit to anoint our eyes and the depths of our inner being that we may have insight to see things from within. With this eyes alve, this anointing, we may have both foresight and deep insight to see things thoroughly. Then we shall say, Lord Jesus, because I now see what a treasure you are, I am ready to pay any price. Suppose the cost of an item in a department store is $1,000. If this item is a valuable diamond worth $5,000, you would not think that the price is too high. Rather, you would think that it is cheap. Why are so many Christians unwilling to pay the price for Christ? It is because they do not see what a treasure Christ is. They do not see the preciousness, the worth, and the value of Christ. But once our eyes have been anointed by the divine, spiritual eyes alve, we shall say, 
it is worthwhile for me to pay any price for Christ. The price is too low. Myself, my future, and my life are all worth nothing. I actually pay nothing to gain Christ who is everything. If we would see this, we need eyes elf. Now we realize that the gold, the garment, and the eyes elf are all Christ. Christ is everything. Our need today is Christ. Yes, in his recovery the Lord has given us a great deal of light. Our intention, however, is not to give knowledge to people. Our intention in these messages is to help the Lord's people to be enlightened that they might see the value, worth, and preciousness of Christ and, by having this insight, they might be willing to pay any price to gain him. It is worthwhile for me to pay the cost of my family, my future, my destiny, and my whole life for Christ. If I would pay all this, the price is still too cheap. Paul said that all the things he counted loss for Christ were just dung, dog food, philosophy 3 8. In the church life in the Lord's recovery we are not for doctrine or merely for the so-called truths. We are here for the rich Christ. In all these messages we are not dispensing vain doctrines. The goal of these messages is to minister some ointment that people's eyes may be anointed to see the preciousness of Christ and be attracted to him. The degraded church does not need doctrine. She needs eyes elf. She needs revelation, vision, and great grace. 4. The Lord's rebuke and discipline in verse 19 The Lord said, As many as I love I rebuke and discipline. If she is willing to take it, the Lord's rebuke in love will be an eye opener to the degraded church. But her pride may frustrate her from receiving it. When we become lukewarm and feel rebuked by the Lord, we need to look to him for his mercy that we may be willing to be humble to receive his rebuke in love. This may bring the proper remedy to the degraded church. Discipline is a further step taken by the Lord to deal with his degraded church after he has rebuked her. If she is willing to receive the Lord's rebuke, he may not need to exercise his discipline over her. The Lord's discipline is exercised over her in love. V. The Lord's charge in verse 19 The Lord charged the church in Laodicea, saying, Be zealous therefore, and repent. Dead knowledge has made the degraded church lukewarm. She needs to become crazily burning by dropping the deadening and cooling knowledge, and she even needs to break the bondage of her doctrinal forms. She needs to be boiling rather than to be dead right according to dead doctrine. She needs to love the Lord and pay any price to gain him, even at the cost of sacrificing the doctrines. A lukewarm church needs to be hot, to be burning at any cost. She needs to repent of her lukewarmness, not to be proud of her knowledge any longer. She has been appreciating her dead knowledge too much. She needs to depreciate all her knowledge and repent of being satisfied with the vanity of knowledge and not with the reality of Christ. 6. The Lord's promise to the overcomer in verses 20 and 21 we see the Lord's promise to the overcomer, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, to him I will give to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. To overcome in these seven epistles does not mean to overcome our weaknesses and besetting sins. It means to overcome the fallen condition of the deviant churches. To overcome in the epistle to Laodicea means to overcome the lukewarmness and pride of the degraded recovered church, to buy the needed items, and to open the door for the Lord to come in. A. The Lord's coming in in verse 20 The Lord said that if anyone hears his voice and opens the door, he will come into him. As we have pointed out, the Lord is standing outside the degraded church, knocking at her door. The door is the door of the church, not of individuals, but the door is opened by individual believers. The Lord is dealing with the whole church, but the acceptance of the Lord's dealing must be a personal matter. The Lord's dealing is objective, but the believer's acceptance must be subjective. If we hear the Lord's voice to the church and personally open the door, the Lord will come into us, and his presence will be our portion. B. To dine with the Lord in verse 20 the Lord also said that, after he comes into him who opens the door, he will dine with him and he with him. According to the Greek, the word dine signifies the principal meal of the day at evening. 
To dine is not merely to eat one item of food, but to partake of the riches of a meal. This may imply the fulfillment of the type of the children of Israel eating the rich produce of the good land of Canaan, Josh. 5.10-12 The dining promised here is not only for the future but also for today. If you are an overcomer, when the Lord comes in the kingdom, you will have the special privilege of eating with him. Before that day, however, you may enjoy his dining with you. Many Christians borrow verse 20 for preaching the gospel in an inadequate way. They tell the sinners that Christ is knocking at the door of their heart and that if they open the door, he will come in. This is all they say. Have you ever heard a message telling you that, if you open the door, Christ will come into you and dine with you? If we have an overall view of the seven epistles in Revelation 2 and 3, we shall see that the Lord exalts the eating of himself, the taking in of himself as our life supply, that we may grow, be transformed, and be the same as he is. This is absolutely a matter of eating Jesus as the tree of life, the manna, and as the biggest meal of the day. As the Lord exalts the eating of himself, he simultaneously repudiates four kinds of teaching, the teaching of Balaam, 2.14, the teaching of the Nicolaitans, 2.15, the teaching of Jezebel, 2.20, and the teaching of the depths of Satan, 2.24. If you do not have the ability to discern counterfeit currency from genuine currency, it is better not to accept any currency at all. Rather, accept only genuine gold. Likewise, it is better not to accept teachings, but only to take the living Christ. In the Old Testament, we see three stages of the eating of Christ, the tree of life in the garden, the manna in the wilderness, and the rich produce of the good land. We have been in these stages. We were created in the garden. Then, due to the fall, we found ourselves in Egypt. After we were saved, we made our exodus out of the world and were on our way to meet the Lord. As we were journeying to meet the Lord, we were in the wilderness where there was manna. Recall that the promise of the hidden manna is given to the overcomers in the worldly church, indicating that Pergamos had returned to Egypt. Manna was not available in Egypt. It was only in the wilderness, and the hidden manna was only found within the Holy of Holies. The church in Pergamos became a worldly church, a church in Egypt where there was no manna. If we would eat manna, whether open or hidden manna, we must come out of Egypt. We must escape from that place where Satan dwells and where his throne is and go out into the wilderness where we may firstly eat the open manna and then come forward into the Holy of Holies and dive into the ark to eat the hidden manna. It seems that eventually the seven epistles bring us into the good land, which is Christ. Here, in the good land, we feast on Christ. During the yearly feasts, the children of Israel feasted with God and God feasted with them. This may be a type of the promise to the overcomer in Laodicea. The Lord's promise to dine with whomever opened to him may imply the thought of enjoying the rich produce of the good land of Canaan during the annual feasts. Hence, the epistle to the church in Ephesus refers to the eating of the tree of life, the epistle to the church in Pergamos points to the eating of the hidden manna outside of the world and the epistle to the church in Laodicea alludes to the enjoyment of the rich produce of the good land of Canaan at the time of the yearly feasts. Whenever the Israelites had a feast, they ate with God, offering what they were eating to God and letting God eat with them. In like manner, the Lord says that he will dine with us and that we shall dine with him. If we have this overview, then we shall know what we must emphasize today. We are not for teachings we are for the full enjoyment of Christ as the tree of life, as the manna, and as the rich produce of the good land. C. To sit with the Lord on his throne in verse 21 the Lord said, He who overcomes, to him I will give to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. To sit with the Lord on his throne will be a price to the overcomer that he may participate in the Lord's authority in the coming millennial kingdom. This means that the overcomers will be CO kings with Christ ruling over the whole earth. Once again I say that, strictly speaking, all the promises in these seven epistles concern the coming kingdom. Any negative word regarding loss or suffering refers to a loss during the coming kingdom, and any positive word regarding gain or enjoyment refers to the enjoyment of Christ as our special portion during the age of the kingdom. 
we must have the insight to understand these promises in a proper way. Nevertheless, in principle, these promises may also be applied today and we may pre-taste them now. There is no need to wait until we enter into the kingdom age to enjoy all these special portions. Today in the church life we are privileged to enjoy the kingdom. Praise the Lord for the church life. 7. The spirits speaking the lukewarm church is filled with cooling knowledge, but lacks the burning spirit. She desperately needs the speaking of the living spirit. She no longer needs dead knowledge. If she forgets all her dead knowledge and listens to the speaking of the living spirit, she will be delivered from her degraded condition. As we have seen, the seven churches not only signify prophetically the progress of the church in seven ages, but also symbolize the seven kinds of churches in church history, the initial church, the suffering church, the worldly church, the apostate church, the reformed church, the recovered church, and the degraded recovered church. The initial church had its continuation in the suffering church. The suffering church turned into the worldly church. And the worldly church became the apostate church. Hence, the first four churches eventually issued in one kind of church, that is, the apostate church, the Roman Catholic church. Then, as a reaction to the apostate church, the reformed church came into existence as another kind of church, a church not fully recovered. Following this, the recovered church was raised up as a full recovery of the proper church life. This may be considered the third kind of church. By the degradation of the recovered church, the degraded recovered church came into being. This may be counted as the fourth kind of church. All these four kinds of churches will remain until the Lord comes back. Undoubtedly, only the recovered church can fulfill God's eternal purpose, and only she is what the Lord is after. We must take the Lord's choice. Life Study of Revelation Message 17 The scene in heaven after Christ's ascension All Christians know that Christ has ascended into heaven and that he is in heaven today. However, not many are familiar with the scene in heaven after Christ's ascension. This scene is quite particular, and we need to see it very clearly. Revelation 4 1 says, After these things I saw, and behold, a door opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. God's plan is hidden in heaven. When God finds a man on earth after his heart, heaven is opened to him. It was opened to Jacob, Gen. 28,12-17, to Ezekiel, Isaac. 1,1, to Jesus, Matt. 3,16, to Stephen, Acts 7,56, and to Peter, Acts 10:11. Here, and in 19:11, it is opened to John, the writer of this book, and it will be opened to all believers in the Lord in eternity, John 1:51. I, a throne in heaven, verse 2 says, immediately I was in spirit, and behold, there was a throne set in heaven. In heaven, there is firstly a throne, and the book of Revelation is focused upon it. Beginning with chapter 4, this book unveils God's universal administration. The throne of God in Revelation is the center of God's administration. While the throne in the epistles is the throne of grace from which we receive mercy and find grace, Hebrew 4.16, the throne here is the throne of judgment from which the world receives judgment. This is God's throne in heaven. The whole universe, especially the earth, is under this throne. Whatever Satan does in the air and whatever man does on earth is under God's throne in heaven. Today, man may do anything he likes, but the throne of God in heaven is still the authority over all men and all things. No one can do anything and nothing can happen outside of the rule of God's throne. Apparently, this throne is invisible and is not realized by man, but actually it is behind the scene ruling over everyone and everything. In God's time and for the fulfillment of God's purpose, the appropriate judgment always comes out of this throne to mankind and upon the things transpiring on earth. In the book of Revelation, the consummate issue comes from the completion of the execution of God's judgment. This judgment proceeds from the throne and clears up the confusion both in heaven and on earth caused by Satan's rebellion and man's fall. A. 
A rainbow around the throne in appearance of an emerald In verse 3 we see that there is a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. The rainbow is a sign of God's covenant with man and living creatures that he will not destroy them again with the flood. General 9 8-17 In this book, God will judge the earth with all its inhabitants. The rainbow around his throne signifies that God is the covenanting God, the faithful God, who will keep his covenant while executing his judgment upon the earth in that he will not judge mankind again with a flood nor destroy all mankind, but will keep some to be the nations of the earth for his glory. 21 24, 26 this rainbow indicates that God is faithful in his administration toward mankind. In this chapter, God is about to judge mankind, but in exercising his judgment, he will remember his covenant with Noah. He is the judging God and he is also the covenant-keeping God. This rainbow is like an emerald in appearance. An emerald is a precious stone having a grass-green color, which signifies the lives on earth. This indicates that while God executes his judgment upon the earth, he will still remember his covenant and spare some of the lives on earth as indicated in Genesis 9:11. An emerald, being a precious stone, is solid. God's reminder to keep his covenant is solid. There is this solid reminder around the throne. B. Out of the throne coming forth lightnings, voices, and thunders in verse 5 we are told that out of the throne come lightnings and voices and thunders. All these signify God's wrath in his judgment. In the epistles, out of the throne of grace come the mercy and grace of God for anyone who approaches him through the redeeming blood of Christ. But here, out of the throne of judgment come forth lightnings, voices, and thunders as warnings to the sinful world. In the book of Revelation, after all God's judgments have been executed, the throne of God will be the throne of eternal life supply out of which will proceed the river of water of life with the tree of life growing in it. All the believers who are participating in God's mercy and grace today by approaching God's throne of grace will enjoy the river of life and the tree of life out of God's throne as their life supply for eternity, while the unbelievers, who will be judged by God's throne of judgment, will have no share in the eternal enjoyment issuing out of God's eternal throne. C. Seven lamps of fire burning before the throne verse 5 also tells us that seven lamps of fire are burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. This indicates that God will touch the earth by the seven lamps, by his seven spirits which are burning, shining, observing, searching, and judging. The seven lamps here refer to the seven lamps of the lampstand in Exodus 25:37 and the seven lamps of the lampstand in Zechariah 4:2. The seven lamps of fire which are the seven spirits of God signify the enlightening and searching of the sevenfold intensified spirit of God. In Exodus 25 and Zechariah 4, the seven lamps, signifying the enlightening of the spirit of God in God's move, are for God's building, either for the tabernacle or the building of the temple. Here the seven lamps are for God's judgment, which will issue also in God's building the building of the new Jerusalem. While God executes his judgment, his sevenfold intensified spirit will carry out God's eternal building by searching, enlightening, judging, and infusing. This is fully developed in the following chapters. The issue is the consummation of the holy city, New Jerusalem. D. A glassy sea before the throne verse 6 says, and before the throne there was as it were a glassy sea like crystal. The glassy sea is a collector and container of everything judged by God. This sea is not of water, but of fire, 15:2. Since the deluge, God, in accordance with his promise not to judge the earth and living creatures again with water, Gen. 9:15, always exercises his judgment upon man with fire, General 19:24, Leviticus 10:2, Number 11:1, 1635, Dan 7:11, Revelation 14:11, 18:8. 1920, 20,9-10, 21, 8. God's throne of judgment is like the fiery flame out of which a fiery stream issues, Dan 7,9-10. The flame of God's judging fire sweeps all negative things in the entire universe into this glassy sea, which eventually becomes the lake of fire, 2014. The glassy sea, being the aggregate of all God's fiery judgment, is like crystal, 
signifying that every negative thing under God's judgment is crystal clear. Whatever is judged and kept in the glassy sea is fully exposed. Nothing is hidden. In this chapter we have the rainbow around the throne of God, signifying that God will keep his promise in Genesis 9,8-17, and we also have the glassy sea of fire, indicating that God will still judge all negative things with fire. 2. God sitting on the throne a in appearance of a jasper stone and a sardius when John saw the throne set in heaven, he saw one sitting upon the throne, and he who was sitting was like in appearance to a jasper stone and a sardius, and there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. God on the throne has the appearance of a jasper stone. According to 2111, jasper is a most precious stone. Clear as crystal. Its color must be dark green, which signifies life in its richness. Jasper here, as 2111 indicates, signifies God's communicable glory in his rich life, John 17:22, 2. It is the appearance of God, which will also be the appearance of the holy city, New Jerusalem, 2111. The city's wall and first foundation are built with it, 21:18-19. In the Bible green signifies life. Thus, the color of jasper indicates that the God who is sitting on the throne is the very God of life. God's color firstly is green, testifying that he is the source of life. God on the throne is also in the appearance of a sardius stone. Sardius is a most precious stone, red in color, which signifies redemption. Today, God is not only the God of life, but also the God of redemption. While jasper indicates God as the God of glory in his rich life, Sardius signifies God as the God of redemption. Because we, his created ones, fell, he came in to redeem through the blood of Christ. Therefore, he has two colors the color of life and the color of redemption. He is the life-giving God and also the redeeming God. On the breastplate of the high priest in the Old Testament, the first stone was Sardius and the last Jasper, Exo. 28 colon 17, 20. This signifies that God's redeemed people have their beginning in God's redemption and their consummation in God's glory of life. b. On his right hand a scroll according to 5 colon 1, in the hand of him who sits upon the throne there was a scroll. This life-giving and redeeming God has a mystery which is held in his hand. This mystery concerns the destiny of the universe and is sealed with seven seals. The mystery, the secret of the universe is held by the God of life and redemption. 3. 24 elders sitting on 24 thrones around the throne verse 4 says, and around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments, and golden crowns on their heads. The elders in this verse are not the elders of the church, but the elders of the angels, because here, before the Lord's second coming, they are sitting on thrones already. CF Matt 19:28, Revelation 20:4. In God's creation, angels are the most ancient ones. In the Bible there are different types of elders, the elders of the Israelites, the elders of the churches, and as here, the elders of the angels. The elders of the angels are the elders of the whole creation of God. That they sit on thrones with golden crowns on their heads indicates that they must be the rulers of the universe until the millennial kingdom, when the authority to rule the earth will be given to the overcoming saints, Hebrew 2,5-9, Revelation 2,26-27, 20 20,4. The white garments with which they are clothed reveal that these angelic elders are sinless, having no need of the washing by the blood of the Lamb as do the redeemed saints, 7,14. These 24 elders are clothed in white garments and have golden crowns on their heads. That they are clothed in white garments and have a harp and golden bowls full of incense, 5 8, indicates that now they are also priests before God, whereas, in the millennial kingdom, the reigning overcomers will be the priests of God and of Christ, 20 6. These 24 angels must be the universal priests. Their golden crowns indicate that they are also ruling ones. They are priests serving God and kings reigning over his creation. Before the creation of man, God had the leading angels as his priests and ruling instruments. 
According to Ezekiel 28, before Satan fell, he was such a one. He was God's priest and also a king. Even when the devil, Satan, tempted the Lord Jesus, showing him all the kingdoms of the inhabited earth in a moment of time, he said, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, because to me it has been delivered, and to whomsoever I want I give it. Luke 4 5 6. The world was given him before the Adamic age. Thus, there was an age during which God gave authority to Satan, making him a king to reign over that universe. Likewise, these twenty-four elders were God's priests and kings. The number of the angelic elders, twenty-four, is composed of two times twelve. Twelve is the number of the completion of God's administration, Matt 19.28. David divided both the priests and the Levites into twenty-four groups, one cron. 24 and 25, to carry out God's administrative service. The number 24 indicates that, before the church is installed to replace them, the angelic elders are the ones who carry out God's administration. 12 times 2 signifies strengthening by doubling, indicating that the divine administration carried out by the angelic elders is strong. 4. Four living creatures in the midst of and around the throne in the Bible, the number of the living creatures, Four, always stands for the four ends that cover the whole universe or the whole earth. In Genesis 2.10 the one river became four heads to reach the entire earth. In Jeremiah 49.36 are the four quarters of heaven, and in Isaiah 11.12. Revelation 7.1 And 20.8 are the four corners of the earth. Hence, the number of the living creatures reveals that they represent all the creatures on earth and in heaven except the angels who are represented by the twenty-four elders. A. Full of eyes in front, behind, and within verse 6 says that in the midst of the throne and around the throne there were four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. According to verse 8, they are also full of eyes around and within. The most striking feature of the four living creatures is their eyes. They are full of eyes in front, behind, and within, and they can see in any direction without turning. Eyes are for living things to receive light and vision. That the four living creatures are full of eyes indicates that they are absolutely not opaque, but are crystal clear on every side and in every aspect. Christians should be like that, full of eyes. When we are full of eyes, we are transparent. If a person has no eyes, he is completely opaque. Our eyes make us transparent. If we had hundreds of eyes over our body, both within and without, our whole being would be transparent. In the presence of God, we, the redeemed people, should be like this. b. Having each six wings verse 8 says, and the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings. In appearance, the four living creatures resemble the cherubim in Ezekiel 1 colon 5 dash 10 and 10 colon 14 dash 15. According to their six wings, they are like the seraphim in Isaiah 6 colon 2. The cherubim in Exodus 25 colon 20 and 1 Kings 6 27 have two wings, and the cherubim in Ezekiel 1 colon 6 have four wings. They must be a combination of the cherubim and the seraphim. As the seraphim, they are for God's holiness, ISA. 6 colon 3, referring to God's nature, and as the cherubim, they are for God's glory, Isaac. 10 colon 18 dash 19, Hebrew. 9 colon 5, referring to God's expression. Hence, they stand for God's nature and expression. C. In appearance of a lion, a calf, a man, and a flying eagle verse 7 says, and the first living creature was like a lion, and the second living creature like a calf, and the third living creature having the face like that of man, and the fourth living creature like a flying eagle. Around the throne of God, the twenty-four elders represent all the angels, whereas the four living creatures represent all other living creatures. The first living creature, like a lion, represents the beasts. The second, like a calf, represents the cattle. The third, like a man, represents mankind. And the fourth, like an eagle, represents the fowl. Of the six categories of living things created by God, Gen. 1 20-28 
two are not represented here the creeping things on earth and the living things in the water. The head of the creeping things is the serpent, a symbol of God's enemy, Satan, who, having been cast into the lake of fire, will have no place in the new heaven and the new earth. And the living things in the water are in the water of God's judgment which will no longer be in the new heaven and the new earth, 21.1. Hence, these two categories are not represented before God for eternity. Among the four living creatures, the calf is clean, but the lion and the eagle are unclean, Lef. 11.3-8, Having been redeemed, they have all become clean, Acts 10.11-16. Among them, the calf and the man are meek and gentle, but the lion and the eagle are wild and fierce. Through redemption, they can dwell together, Isa 11.6-9. Christ's redemption is not only for man but for all things, col. 120, because he died on behalf of everything, Hebrew 2 9. V. The worship of God in 4 8 11 we see the worship of God. Here we do not yet have the worship of the Lamb, for the Lamb does not appear until the next chapter. This chapter only presents the scene into which Christ ascended. The worship of God here is by the four living creatures representing all the creatures, vv. 8-9, and by the twenty-four elders representing all the angels, verses 10-11. In this scene, all the creatures are worshipping God. In verse 8 the living creatures say, Holy, 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 Lord God the Almighty, who was, and who is, and who is coming. The mention of holy three times as in Isaiah 6 3 implies the thought of God being triune. Also, the mention of God's existence with three tenses implies the thought of his being triune. The praises of both the four living creatures, v. 9, and the twenty-four elders, v. 11, are composed of three things, implying that they are praising the triune God. The first two things, glory and honor, are the same in both places, but the last one is different. In the praises of the four living creatures, the last one is thanks, because they are redeemed and are grateful for the redemption of God's grace, whereas, in the praises of the twenty-four elders, the last one is power, because, as the rulers of the universe and not the redeemed creatures, they appreciate the power of God by which they rule. In verse 11 the twenty-four elders say, You are worthy our Lord and God, to receive the glory and the honor and the power, for you have created all things, and because of your will they were and have been created. God is a God of purpose, having a will of his own pleasure. He created all things for his will that he might accomplish and fulfill his purpose. This book, Unveiling God's Universal Administration, shows us the purpose of God. Hence, in the praise of the twenty-four elders concerning his creation, his creation is related to his will. As the ones who carry out God's administration in the universe, the twenty-four angelic elders speak out in their praises the will of God's creation. People can easily realize the creation of God, but they scarcely know the will, the purpose, of God's creation. The praise of the angelic elders is an introduction to the contents of this book, which unveil the will, the purpose of God's creation to have an eternal habitation for God's satisfaction and expression. This is the holy city, New Jerusalem. In the New Jerusalem, God's will in creation will be completely revealed and fulfilled. God will be fully satisfied and wholly expressed in and through the New Jerusalem. This is God's will in his creation and it is the goal of the book of Revelation. The praise of the angelic elders points us to this and Revelation proceeds on toward this and eventually brings us to this, the ultimate consummation of God's will in his creation. Life Study of Revelation Message 18 The Worthy Lion Lamb In Chapter 4 we see the scene in heaven after Christ's ascension. The throne of God is the center of the scene in Chapter 4, and God is sitting on the throne ready to execute his universal administration for the fulfillment of his eternal purpose. In Chapter 5 we have the same scene after Christ ascended there. As we shall see in this message, the center of this scene is the worthy lion lamb. I. The secrecy of God's administration Revelation 5 1 says, And I saw on the right hand of him who sits upon the throne a scroll, written within and on the back, 
sealed with seven seals. God's administration is a secret, a mystery. Throughout the centuries, many wise men have earnestly tried to learn what the secret of this universe is. Because they did not have the revelation, they failed. In the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, we have an unveiling of God's economy. In 5 colon 1 the one sitting on the throne has a scroll in his hand sealed with seven seals. These seven seals are actually the contents of the scroll and the contents of the book of Revelation, for this book is the opening, the unveiling, of the seven seals. The scroll itself must be the new covenant, the grand title deed enacted with the blood of the Lamb. The new covenant is a scroll covering the redemption of the church, Israel, the world, and the universe. The book of Revelation is a record of God's thought concerning the church, Israel, the world, and the universe. When Christ died on the cross, he tasted death not only for man, but for everything, Hebrew 2 9. Here we see the secrecy of God's administration in the universe. While the New Testament was enacted by the death of Christ, it has been a mystery to mankind. The New Covenant is the secret of the universe and the content of the book of Revelation. As we read Revelation, we must realize that in vision after vision we are seeing what is included in this New Covenant, what is contained in this secret and sealed scroll. Now, after Christ's ascension, there should no longer be a secret, for it has been unsealed by Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension. Before his death, there was a mystery that no man knew anything about. But by his death, resurrection, and ascension, he has fulfilled all of God's requirements. Thus, as we shall see, he has opened the mystery and revealed it to John, charging him to commit it to writing. Therefore, this book is just the open secret, or scroll, in God's hand. It is no longer a secret it is an open mystery. Now, as we are reading the book of Revelation, we are reading the contents of the scroll that has been unsealed by the ascended Christ. This is a great matter, and few Christians are aware of it. Most Christians have the book of Revelation, but not many have the unsealed scroll, because they do not realize that Revelation is the unsealed scroll. 2. No one worthy in 5 colon 2-4 we see that no one in heaven, on earth, or under the earth was worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. When John first saw the scroll, it was still sealed. If we had been there, we, like John, certainly would have been desirous to see what was contained in that scroll. But John wept much because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. If actually no one worthy was found in the whole universe, we would surely need to weep, for the whole universe would be vanity, with none qualified to unveil its secret. If there were no Christ in this universe, the whole universe would weep. But there is Christ, and we do not need to weep. 3. The Worthy Lion Lamb A. The Lion of the tribe of Judah while John was weeping, one of the elders said to him, Do not weep. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has overcome to open the scroll and its seven seals. This refers to Genesis 49,8-9, where Christ is portrayed as a lion, which is a symbol of him as a strong fighter against the enemy. We have pointed out that nearly everything in Revelation is a fulfillment of what is mentioned in the Old Testament. Christ is the fighting, victorious, and overcoming lion. He has won the battle. Hence, his overcoming qualifies him to open the scroll and its seven seals. Although the angel told John to behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, verse 6 says, I saw in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, a lamb standing as having been slain. The angel recommended Christ as the lion, but John saw him as the lamb. As the lion, he is the fighter against the enemy. As the lamb, he is the redeemer for us. He has fought to redeem us, and he has won the battle over the enemy and accomplished redemption for us. To the enemy, he is a lion. To us, he is a lamb. Although the angels do not need redemption, they need someone to defeat the enemy of God, for one among them became God's enemy. Thus the angels realize that there is a need for someone to defeat this rebel. To the angels, Christ was the lion who defeated the rebel, but to us, including the apostle John, Christ is the lamb, the redeeming one. 
we need Christ's redemption. As we have already pointed out, in the universe there are two main problems Satan and sin. As the lion, Christ has defeated and destroyed Satan, and as the lamb, he has taken away our sin. He has won the victory and he has accomplished redemption. Now he is the lion lamb. Verse 6 reveals that the lamb is standing in the midst of the throne. As far as redemption is concerned, Christ sat down after his ascension at the right hand of God in heaven, Hebrew 1 colon 3. 10 12, whereas, regarding the carrying out of God's administration, he is still standing in his ascension. B. The root of David in verse 5 Christ is given the title, the root of David. This title, he is also the root of David's father Jesse, ISA. 11 colon 1 signifies that Christ is the source of David. Therefore, as his forefather, David called him the Lord, Matt. 22,42-45. He is the root of David. In our concept, Christ was born of David, so he was a descendant of David. But here it says that Christ is the root of David, meaning that David grows out of Christ. The Bible also says that Christ is the branch of David, J23 colon 5. Hence, he is both the root and the branch. In Isaiah 11 colon 1 and 10 we see that Christ is also a branch and root of Jesse. We have seen that Christ is both a descendant and the root of David. In the eyes of God, David was the unique person who fought the battle and gained authority, fighting the battle for God and gaining his full authority. That Christ, the Lion Lamb, is the root of this person means that he is greater than David. This is why he holds the key of David, 3 colon 7. Whatever David was, had, and did was altogether out of this root. Therefore, as the root of David, Christ is more powerful and more victorious than David and has more of God's divine authority. C. The slain lamb in verse 6 John said that he saw a lamb standing as having been slain. According to the Greek, having been slain indicates that the lamb has just recently been slain. When John saw Christ as the Lamb, he had been freshly slain. This also indicates that the scene in heaven depicted in this chapter is immediately after Christ's ascension into heaven. D. Having overcome as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, Christ has overcome Satan, the enemy of God. He has solved this problem for God and has removed the hindrances to the fulfillment of God's purpose. Hence, he is worthy to open the scroll concerning God's economy. E. Worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals God's purpose needs someone to carry it out who can solve all the problems of God. The problems which God had were the rebellion of Satan and the fall of man. As the lion, Christ has defeated the rebellious Satan, and as the lamb, he has taken away the sin of fallen man. Since he has solved these two problems for God, he is worthy to open the scroll of God's economy. F. Having seven horns in verse 6 John says that the Lamb has seven horns. Horns signify strength in fighting, Deuteronomy 33,17. Christ is the redeeming Lamb, yet with fighting horns. He is the fighting Redeemer, and his fighting is complete in God's move as signified by the number seven. G. Having seven eyes verse 6 also says that the Lamb has seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. The Lamb's eyes are for observing and searching. As the redeeming Lamb, Christ has seven observing and searching eyes for executing God's judgment upon the universe to fulfill God's eternal purpose, which will consummate in the building up of the New Jerusalem. Therefore, in Zechariah 3 9 he is prophesied as the stone, which is the top stone, Zech. 4 7, Hebrew. With seven eyes for God's building. These seven eyes are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth, running to and fro through the whole earth, Zech 4.10. In his Gospel John said that Christ was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John 1.29. But here in Revelation 5 John sees the Lamb as having seven eyes. Although John saw the Lamb that had been slain, he did not see blood flowing. Rather, he saw seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God. These seven eyes are surely not for redemption. The Lamb in the Gospel of John shed his blood and out of his side flowed water. 
but the Lamb in Revelation has seven flaming eyes that shine out and reach far to touch people. According to the black and white letters, this is for judgment, but actually it is for God's building. You may wonder what my basis is for saying that the seven searching, enlightening eyes are for God's building. The Bible tells us clearly that these seven eyes are the seven lamps, Zech 3 colon 9, 4 colon 2, 10. The seven lamps are first mentioned in Exodus 25. There, the lamps are neither for searching nor for judging but for God's building. The seven lamps mentioned there are for the building up of the tabernacle, God's dwelling place among men on earth. Apparently, the seven flaming eyes of the Lamb are for searching and judging. However, this searching and judging is a procedure to attain the consummate goal of building. Eventually, the book of Revelation is not just for judgment but for building. Most expositions of Revelation say that it is a book of judgment. But this judgment is a procedure which will consummate in the New Jerusalem. What appears after the judgment has been executed? The New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem issues out of God's judgment which is carried out by the seven eyes. As we have already pointed out, a person's eyes cannot be separated from him, for a person's eyes are his expression. Our inner being is mainly expressed through our eyes. In like manner, the seven spirits are the seven eyes of Christ by which Christ expresses himself. If anyone says that the spirit is separate from Christ, then he must lack knowledge and be short-sighted. How can anyone say that a person's eyes are separate from him? This is ridiculous. Are not the seven spirits the Holy Spirit, and are not the seven spirits the eyes of Christ? Then how can anyone say that the Holy Spirit, who is the seven spirits, is separate from Christ? The Son is the embodiment of the Father, and the Spirit is the expression of the Son. The seven eyes of Christ, the seven spirits of God, are Christ's expression in a judging way in God's move for God's building. Even now, Christ's burning eyes are flaming over us to enlighten, search, refine, and judge us, not that we might be condemned, but that we might be purged, transformed, and conformed to his image for God's building. The Lord's judgment is motivated by love. Because he loves the church, he comes to search, enlighten, judge, refine, and purify us in order to transform us into precious stones. Eventually, this book consummates in the New Jerusalem which is built with precious materials. Where do these materials come from? They come from the seven eyes of Christ, that is, from the life-giving, transforming spirit. In the book of Revelation the spirit is not called the life-giving spirit or the transforming spirit, but the seven spirits which are the seven burning, searching, judging lamps. For the degraded church, the spirit who gives life must be the sevenfold burning spirit. Today, the life-giving spirit must be the flaming spirit and the transforming spirit must be the searching and judging spirit. His searching and judging are his purifying and transforming. No one can be transformed into a precious stone without being searched by him. How I look to the Lord that he would search us all. We are not here for doctrine and teaching. We are here under the enlightening of the pure word and under the searching of the seven spirits. We all need to be thoroughly searched, purified, and refined. If we are, we shall never be the same. In Exodus 25 the seven lamps are for the building of God's dwelling place on earth, and in Zechariah 3 the seven eyes are the seven eyes of the stone. In Revelation we have the lion lamb, and in Zechariah we have the stone. Because in Revelation the seven eyes are on the lamb and in Zechariah they are on the stone, we may say that the lamb is the lamb stone. The lamb stone is for God's building. That Christ, the lamb of God, is the building stone with the seven eyes proves that the seven eyes of Christ are for God's building. In the Lord's recovery, everyone is under the searching, judging, and purifying of the Spirit of Christ, and today the Spirit of Christ is the sevenfold flaming Spirit. Although He is the life-giving and transforming Spirit, to the degraded church He is the seven burning spirits. We are not only preaching the Lamb in John 1, but also ministering the Lamb in Revelation 5. We are ministering this lamb as the building stone with seven spirits. Our Savior is such a one, 
having the seven spirits to spread himself, express himself, and infuse himself into all his members to transform us into precious material for God's building. 4. The worship and praise of the four living creatures and twenty-four elders to the Lamb A. Having harps and golden bowls full of incense in verses 8 through 10 we see the worship and praise of the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders to the Lamb. The four living creatures and the twenty-four elders have harps and golden bowls full of incense. In verse 8, the word which refers to bowls, not to incense. The bowls are the prayers of the saints brought to God by the angelic elders, cf. 8,3-4, whereas the incense is Christ added to the saints' prayers. That these worshippers are holding the bowls means that they, as priests, are ministering to God by bringing the saints' prayers to him. This reveals that before the Christians become priests in the Millennial Kingdom, the 24 elders are priests today. Eventually, we shall replace them. This is proved by 4.10 where we are told that the 24 elders shall cast their crowns before the throne, indicating that they will resign from their posts. When the redeemed saints have been perfected and glorified to be the proper priest kings, the temporary priests, the elderly angels, will resign. At the time of the millennium, the overcoming saints will be the perfected, completed, and proper priests and kings to God. When that time comes, the temporary priests and ruling ones will resign. But here in chapter 5 they are still priests offering the saints prayers with Christ as the incense to God. b. Singing a new song, praising the Lamb in verses 9 and 10 we see the elders singing a new song of praise to the Lamb. Verse 9 says, and they sing a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and did purchase to God by your blood men out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. The song here is new because the Lamb whom it praises has been recently slain. This new song praises the worthiness of the Lamb. As we have seen, in the whole universe no one is worthy to open the mystery of God's economy but Christ, the overcoming Lion and redeeming Lamb. As the overcoming lion he has defeated Satan for God, and as the redeeming lamb he has put away sin for us. He is the only one qualified to unveil the mystery of God's economy and to carry it out. Speaking of those who have been purchased to God by the lamb's blood, the twenty-four elders sing in verse 10, and made them to our God a kingdom and priests, and they shall reign on the earth. The word them in this verse proves that the praising elders are not of the church but of the angels. Kingdom is for kingship to exercise God's authority, and priests are for the priesthood to accomplish the divine ministry. v. The universal praise to God and to the Lamb In verses 11 through 14 we see the universal praise to God and to the Lamb by the angels under the leadership of the twenty-four elders, v. v. 11 to 12, and by all the creatures under the leadership of the four living creatures, verses 13 to 14. The many angels, represented by the twenty-four elders, render to the Lamb the angelic praise. Every creature, represented by the four living creatures, follows them to give the Lamb the universal praise of all creatures other than the angels. God's economy with his redemption is for the accomplishment of his eternal dwelling place, the New Jerusalem. God's anointed one, Christ, is the Lion, the Lamb, and the Stone. He has destroyed the enemy, has redeemed us, and has become the stone. In Matthew 21:42, the Lord said to the Pharisees who were opposing him, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected, this has become the cornerstone? This was from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Here the Lord indicated that his redemption was for him to be the cornerstone. We find the same thought in Acts 4:11 and 12. Acts 4.12 says that neither is there another name under heaven given among men in which we must be saved. That this name is the name of Christ, the cornerstone, is revealed in the previous verse which says that the stone which was despised by the builders has become the cornerstone. Thus, the name of the cornerstone is the name by which we are saved. What are we saved for for going to heaven? No, we are saved to become a stone for God's building. The concept in Revelation is that of Christ's being the lion to defeat and destroy the enemy, the lamb to redeem us, and the stone to build God's eternal dwelling place. In what way does Christ build up God's dwelling place? By the way of the seven spirits as the seven burning, 
enlightening, searching, judging, and infusing eyes. By means of the seven spirits he transforms us into precious stones to be built up into the new Jerusalem. Life study of Revelation Message 19 World History from Christ's Ascension to the End of this Age Seals 1 through 4 In this message we come to the first four seals with the four horses and the four riders, 6,1-8. I. The opening of the secrecy of God's administration by the Lamb Revelation 6,1 says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying as with a voice of thunder, Come. The opening of the seven seals by the Lamb transpired immediately after Christ's ascension to the heavens. Through his incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection, Christ is fully qualified in his ascension to open the mystery of God's economy which is contained in the seven seals. Because God's economy concerning the creatures is contained in the seven seals, the four living creatures are interested in announcing the opening of the first four seals respectively. 2. A four-horse race constituting world history The first four seals comprise four horses with their riders in a four-horse race. All four riders are not real persons but personified things. It is evident that the rider of the second horse, the red horse, is war, v4. The rider of the third horse, the black horse, is famine, v5. And the rider of the fourth horse, the pale horse, is death, v8. According to historical facts, the rider of the first horse, the white horse, must be the gospel, not, as some interpret, Christ or Antichrist. Immediately after Christ's ascension, these four things the gospel, war, famine, and death began to run like riders on four horses and will continue until Christ comes back. Beginning with the first century, the gospel has been spreading throughout all these twenty centuries. War has also been proceeding simultaneously. War always causes famine, and famine issues in death. All these will continue until the end of this age. A. The rider of the white horse The rider of the white horse is the preaching of the gospel. White signifies clean, pure, just, and approvable. The white horse is a symbol of the preaching of the gospel, which is clean, pure, just, and approvable both to men and to God. Some have said that the rider on the white horse is Christ, and others have claimed that the rider is the Antichrist. After much study, we learned that neither of these concepts is right. In interpreting the Bible we must follow the principle. The principle here is that the riders on the four horses are not persons but personified things. The rider on the second horse is war, the rider on the third is famine, and the rider on the fourth is death. None of these are persons but rather are personified things. Following this principle, the rider of the first horse must also be a personified thing. Therefore, the rider can be neither Christ nor Antichrist. According to the principle, this rider must also be a personification. After much consideration, we have seen that this rider must be the preaching of the gospel. 1. Having a bow signifying that the battle was fought verse 2 says, I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he who sits on it having a bow. And a crown was given to him, and he went forth conquering and that he might conquer. A bow is for fighting with an arrow. But here there is a bow without an arrow. This indicates that the arrow has already been shot to destroy the enemy, and the victory has been won for the constitution of the gospel of peace. Now the fighting is over, and the gospel of peace is proclaimed in a peaceful way. On the cross, the arrow was shot into the heart of the enemy, the battle was fought, and the victory was won. Therefore, the bow without an arrow is a declaration that the war is over and that the victory has been won. 2. Given a crown signifying the glory of the gospel verse 2 also says that a crown was given to him. A crown is a sign of glory. The gospel has been crowned with the glory of Christ, 2 cor 4 colon 4, gk. And it is called the gospel of the glory of Christ. The gospel we preach is the gospel crowned with the glory of Christ. We not only preach the gospel of grace, but also the gospel of glory. 3. Going forth conquering verse 2 also says that the rider on the white horse went forth conquering and that he might conquer. Throughout all the centuries, wherever the gospel is proclaimed, 
it has conquered and has overcome all kinds of opposition and attack and it is still conquering today. We are not told that the riders on the second, third, and fourth horses went forth conquering. Only the rider on the first horse, the preaching of the gospel, has been conquering continuously. Wherever the preaching of the gospel goes, there is this conquering. B. The rider of the red horse verses 3 and 4 say, And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come. And I saw, and behold, another, a red horse went forth. And to him who sits on it, to him it was given to take peace from the earth, and that they should slay one another. And a great sword was given to him. Red here signifies the shedding of blood. Thus, the red horse is a symbol of the raging of war, which is altogether a matter of shedding blood. To take peace from the earth, they should slay one another, and a great sword was given to him all clearly indicate war. Since Christ's ascension, the preaching of the gospel has been followed by war. C. The rider of the black horse verses 5 and 6 say, And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come. And I saw, and behold, a black horse. And he who sits on it having a balance in his hand. And I heard as it were a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A kernix of wheat for a denarius, and three conixes of barley for a denarius. And do not harm the oil and the wine. Here, black, indicating the dearth, J. 14 4 signifies the color of the visage of famished people, lamb 4 8 9, 5 9 10. The black horse is a symbol of the spreading of famine, which causes a black visage. A balance is a scale used to weigh precious things. But here it is used to weigh food, as mentioned in verse 6, thus showing the scarcity of food, Leviticus 26 26, Isaac 4 16. Oil and wine are for man's pleasure, PSA 104:15. They are always short and become precious in famine. During a famine, oil and wine should be preserved and not harmed. Famine always follows war, for war causes food to be scarce. If there were another war today, the world would have a food shortage. D. The rider of the pale horse verses 7 and 8 say, And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. And I saw, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sits upon it is Death. And Hades followed him. And authority was given to them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with death and by the beasts of the earth. The rider on the fourth horse is clearly identified as Death. The word translated pale may also be rendered pale green, signifying the color of the appearance of those stricken with the plague. Thus. The pale horse is a symbol of the killing of death, causing a pale appearance. Hades is the place under the earth where the souls of the unsaved dead are kept before being resurrected for the judgment of the white throne, 20.11-15. After this judgment, the unsaved will be cast into the lake of fire for eternity. Hades may be likened to a temporary jail, and the lake of fire to a permanent prison. Here Hades follows death to receive those whom death kills. The killing by beasts mentioned in verse 8 is God's judgment, 2 Kings 2 24, 17 25, number 21 colon 6, Exo 23 28, Josh 24 colon 12. In these four seals we see the gospel preaching, war, famine, and death. During the past 20 centuries, these four things have marked the history of mankind. Everything else that has transpired during this time can be included in these four things. Immediately after Christ ascended to the heavens, the preaching of the gospel began. The white horse began to run the race, and the rider on this horse was the gospel of the glory of Christ. In A.D. 70 Titus, the Prince of Rome, destroyed Jerusalem with his armies. Since then, throughout the centuries, there has been one war after another. Following war, there has been famine, and famine causes disease and death. Hence, in the history of the past 2,000 years, there has been nothing except gospel preaching, war, famine, and death. This is the way to study world history. Revelation, which was written at the end of the first century, 
is a prophecy of things to come. If, as some say, the rider on the white horse is either Christ or Antichrist, then all the four seals would refer to the future. If this is the case, then there is no prophecy to cover the last twenty centuries. This would indicate that the prophecy in this book is not complete, because it would not show anything of the history during the past two thousand years, that is, from the first century down to the appearance of the Antichrist or to Christ's coming back. In principle, there should not be such a great gap in the prophecy of this book. Therefore, based upon this principle, these four seals must be a history of the world from Christ's ascension to the end of this age. We should not care for mere doctrine. We must take care of history and of experience. History is experience. We must apply prophecy to history. If we do this, we shall immediately realize that since Christ's ascension there has been a four-horse race among gospel preaching, war, famine, and death. Today the whole world is preparing for war. Even the diplomats in the United Nations are preparing for it. While they are fighting among themselves, we are preaching the gospel, for the gospel is on the leading horse. For example, in the past two centuries it was not war that first went to China. It was the gospel. The preaching of the gospel was then followed by war, famine, and death. This has been the course of world history throughout the past twenty centuries. Christ has opened these four seals, and the four horse race has been revealed. Do not try to understand the prophecy of the Bible simply according to your mentality. We must take care of experience. In order to understand the prophecy of the Bible, we must take care of history because the prophecies are predictions of things to come. What has occurred during the past twenty centuries? Four things gospel preaching, war, famine, and death. After his incarnation, Christ accomplished redemption through crucifixion, entered into resurrection, and then ascended into the heavens. No human history gives us such a record. But this is genuine world history. In my study of history, I discovered that the world history I was taught had a great shortage there was no incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. If you took these four things away from the history of the world, what kind of world would we have? In God's account of history, these four things are crucial. After the ascension of Christ, the whole course of world history was changed. By opening God's economy, Christ has written the history of mankind during the past twenty centuries. We see the proper human history in the pure word. This record of history in the word carries out God's economy. After Christ's ascension and before his coming back, there is a history of the world. This history is summarized in a race of four horses. As we have seen, the rider on the first horse is gospel preaching. God's economy is for nothing except the gospel preaching that will fulfill his eternal purpose. Where does the preaching of the gospel come from? It comes from Christ's incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. These four items are the source of the gospel. The history of the past twenty centuries has been for gospel preaching. This is God's wisdom. Gospel preaching takes the lead in the four-horse race. What is our generation for? It is for gospel preaching. And gospel preaching is for the carrying out of God's economy. How can the church be produced? Only through gospel preaching. How can the New Jerusalem come into being? Only through gospel preaching. Three negative things war, famine, and death help to advance the preaching of the gospel. A runner in a race does not run as fast alone as he does when others are running with him. War, famine, and death are terrible things, but they speed the preaching of the gospel. During the early days in China, it was difficult to open the door of the gospel. Do you know what opened the door? It was war. The door was opened, not only by civil war but also by the international war initiated by the Japanese invasion of China. After the last war between China and Japan, thousands of Chinese were saved. Moreover, through the civil war in the 1940s, many Chinese went to Taiwan from mainland China, and thousands of them were saved. If they had stayed on the mainland, they never would have believed in the Lord Jesus. But, having been forced to migrate to the island of Taiwan, 
thousands of people flooded into the church for salvation in the years 1949 and 1950. During those years, we preached the gospel in the park every Sunday afternoon. Every Sunday approximately 3,000 people heard the preaching of the gospel. Many were saved, and some of them eventually became elders and deacons in the churches in Taiwan and co-workers in the Lord's work. War brought them to the gospel. Therefore, war has been and still is a good helper of the preaching of the gospel. God's wisdom is to make this age, the age from the ascension of Christ to his coming back, an age of gospel preaching. Everything on earth today is for the preaching of the gospel. Factories, printing, airplanes, radio, television, and even nuclear weapons are for the preaching of the gospel. This is the gospel preaching age. The history of the world since the ascension of Christ is a history of gospel preaching. What are we doing today? We are preaching the gospel. And we are not preaching a partial gospel but a whole, complete gospel, a full gospel. Do you realize that the full gospel includes the church life, the kingdom, and even the new Jerusalem? The full gospel encompasses everything from Matthew through Revelation. In these days we are preaching the full gospel, the gospel that includes the church today, the kingdom in the coming age, and the new Jerusalem in eternity. Whatever happens today, including the opposition against us, is a help to preaching the gospel. This is the vision of the first four seals. We should not be like a frog in a narrow well who has a very limited vision of the sky. Rather, we must have an overall vision to see the significance of the first four seals. Instead of having the view of a frog in a well, we should have a bird's eye view. The rider on the first horse is neither Christ nor Antichrist. It is the preaching of the gospel of the glory of Christ. This is the crucial factor of this age, and the three other horses are helping this one horse to run the race. We are not with the riders on the last three horses. We are with the rider on the first horse. We have a bow without an arrow, for we are preaching the gospel of peace, a gospel in which the victory has been won, in a peaceful way. Hallelujah, this glorious preaching of the gospel is riding on throughout the earth. Praise the Lord that we are on the first horse. Life Study of Revelation Message 20 The Cry of the Martyred Saints and God's Answer to IT Seals 5 and 6 In this message we shall consider the fifth and sixth seals. According to the record of Revelation, the first four seals are not consecutive. Rather, they are simultaneous. They all began to take place at nearly the same time and they will conclude at the same time. It is very similar to a four-horse race where the horses begin and end at almost the same time. The seven seals may be divided into two groups consisting of the first four seals and the last three seals. While the first four seals are not consecutive, the last three seals are consecutive. As we have seen, the first four seals unveil the New Testament age, which is an age of gospel preaching. Between Christ's ascension and his coming back, the preaching of the gospel will continue. The other main things war, famine, and death work together for the advancement of the preaching of the gospel. God has a unique purpose in this age to have the gospel preached that the church might be produced and built up for the fulfillment of his eternal plan. We need to have this overall view. But the great men on earth do not have this view. Not even the kings and the presidents of the nations know what they are doing. But we know. Everything these rulers do helps the preaching of the gospel. God is sovereign in this matter. The book of Revelation begins with the local churches with Christ in their midst and it ends with the New Jerusalem with Christ as its centrality and universality. Between these two ends of Revelation, we have the Church Age and the Kingdom Age. In the Church Age, the New Testament Age, God is doing one thing, He is producing the churches through the preaching of the full gospel. All 27 books of the New Testament are included in the full gospel. God's purpose is not merely to save a group of pitiful sinners. This concept is too low, and many of the philosophical people refuse to accept it. They need to see that the preaching of the gospel has a much higher purpose and that it is on the highest plane producing the churches for the composition of the New Jerusalem. After the Church Age, the Kingdom Age will come. In the Kingdom Age God will accomplish what has not been completed and perfected in the Church Age. After the Age of the Kingdom, God's purpose will be thoroughly and absolutely completed. 
Then there will be eternity with the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem composed of all the redeemed saints. This is a general view of the whole universe. As we have already pointed out, through the first four seals, we have a view of what is taking place between Christ's ascension and his coming back. Four things are transpiring, the preaching of the gospel, war, famine, and death. The second, third, and fourth horses help to speed up the preaching of the gospel. If there had been no war, I would not be in this country. In the past, none of us in the Lord's recovery in China intended to come to the Western world. We thought that perhaps after we had finished a certain amount of recovery work, the Lord would then use some other people or means, perhaps missionaries or the translation of the books, to bring the recovery to the Western world. But suddenly, in 1949, mainland China was lost. As a result, the Lord's recovery was brought to this country. Having been sent to Taiwan by the work, I was deeply troubled by the loss of the Lord's recovery in mainland China. Day and night, I asked the Lord, what is this? Why has the work been lost? Eventually, the Sovereign Lord brought his recovery to this country. This reveals that, in the sovereign hand of the Lord, there is only one thing in this age the preaching of the full gospel to produce the local churches for the building up of God's eternal dwelling place, the New Jerusalem. When we have this overall view, we can look into the book of Revelation and understand it adequately and properly. I. The cry of the martyred saints The fifth seal The seven seals are firstly divided into four and three, and secondly into six and one. The number four signifies the creatures, as symbolized by the four living creatures, and the number six signifies creation, since creation was finished in six days. The number three signifies the triune God, and the number one the unique God. Hence, both four plus three and six plus one indicate that the seven seals, through God's judgment, bring God's creation with all the creatures to God. The fifth seal discloses the Christian martyrdom from the first century to the time near the end of this age. It may include the martyrdom of the Old Testament saints Matt. 23-34-36 While the gospel is being preached, as indicated by the first seal, there is always the martyrdom of the faithful saints. A. The martyrdom during the age of gospel preaching, many saints have been martyred because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Stephen, Peter, and nearly all the other apostles were martyred. The apostle John was exiled and Paul was imprisoned and later sentenced to death. Throughout the centuries, wherever the preaching of the gospel has gone, there has been martyrdom. Thousands of those who have been faithful to the Lord's testimony have been martyred. In a sense, even Brother Ney was martyred. Nearly all my older co-workers suffered martyrdom during the past 26 years by being kept in prison until they died. The martyrdom of the saints is not because of their opposition to any human rules but because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. The word of God is the glad tidings, the gospel, they proclaim to people. The testimony of Jesus is the life they live. Human society with human culture is wholly under the evil influence of Satan, as it says in 1 John 5:19, the whole world lies in the evil one. Both the preaching of the word of God and the life of the testimony of Jesus are against the satanic trend in the world. Certainly Satan hates this. Hence, whenever and wherever the saints preach the word of God and live the testimony of Jesus, Satan instigates people to persecute them, even to death. This is a fighting, not between men and the saints, but between Satan and God. The time will come when God will avenge the saints by exercising his righteous judgment over the earth which is under Satan's evil influence. B. The Cry Revelation 6.10 speaking of the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they held, says, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, will you not judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? In 6 9 we see that the souls are underneath the altar. This points to the sacrifices killed on the altar. When a sacrifice was killed on the altar, its blood flowed down to and under the bottom of the altar. The soul of the flesh is in the blood, Leviticus 17.11. That the soul of the martyred saints are under the altar indicates that, 
in the eyes of God, they have all been offered to God as sacrifices on the altar and that their blood, their life, was shed there. Now their position is under the altar. In figure, the altar is in the outer court of the tabernacle and the temple, and the outer court signifies the earth. Hence, underneath the altar is underneath the earth, where the souls of the martyred saints are. It is the paradise where the Lord Jesus went after his death, Luke 23:43. It is in the heart of the earth, Matt. 12:40, and should be the comfortable section of Hades, where Abraham is, Acts 2:27. Luke 16, 22-26 Today, the martyred saints are in paradise underneath the altar, that is, underneath the earth. It is altogether erroneous to say that these saints are in heaven. The original Schofield Reference Bible has a note on Luke 16, 23 that indicates that paradise was under the earth before Christ's resurrection, but that by and with Christ's resurrection it was transferred from under the earth to the third heaven. However, on the day of Pentecost, fifty days after the Lord's resurrection, Peter said, David did not ascend into the heavens, Acts 2.34. Even at the time of the day of Pentecost, David was still not in heaven. In his book, First Fruits and Harvest, on page 54, G. H. Lang, a lay teacher among the brethren, says that the scripture nowhere declares that after Christ's ascension paradise was transferred from under the earth to the third heaven, but is holy against it. He also pointed out the verse in Acts 2 where Peter said that David was not in heaven. I mention this that we might realize that all the martyred saints are still in paradise underneath the altar. Many Christians do not know that paradise is in Hades. The strongest proof that paradise is in Hades is the Lord's word to the saved thief in Luke 23:43. Truly I tell you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Acts 2:27 and 31 reveal that after the Lord Jesus died he went to Hades. Matthew 12:40 indicates that Hades is in the heart of the earth where the Lord Jesus went for three days and nights after his death. In Hades there is a pleasant section likened to Abraham's bosom where Lazarus went. Luke 16:23. This is not the paradise in the heavens, but the paradise in Hades. Using 2 Corinthians 12:2-4, some have argued that when Paul was caught away into paradise, he was caught away to the third heaven. But 2 Corinthians 12:2-4 does not prove that paradise is in the third heaven. Rather, it proves the opposite. The word and at the beginning of verse 3 proves that Paul's being caught away to the third heaven and his being caught away into paradise mentioned in verses 3 and 4 are two different things. The Greek word rendered caught up in verses 2 and 4, KJV, may be translated caught away. On the one hand, Paul was living on earth, but on the other hand, he was caught away to the heavens and into the paradise. In this way, Paul received a full vision of the entire universe. As far as mankind is concerned, the universe is of three sections, the heavens, the earth, and under the earth, cf. philosophy 2.10. Paul came to know the things on earth, the things in heaven, and the things in paradise. He had the greatest revelation of the universe as it relates to man. When the saved saints die, they all become naked, no longer having a body. For a human being not to have a body means that he is naked not in a normal condition. No one can be in the presence of God in the third heavens in this naked, abnormal condition. Hence, the dead saints must be kept in a pleasant place until the time of their resurrection, when God will clothe them with a resurrected body and they will be a complete person in a normal condition. Some may wonder about Philippians 1.23, where Paul said that he had a desire to depart and be with Christ. Paul seemed to be saying, if I die, I will be with Christ. To be with Christ is not an absolute matter. It is a relative one. Even now, we are with Christ. Wherever we are, we are with Him. Of course, while we are in this physical body, we are not as close to Christ as we are when we die, pass out of this world, and enter into another realm. But this does not mean when the believers die they are taken to the heavens. That will not occur until the day of resurrection and rapture. Others may use 1 Thessalonians 4 to argue that the dead saints are with Christ in heaven. They say that when Christ comes back, 
he will bring the dead believers with him, and that this proves that they must be with him now in heaven. But read this chapter carefully. It says that the dead in Christ shall rise first and that those who are living, who remain, shall be caught up at the same time together with them in clouds, 1 Thess. 4 colon 16-17. According to 1 Thessalonians 4, the dead saints will be resurrected and, along with the living ones, will be caught up to the air to meet with Christ. We should read the Bible carefully and not follow today's traditional, superficial teachings. We must be clear that the saved saints are not in the heavens, but in a pleasant place which the Bible calls paradise, the place the Lord Jesus visited after he died. After waiting for a long time, near to the end of this age, the martyred saints cry out for revenge, urging the Lord to judge and avenge their blood on those who dwell on the earth. C. The Lord's approval verse 11 says, And to each of them was given a white robe. And it was said to them that they should rest yet a little while, until the number of their fellow slaves and their brothers who are about to be killed even as they were should be completed also. The white robe here signifies that their martyrdom has been approved by God. Those who are about to be killed refers to those who will be martyred during the Great Tribulation, 20 colon 4. According to the word, yet a little while until the number should be completed, this cry of the martyred saints should transpire near the end of this age. We are still in the first four seals. The fifth seal has not yet come. However, I believe that we are close to the time of the fifth seal. 2. God's answer the sixth seal a. The beginning of supernatural calamities the sixth seal, 6 colon 12 dash 17, which marks the beginning of supernatural calamities, is God's answer to the cry of the martyred saints in the fifth seal. After the opening of the sixth seal, the Lord comes in to shake the earth and the hosts of the heavens. The earth will quake greatly, the sun will become black as sackcloth made of hair, the moon will become as blood, the stars of heaven will fall to the earth as a fig tree casting its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind, the heaven will recoil as a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island will move out of its place. 6 14 This great shaking will be a warning to the dwellers on the earth. It will warn them to repent and return to God. God may seem to be saying to them, you earth dwellers are only for yourselves. You don't care for me. Now is my time to shake the earth as a warning to you. While some people have blasphemously said that they are God, the Lord will shake the earth and the heaven as a reminder to them that he is God. What a terrible shaking this will be. The earth, the sun, the moon, and the stars will all be affected. B. The reaction of the earth's dwellers in verses 15 through 17 we see the reaction of the earth's dwellers. They will hide themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and they will beg the mountains and rocks to hide them from the face of God and from the wrath of the Lamb. Verse 15 reveals the feeling of their conscience, for they fear the coming of the judgment of God, considering that the great day of the wrath of God and of the Lamb has come. However, the sixth seal is not the proclamation of God concerning the coming of his judgment. Rather, it is a warning to the dwellers of the earth. The kings and all the great, rich, and noble men of the earth will be shocked by this earthquake and will think that the day of the wrath of God and of the Lamb has come. Actually, this will not yet be that day, it will be just a foretaste and a warning to them to repent. In this warning God seems to be saying, Return to me. Do not say that you are God. You are the poor dwellers on the earth created by me. I created the sun, the moon, and the stars for your living. But you forget me and oppose and blaspheme me. Now is the time for you to be warned in order that you might repent. See. The significance of this calamity The significance of this calamity is that it is a warning to the earth's dwellers. It is not yet the actual wrath of the Lord. It is God's answer to the cry of the martyred saints in the fifth seal and it reveals that God is soon to come in to avenge them and to vindicate himself. God is coming to avenge the blood of his dear saints. 3. The warning being before the day of the Lord the sixth seal, being an introduction to the great tribulation, is a warning before the day of the Lord. According to Joel 2 30 31, there will not be much difference in time between the sixth seal and the first five trumpets. 8 colon 6 11. 
Joel 2 30 31 Firstly has the blood of the first and second trumpets, the fire of the first, second, and third trumpets, 8 colon 7 dash 10, and the smoke of the fifth trumpet, 9 colon 1 dash 3, and then the sun and the moon of the sixth seal. Chapter 9 colon 4 compared with 7 colon 3 indicates that the fifth trumpet is very close to the sixth seal. There will be two calamities in the shakings and changes of the earth and of the hosts in heaven. The first will occur before the day of the Lord, before the great tribulation, Joel 3 colon 11 dash 16, 2 30 31. Luke 21 11. And the second will occur after the day of the Lord, after the great tribulation, Matt. 24 colon 29 30 Luke 21 colon 25 dash 26 What is covered in the sixth seal is the first calamity. It may be considered not only as a warning but also as an introduction to the coming great tribulation. Following the sixth seal, at the opening of the seventh seal, are the first four trumpets as indicators that the great tribulation is coming, 8 colon 1 dash 2, 6 to 13. Then the Great Tribulation will be carried out in the last three trumpets, 9-1-21, 11-14-19. Life Study of Revelation Message 21 God's preservation of His people in the book of Revelation There are a number of insertions, and chapter 7 is the first of them. This chapter is not the continuation of chapter 6. It is an insertion between the sixth and seventh seals showing how God cares for his people while he is about to execute his judgment upon the earth. Chapter 8 is the continuation of Chapter 6. At the end of Chapter 6 we have the sixth seal, and in the beginning of Chapter 8 we have the seventh. The opening of the seventh seal will bring in the seven trumpets, the last three of which constitute the Great Tribulation, 8,1-2. But before this transpires, God will seal the Israelites whom he intends to preserve. 7 colon 3. God will preserve his two peoples the Israelites and the redeemed saints. Why does this insertion regarding God's preservation of his people come here? Because in the sixth seal we see the warning of the coming tribulation. As we have seen, the fifth seal is the cry of the martyred saints for revenge, and the sixth seal is God's answer to this cry, which is also a warning to the dwellers on the earth that the tribulation will soon come. Since the ascension of Christ, there have been a great number of earthquakes and other calamities. All these have been natural calamities. However, beginning at the opening of the sixth seal, the calamities will no longer be natural but supernatural. Both natural and supernatural calamities are God's punishment upon the earth. This rebellious earth deserves God's punishment, and the punishing hand of God has never been removed from it. To a certain extent, God punishes the earth for his purpose. Since the ascension of Christ, God has been punishing the earth. One aspect of God's punishment is seen in the destruction of the city of Jerusalem by Titus and his armies. That destruction was prophesied by the Lord Jesus in Matthew 24,2 where, speaking of the temple, he said to his disciples, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Jerusalem was destroyed by Titus for two reasons, because the Jewish religion was rebellious against God's economy and because this religion was a negative influence on the church in Jerusalem. In Acts 21 we see how much the old Jewish religion influenced the church. By the time of A.D. 70 the Lord could no longer tolerate the rebellion of the Jewish religion and its influence upon the church so he sent the Roman army to destroy Jerusalem and the temple. That destruction was a terrible punishment which was accompanied by famine, pestilence, and death. After that, throughout the centuries, natural calamities have been and will be used by God to punish the earth until the sixth seal. At the time of the sixth seal, the calamities will be changed from natural calamities to supernatural ones. The earth will be shaken, and the sun, moon, and stars will be damaged. These calamities will be a preface to the seventh seal. When the seventh seal is executed, the situation will be terrible and no one will be able to bear it. Shortly after the opening of the seventh seal, the first trumpet will be sounded, and the third part of the earth will be burnt up, 8 7. At the sounding of the second trumpet, 
the third part of the sea will become blood, 8 colon 8. At the sounding of the third trumpet, a great star will fall upon the third part of the rivers and upon the springs of waters and the third part of the waters will become wormwood, 8 colon 10 dash 11. At the sounding of the fourth trumpet, the third part of the sun and the third part of the moon and the third part of the stars will be smitten so that the third part of them might be darkened, 8 12. God made the earth for man to live on. The sun, moon, and stars all help to maintain life on earth. But because the dwellers on earth have been so insolent toward him for centuries, the time will come when God will no longer endure it. He will come in to judge the earth, the sea, the rivers, and the sun, moon, and stars. The earth is for human existence, and every form of life on earth is for man's benefit. The animals, vegetables, and minerals are all for the existence of mankind. These did not come into being by accident, but were planned and created by God. For example, there is no air on the moon, but there is air on earth. Around the globe is a layer of air which the Bible calls the firmament, General 1 colon 7. The earth is the planet with a firmament. God created it in such a way so that it would produce the supplies for maintaining human life. The air, sunshine, and water are all necessary for man's existence. But after God judges the earth and heaven, the earth will no longer be a suitable place for man to live on. In Matthew 24 6 and 7 the Lord prophesied that two kinds of wars would come wars of people against people and wars of nation against nation, that is, civil wars and international wars. After Christ's ascension, these wars began to take place. The Lord also prophesied in Matthew 24 that there would be earthquakes in various places, v7. A recent article said that each year there will be approximately 5 to 6,000 earthquakes ranging from 2 to 8 on the Richter scale. This is the fulfillment of the Lord's prophecy. In his prophecy the Lord seemed to be saying, don't live on this earth so complacently, not caring for God's purpose. You must realize that God has a purpose on this earth and that you must turn to him for the fulfillment of his purpose. God will warn people again and again with wars and earthquakes until the time of the fifth seal when the martyred souls can no longer tolerate the situation. The martyred saints will then cry out, saying, How long, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, will you not judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? 6.10 God's answer comes in the sixth seal when the earth will be shaken and the heavenly hosts will be smitten as an introduction to and warning of the coming tribulation. The sixth seal and the first five trumpets are closely related to one another in time. At this juncture we need to consider the second chapter of Joel. Joel 2 says that certain things will occur before the day of the Lord. If you read New Testament prophecy along with the Old Testament prophecies, you will see that there is a time called the day of the Lord. This is the Great Tribulation. The Day of the Lord means the Day of the Lord's Wrath, the Day of His coming in to interfere with the world by means of supernatural calamities. The Day of the Lord will be terrible. Several prophets of the Old Testament mention the Day of the Lord, and they all indicate that it will be a dreadful day, Joel 1:15, 2:1, 1, 11, 31, 3:14, Zech 14:1, Mal 4:5. The sixth seal will be before the day of the Lord, meaning that it will be before the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation will begin at the sounding of the fifth trumpet. The first four trumpets are the preliminary to the Great Tribulation. It is similar to starting an automobile. First the ignition is turned on, the motor starts, and then the car will run. In like manner, after the warning of the sixth seal, the first four trumpets will be the preliminary to the Great Tribulation. But, like an automobile which is warming up but has not yet moved, the four trumpets are the preparation for the Great Tribulation. But even these trumpets will cause severe suffering. The damage to the earth, waters, and the heavenly hosts will be greater than that caused by the earthquake of the sixth seal. From the time of the sixth seal, there will be nothing good for man on earth. The New Testament indicates that the early overcomers, such as the man-child and the first fruits, will be taken away from the earth shortly before the sixth seal. However, we cannot calculate the exact time. But according to Revelation, Matthew, and other portions of the word, 
we can say that the first kind of rapture, the raptures of the man-child and the first fruits, will take place before the sixth seal. Recall that the Lord promised to the church in Philadelphia to keep them out of the hour of trial which will come upon all the inhabited earth. 310. The Lord's lovers and seekers will be taken away before the sixth seal. Immediately after the opening of the sixth seal, we have chapter 7, an insertion revealing that before the great tribulation God will do two things to preserve his people, he will seal the chosen remnant of Israel and he will begin the rapture of the redeemed ones of the church. I. The sealing of the chosen remnant of Israel Revelation 7:1 says, After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding fast the four winds of the earth, so that no wind should blow on the earth nor on the sea nor on any tree. This is the insertion between the sixth and seventh seals, showing how God cares for his people while he is about to execute his judgments upon the earth. The winds here are for God's judgments, Jonah 1:4. ISA 11:15, Jude 22, 22, 49:36, 51:1. The next verse says, "And I saw another angel ascend from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to harm the earth and sea." The another angel here refers to Christ, as also in 8:3, 10:1, and 18:1. In the Old Testament Christ was called the Angel of the Lord, who was God himself, Gen. 22,11-12, Exo. 3,2-6, Judges 6,11-24, Zech 1,11-12, 7 Here in the New Testament he is again called the Angel. Although I love Israel, I feel very sad for them because, According to prophecy and their present situation, they have returned to the land of their fathers in unbelief. They still cling to their old religion, and they do not believe in God according to his New Testament economy. They are actually in rebellion against him. When the Lord Jesus came, God changed the dispensation from that of keeping the law to that of believing in the Lord Jesus. But the Jews would not accept this change and they refused to turn from keeping the law to believing in the Lord Jesus. This was their rebellion, stubbornness, and disobedience. God has borne with them for centuries, and according to his sovereignty, they have returned and have been restored as a nation again, but they are still in unbelief. They do not believe in the Lord Jesus. According to some reliable information I have received, the government of Israel is doing everything possible to exclude any type of Christian activity. They do not want any Christian missionaries to carry on mission work. The prophecies regarding Israel indicate that they will remain in unbelief until the last day. God, however, is sovereign and he will always take care of the nation of Israel, not for their sake but for his economy. He knows that among the unbelieving Jews there are some faithful ones, and before he will actually judge the earth with supernatural calamities, he will seal them. A. Before the first four trumpets the first trumpet is to harm the earth and the trees, 8.7 the second trumpet is to harm the sea, 8,8-9, the third trumpet is to harm the rivers, 8,10-11, and the fourth trumpet is to harm the heavenly hosts, 8,12. Before the executing of the first four trumpets, God will seal his chosen Israelites to preserve them from the supernatural calamities which will be carried out by these trumpets. B preserved on earth especially from the torment of the fifth trumpet the first four trumpets will harm only the earth, the sea, the rivers, and the heavenly hosts. It is the fifth trumpet that will torment men directly. God's sealing of his chosen Israelites is especially to preserve them from the torment of the fifth trumpet, 9 colon 4. C. 12,000 of each of the 12 tribes sealed in 7,4-8 We see that God will seal 144,000 out of every tribe of the sons of Israel, sealing 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes. These are the Israelites who will keep the commandments of God during the Great Tribulation, 12:17, 14:12. Altogether, 144,000 faithful Israelites will be sealed on their foreheads. I do not know what kind of seal this will be, but it will be a mark recognizable to the angels sent to judge the earth. 
This is God's way of preserving his chosen Israelites while he is executing his judgment upon the earth. D. Joseph gaining double portions in verses 6 and 8 we see that Joseph gains double portions, cf 1 Chronicles 5 colon 1 dash 2, Ezek 48 colon 4 dash 5. Because Manasseh, one of the two sons of Joseph, Gen. 48 colon 5, and Joseph, V. 8, stand for two tribes, Joseph will still have the double portion of the birthright, 1 Kron. 5 colon 1 dash 2 during the millennium, Ezek 48,4-5. Reuben was the firstborn of Israel, but due to his sinfulness he lost his birthright and Judah prevailed above his brothers, 1 Chronicles 5,1-2. Hence, the tribe of Judah is mentioned here first. E. Dan being omitted in Revelation 7 Dan is omitted. In the account here, as in 1 Chronicles chapters 2-9, through 9, the tribe of Dan is omitted because of their idolatry, Judge. 1830-31. 1 Kings 12 colon 29-30. 2 Kings 10-29, CF General 49 colon 17. However, Dan will still be counted during the millennium, Isaac. 48 colon 1, because of Jacob's blessing upon him, that Dan might still be one of the tribes by the salvation of the Lord, Gen. 49,16-18, 2. The rapture of the redeemed ones of the church in addition to the chosen remnant of Israel, God has another people the redeemed saints of the church, 7,9-17. In this insertion we see a vision revealing how God preserves his redeemed saints throughout all the tribulations. The way God preserves the chosen remnant of the children of Israel is to seal them and to leave them on earth. While the Israelites are God's earthly people, the Christians are God's heavenly people. God promised to give Abraham people like the stars of the heavens and like the sand of the seashore, General 22:17. The heavenly people, the Christians, are the stars, and the earthly people, the Israelites, are the sand of the seashore. In order to preserve his earthly people, God seals them and keeps them on earth. He will not take them from the earth to the heavens. However, God's way of preserving his redeemed saints is not to keep them on earth but to take them away by means of rapture. The rapture will not only occur once or be just of one kind. There will be at least two or three kinds of raptures. Eventually, all the redeemed saints in the church will be raptured from earth to heaven. The insertion in this vision concerning the church gives us an overall view from the time of rapture until eternity. In other words, Revelation 7 ends with eternity. For eternity, the whole church will be under God's care and under the Lamb's shepherding. A. Beginning before the sixth seal God's rapture of his redeemed saints will begin with the first overcomers, comprising the man-child in 12,5 and the first fruits in 14,1-6. This should be before the sixth seal, because the sixth seal will be the beginning of supernatural calamities executed by God as the trial which is about to come on the whole inhabited earth to try them who dwell on the earth, 310. God's rapture of his redeemed saints will continue with the two witnesses in 1112, the late overcomers in 15, 2, and the harvest in 14, 14-16, the majority of the believers who will pass through most of the great tribulation, until all the saints will be raptured to participate in God's care and the Lamb's shepherding for eternity. B. A great, innumerable multitude verse 9 says, after these things I saw, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number. The great multitude consists of the redeemed ones throughout all generations from the nations, who are innumerable and who constitute the church, 5 colon 9, ROM 11 25. Acts 15 14, 19. C. From nations, tribes, people, and tongues this great multitude consists of those who have been purchased with the blood of the Lamb from every nation, tribe, people, and tongue, 7 colon 9, 5 colon 9, to be the constituents of the church. D. Having come out of the great tribulation with palm branches in their hands speaking of the great multitude mentioned in verse 9, one of the elders said, these are those who come out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, v 14. 
The Great Tribulation here is different from the Great Tribulation mentioned in Matthew 24,21. The Great Tribulation here is tribulation in a general sense. All of God's redeemed people have passed through certain tribulations, sufferings, persecutions, and afflictions. No Christian can avoid these things. In our spirit, we Christians are a people of enjoyment. But, on the physical side, we are a suffering people. But one day we shall come triumphantly out of the great tribulation and stand before the throne and before the Lamb. All those in the great multitude in this chapter have palm branches in their hands, signifying their victory over tribulation, cf. John 12:13, which they have undergone for the Lord's sake, v. 14. Palm trees are also the sign of satisfaction through watering, xo 15:27. Palm branches were used for the Feast of Tabernacles, in which the people of God rejoiced for the satisfaction of their enjoyment, Leviticus 23:40, Na 8:15. The Feast of Tabernacles was a type which will be fulfilled by this great multitude of God's redeemed ones enjoying the eternal Feast of Tabernacles. This multitude shall flourish like the palm tree in the Temple of God, PSA. 92:12-13, E. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb standing before the throne indicates that the great multitude of the redeemed ones must have been raptured to the presence of God. Standing before the Lamb corresponds to stand before the Son of Man, Luke 21:36, which clearly indicates the rapture. Since this is mentioned immediately after the opening of the sixth seal, it also implies that the rapture of the believers should begin to transpire before the sixth seal. The record in verses 9 through 17 composes in a general way a scene from the rapture of the believers to their enjoyment in eternity. F. Clothed in blood-washed white robes in verse 9 we see that this great multitude is clothed in white robes, for they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, v. 14. Robes, being plural, signify the righteousness of their conduct. White indicates that their conduct is pure and approved by God through the washing in the blood of the Lamb. G. Praising God and the Lamb verse 10 says, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. The loud praise mentioning only salvation indicates that the praisers are the saved ones. The great multitude, those who are saved, are grateful for God's salvation. H. Serving God day and night in his temple verse 15 says, Therefore they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. This great multitude has come out of the great tribulation into a heavenly state, into the temple of God where they serve him day and night. I. God spreading his tabernacle over them verse 15 also says that he who sits upon the throne shall spread his tabernacle over them. The great multitude will enjoy God and his care. He will spread his tabernacle over them, meaning that he will make his dwelling place their dwelling place. God will cause all his redeemed ones to dwell together with him. In a very positive sense, God will even be our dwelling place, our tabernacle. As he spreads himself over us as a tabernacle, we shall enjoy him to the uttermost. Christ is the tabernacle of God, John 1:14 and the new Jerusalem as the ultimate enlargement of Christ will be God's eternal tabernacle, 21,2-3, where all God's redeemed ones will dwell with him forever. God will overshadow them with himself as embodied in Christ. Christ, as the embodiment of God, will be their tabernacle. The portrait in verses 15 through 17, similar to what is portrayed in 21,3-4 and 22,3-5, is of eternity. J. The Lamb shepherding them and guiding them to springs of waters of life verses 16 and 17 say, They shall not hunger any more, neither shall they thirst any more, neither shall the sun beat upon them, nor any heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne shall shepherd them and shall guide them to springs of waters of life. Here we see that the Lamb will shepherd them and guide them to springs of waters of life. Shepherding includes feeding. Under the shepherding of Christ, I shall not want, PSA 23,1. The Lamb will also lead us to springs of waters of life. In eternity, we shall drink of many springs and enjoy many different waters. How good this is! K. 
God wiping away every tear from their eyes verse 17 also says that God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. Tears are a sign of dissatisfaction. Waters of life are for satisfaction. Because the Lamb will supply them with waters of life for their satisfaction, they will have no tears of dissatisfaction. The waters of life shall be supplied, and the water of tears shall be wiped away. There will be no tears, hunger, or thirst just enjoyment. L. The angels, the elders, and the four living creatures worshipping God verses 11 and 12 say, And all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. This is similar to the word in Luke 15 7, where there is joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. Here the angels say, Amen to the redeemed one's praise of salvation. In this chapter we see how God takes care of his people. When he is about to judge the earth, he will seal his earthly people and rapture his heavenly people. While the chosen remnant of Israel is sealed, the believers are regenerated, for God has put himself into us as life. He does not simply put a mark on our forehead. He puts himself into us as life. Thus, we are not his earthly people but his heavenly people. Would you rather be a regenerated Christian or a sealed Israelite? We Christians do not have this seal we have God in us, which is much better. Unlike the chosen remnant of Israel, we shall not remain on earth. Rather, we shall be preserved by being taken away to the presence of God. We shall be in that eternal state enjoying God's divine and eternal care and also enjoying the Lamb's eternal shepherding. How pleasant that will be! The sealed remnant of Israel will be the better people, but we shall be the best people. However, if we would be taken away to God's presence, we must be mature. If we are still tender and unripe, God will not take us away. Instead, He will leave us in the field to suffer until we have ripened. While all the church people will be taken away, there is nonetheless a condition, the condition of maturity and of ripeness. We all must ripen and mature. This is the condition of our being taken away from this earth by God. This is fully and adequately revealed in the book of Revelation. In chapter 14, for example, we clearly see the first fruits and the harvest. In that portion of the word, we are told definitely that after the field has ripened, the harvest comes. Thus, we all need to grow. It is impossible for people to grow in religion because there is no food or nourishment there. In a sense, there is not even a field there. The only place where Christians can grow today is the church, for in the church is the pasture Christ for the flock to feed on and receive nourishment for growth. By the Lord's sovereign grace, we are enjoying this pasture. We all can testify that since coming into the church life, we have been in the green pasture with the tender grass. Day by day we are feeding on the tender grass which is Christ himself. Here in the church life we feed on Christ and grow. Here we take all the tender nourishment into our being. Thank the Lord that we are growing day by day. Praise the Lord that we are growing and that he is preparing us for our rapture. We do not expect to face the tribulation. We are growing into maturity, growing into rapture, growing into his presence. One day, we shall be there. Life Study of Revelation Message 22 The Seven Eyes of the Lamb For the Building of God Many Christians realize that, according to Revelation 5, Christ, the slain Lamb, is worthy, and a number of Christian hymns praise the Lord for his worthiness. However, most hymns on the worthiness of the Lamb praise Christ for being worthy because of his redemption. It is difficult to find a hymn on the Lord's worthiness that goes beyond redemption. It is absolutely scriptural to say that the Lamb is worthy because he has redeemed and purchased us. However, according to Revelation 5, the worthiness of the Lamb is not mainly due to his redemption, but to his being able to open the secret of God's economy. Christ is worthy to open the seals of God's economy because he has defeated the enemy and has redeemed us. As the one who has brought God's authority to the earth, he is the victorious overcoming lion of the tribe of Judah and the Lamb who has accomplished a full redemption for God's chosen people. Therefore, 
he is completely qualified and positioned to open the mystery of God's economy. This is one of the crucial points in Revelation chapter 5. The seven eyes, the seven lamps, and the seven spirits Another major point in Revelation 5 is that Christ as the lion lamb has seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, v6. These seven eyes are also the seven lamps burning before the throne of God, 4 colon 5. Hence, in these chapters we have the seven lamps, the seven eyes, and the seven spirits. Revelation is the only book in the Bible that mentions the seven spirits. But here we see that these seven spirits are the seven eyes of Christ, and that the seven eyes of Christ are the seven lamps before the throne of God. The first mention of the seven lamps is in Exodus 25, where we see seven lamps on the one lamp stand. But if we only had Exodus 25, we would not know the meaning of the lamp stand and its seven lamps. According to our human understanding, we would simply say that the seven lamps are for the intensification of the light. Although this is both right and logical, the significance of the seven lamps is much deeper than this. Why did the lampstand not have six or eight lamps? In Zechariah we see something further regarding the seven lamps, for in Zechariah 3 and 4 we see that the seven lamps are the seven eyes, Zech 3 colon 9, 4 colon 2 comma 10. Although Zechariah 4.10 speaks of the seven eyes of the Lord, the connection between the eyes, the lamps, and the spirit is not made clear. Thus, we need to proceed further to the book of Revelation, where we see the seven lamps, the seven eyes, and the seven spirits. We need to see the progression from Exodus through Zechariah to Revelation. In Exodus we have the seven lamps, in Zechariah we have the seven eyes, and in Revelation we have the seven spirits. In Exodus the seven lamps are mentioned, but nothing is said of the eyes or of the spirits. In Zechariah we have the seven lamps and the seven eyes with an obscure mention of the spirit. But in Revelation we have the seven lamps, the seven eyes, and the seven spirits. As we pointed out in message 8, the lampstand is a symbol of the triune God. The gold symbolizes the divine substance of the Father. The stand, which is the embodiment of the gold, symbolizes Christ as the embodiment of the Father. And the seven lamps symbolize the Spirit as the expression of Christ who is the embodiment of the Father. Therefore, we have the Father, the gold, as the substance, the Son, the stand, as the embodiment, and the Spirit, the lamps, as the expression. We have the substance, the embodiment, and the expression. In Exodus we cannot see that the seven lamps are the seven spirits of God. We must go on to Zechariah and eventually to Revelation before we can see this. As a recovery of divine revelation, this is absolutely new. God's building the lamps in Exodus 25 are for the building up of the tabernacle, especially for the move in the tabernacle. Without light, it is impossible to move. The light is for the move, and the move is for God's building. The seven lamps, therefore, are for the building up of the tabernacle, God's dwelling place on earth. The seven lamps in Zechariah 3 and 4 are for the recovery of God's building. The principle is the same in the rebuilding of the temple as it was in the building of the tabernacle. The same is true of the book of Revelation. If we approach this book with a short-sighted view, we shall be unable to see that the seven spirits, which are the seven eyes of the Lamb and the seven lamps before God's throne, are for God's building. But if we have an overall view, we shall see that the seven spirits are absolutely for God's building. Revelation begins with the seven local churches and it ends with the New Jerusalem. Although this book contains the judgment of God, this judgment is not the goal. Judgment is not for judgment. It is for God's building. The New Jerusalem, God's eternal dwelling place, issues out of this judgment. Thus, the seven lamps, the seven eyes, and the seven spirits are all for God's building. We are here for the realization of God's eternal goal in his divine building. The seven eyes for God's building Zechariah 3 colon 9 says, For behold the stone that I have laid before Joshua. Upon one stone shall be seven eyes, behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. This verse reveals that the seven eyes are not only the seven eyes of the Lord, but also the seven eyes of the stone. 
This stone was engraved in one day for the iniquity of God's people. The engraving of the stone was its being dealt with by God's righteousness on the cross for our redemption. Christ, the redeeming Lamb, is also the stone on which are the seven eyes. These seven eyes are the seven lamps for God's building. When we come to the book of Revelation, we see very clearly that the seven lamps are the seven eyes of the Redeemer, and that the seven eyes of the Redeemer are the seven spirits of God for the building of God. According to the book of Revelation, the Lord Jesus has seven burning eyes. Although these eyes are for searching, judging, refining, and enlightening, they are ultimately for transfusing us with his essence, his divine element. How can the Lord's divine essence be wrought into our being? By the transfusing of his seven eyes. Whenever we are searched, purged, purified, refined, and judged by the flaming eyes of Christ, we gain something of him. Not only is some element of ourselves purified, but some element of him is transfused into us. The natural things are purged, and the divine things are transfused into us. Through this process, the Lord builds us together and carries out God's building. The book of Revelation is not mainly for searching and judging. It is for producing and building up the new Jerusalem, the ultimate issue of this book. As a result of the transfusing of the seven eyes of Christ, the new Jerusalem will be built up. The seven eyes of Christ look at God's chosen people, enlightening, searching, judging, purifying, and refining them, and ultimately infusing them with whatever he is. By infusing us with his essence, he makes us the same as he is and, by so doing, he transforms us from being natural into being the same as he. Then we become the transformed material for the building up of the new Jerusalem. We all must see that the seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God and of the Lamb, are absolutely for God's building. The Spirit being the eyes of Christ these seven spirits are the Holy Spirit. Being the Holy Spirit, they are not separate from Christ. According to doctrine, the Spirit and Christ are two separate individuals, but according to experience, they are one. Just as a person and his eyes are one, so Christ and the Spirit are one. When someone looks at you, he looks at you with his eyes, and when his eyes look at you, he looks at you. It is ridiculous to say that the eyes are separate from the person himself. In our experience, the Spirit is the eyes of Christ. Those who attempt to argue about this may hold mental doctrines, but they lack experience. If they put all their doctrines into experience, they will find that it is wrong to separate Christ from the Spirit. The triune God is not experienced in a doctrinal way. While some may attempt to define or explain him, when we experience the triune God, we realize that the Son is the embodiment of the Father and that the Spirit is the expression of the Son. They are one. The Father is embodied in the Son and the Son is realized, expressed, and experienced as the Spirit. The experience of the triune God for God's building The triune God is for God's building. In order for God to have the building, 